Can you see my screen? Yes. And I'm in here and it says review. I can't see what I'm, okay. All right, so I'll introduce myself uh, real quickly. I won't take the full half hour. I'll be as quick and factual as possible. I'm actually looking forward to the other presentations uh, and I don't wanna hug the mic. Uh, I'll give you a really brief background on myself just because I'm a little bit of an oddball in the academic field. I'll propose a meditation and then get to the, the meat of it. Um, real quickly, many of you know me, some of you don't know me. My name is Mark Fleury, I'm Franco-Spaniard, uh, born and raised in Paris, um, moved to the United States to do my theoretical physics uh, work at MIT, uh, left the field to go into industry. Silicon Valley was one of the pioneers of the open source movement uh, back in the days, wrote many layers of the internet in standards, sold a company uh, to Red Hat for Buku money, which allowed me to basically F off uh, into the sunset with my family. Uh, which was great in retirement. Um, I went back to my first love of physics uh, through gravity. Um, while at, MI, while at uh, the Polytechnique in Paris, my uh, 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 thesis advisor was Alain Aspect uh, of the Bell Experiment. So very, very early. In fact, as soon as I heard about dead and alive cats and, and all that jazz of, of the Copenhagen interpretation, the one who was helping me make no sense of it was Alain Aspect. Uh, so very early, immediately I encountered the bell, the, the, the bell nonsense. And uh, I don't know, Spey was really interesting because he, he, even though he did the experiment, he was not one to push the interpretation of Copenhagen. Unlike, say, Anton Zeilinger, who really delights in the magic of it all. Uh, Alain uh, was very cautious about it all. Uh, eventually, uh, uh, gravity actually brought me, of course, to field theories and and all of that, and, and quantum was for me the, 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 the thing that needed to emerge. I consider gravity fundamental and quantum sort of an emergent phenomena in a particular length scale, as opposed to saying that randomness is fundamental to the universe. Uh, I do consider that the map is, is deterministic chaos between deterministic equations of gravity and, and quantum, but that's outside the scope of this. Uh, I've published in computer science, vacuum technology. Um, I'm not an academic, so this is all as an independent now. Uh, now I focus on quantum, of course, the walkers of Professor Coudet uh, and for I've financed uh, research at John's lab, at Emmanuel's lab, other research uh, at ne University of Nebraska. Uh, and I try to contribute myself as much as I can I really focus on ontology of quantum mechanics, purchased a rig to do experiments about five years ago and spent most of COVID um, uh, 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 conducting an experiment that was uh, informed by the Walker ontology. And I'll cover this. This is what this presentation uh, really is about. Uh, aside, I do a lot of arts, a, a theater piece and music called The Church of Space, which is about meditation. And now that we have had time to let people in, I would like to actually start with this quick meditation. It won't take long, but it's a introduction to um, what we're gonna talk about. And this is a meditation we do in public with the church space. It's called, Everything is Connected to Everything. I will ask that you close your eyes. You don't have to participate, but if you do play the game, we're gonna take three deep breaths and then I'll talk. Breathe in. Breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. This meditation is called Everything is Connected to Everything. Realize that everything, you can open your eyes and realize that everything that is in your field of vision is there because a wave, a photon has reached your eye. Everything that you see is energetically connected to the pointy space where your eye is. 
visualize the pillars of the creator, the pillars of creation in this gem swept telescope picture. And realize that at the point where the telescope is, every little thing that you see here, even from the end of the universe, has sent a packet of energy that is detected by the telescope. Everything that you see in this James Webb telescope picture is connected to the telescope. The telescope moves, we still see the picture. So everything is connected to everything. This is what every mystic says, but physics in electromagnetic we don't need to get very fancy, it says exactly the same thing. The whole universe is connected to you right now, even if you don't see it. So in theory, there is no separability. We cannot isolate ourselves from the rest of the universe. In practice, the speed of information is limited. It's the speed of light, and we're gonna achieve separability. This is what Bell is about, end of meditation. Let's get to the physics. Einstein and Podolsky wrote their famous paper, and Einstein actually uh, lamented the what he called the erudite presentation of Podolsky in how he presented the paradox. And Einstein liked to couch the argument of Bell in terms of, of course, the finite speed of information, which linked to special relativity. Einstein liked to say, look, if there's a finite speed of light, then we can achieve isolation of the system. All we need to do is to put enough distance between the subsystems. And when we do so, we achieve separability. For Einstein, the argument of EPR was truly one of separability of subsystems. This was also linked to causality in the mind of Einstein. Bell, as you know, translated these thoughts into a theorem, and the key line in the derivation of Bell's theorem is the separability of probability, which simply states, imagine that you flip a coin, head and head, the two events together, is the, prob is the factor of the independent probabilities because the events are not causally connected, they are separable. Therefore, the probability of having head and head is one fourth, meaning one half times one half, the probability of the independent events. The factorization of P probability of A and B equals probability of A times probability of B is the mathematical translation of the fact of separability. Bell's theorem for all the blah blah we go through is actually hinges on this key line. If we have separability, the Bell theorem is actually fairly simple, mathematically speaking. If you can factorize P, R, A, and B at the two separated points, then a quantity called S has the numerical value less than two. This is Bell's theorem. A key logical insight I hang on to and hang my hat to is what I call the Nobel, it's a corollary really, it's, but I call it the Nobel theorem. It's a two-way pun that I'm very proud of as a Frenchman. And it's basically the logical inverse of this statement. If we have, if separability then S less than two, the logical negation of this is if we observe S strictly superior to two, it means we have no separability. So if we were to take Bell's theorem at phase value and the logical implications of it at phase value, the Nobel theorem, which is a corollary, the logical negation corollary of Bell's theorem, says if we observe a violation, it means we're not separated. For if we were separated, we would not have S superior to two. So why is this so magical? Because so far, it's a fairly easy story I've been telling. Well, it's because the Copenhagen actually talks about isolation between the detectors. And we observe as strictly superior to two in modern Bell experiments. Two of them are schematically represented here. And the story with which we wrap this result is very magical. And it's a story about isolation between the detectors. 
We isolate the detectors. And so on the face of it, Bell is a really, really puzzling proposition because the Copenhagen interpretation tells us, well, you have this wave function, which may be mathematical in nature, just describing probabilities, but the probabilities realize when we have a physical action at one detector, which collapses the wave function with a laser. And at the other end, something magically happens regardless of the distance. And when we isolate physically these two systems, we still have this result. Well, that's a very magical story. And if you look at, so to the left of your screen is the usual schematics that you have, where you have the beam splitters, little a, little b, the detectors d minus d plus on both sides and the coincidence monitors. On the right, you have a very, 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 very fancy version of this. This is one of the latest experiment by the Zeilinger uh, Church, I should say, about hundred kilometers of submarine fiber with very fancy PBS. I'll go through some of these uh, equipment that they um, that they they talk about. I will point out, and this is really the gist of my argument in experiments and, and, and really in reviewing this, their, their experiment. By the way, I, I sent my paper to Gregor Weiss. Uh, Gregor uh, is the one who did the experiments for Zeilinger. Right? The, the very first Zeilinger experiment was done by Gregor Weiss when he was a, a grad student with uh, Anton. Uh, Gregor is now a full professor at the uh, University of Innsbruck. And I've had long exchanges with Gregor uh, about this experiment. He corrected many, many things, uh, but basically he agrees with what I'm presenting here about his own experiments. Uh, as you know, they got the Nobel for it, but I'm gonna make very clear claims. I'm simply going to claim that there is no separability to the source in these experiments. The source is never separated from the detectors. The detectors are always set. Bell famously prescribed that we should set the detectors in flight, okay? We send the photons from the source and then boo, 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 we move the detectors, we set them and we make the measures. That's physically impossible. We don't have the actuators to do that physically. We just can't do this experiment. It just does not exist. By the way, I read Gregor's thesis in German by putting paragraph by paragraph into Google Translate. That was a, a fun week of my life, just reading through his German and, and the thesis with Google Translate. I should do chat GPT now. Uh, but basically even Anton says this, we cannot do the actuator. So what we do instead in Aspe and Zeilinger, what we do instead is we put this IAOM, which is actuators, acousto-electronic optical modulators, that switch the path of the photons, but we, and we set the detectors in a preset fashion. This setting, these settings in the, in the Nobel winning experiments are static. We do not change the settings in flight. The settings are always static. What we change in flight is either the amplitude in the case of Asper, I'll show that in the next slide, or the phase in the case of Zeilinger, but at all times, the source of the photons has visibility on all four settings, at all times. There is no isolation from the source to the detectors. There is isolation between the detectors, which satisfies the Copenhagen narrative, but with Paul Verbos, I will argue that we're probably looking at something more simpler Namely, that the source is influenced by the detectors. And that would very simply explain why those photons seem to know what's going on. It is because they know what's coming. This slide is actually a deep dive into, well, a deep dive, a dive into the IOM components and why this claim of isolation in the narrative of the bell wind experiment is false. It's true of detector to detector, but it's false from source to detector. To the left, you have the acousto-electron optic modulator of ASPE, 
And to the right, you have the phase modulators of Zeilinger. The ones to the left, it's a, it's a Puckel cell that has a transducer that induces a, a current and creates acoustic standing waves in the media and this acts as a mirror. So you have a megahertz oscillation of the mirror in the aspect. But if you look very closely to the um, transmission, the transmitting and the deflected, you never have a true zero. Okay, this is true even of today's state-of-the-art acoustic optical modulators. You always have a residual signal, even with the state-of-the-art 2023, of about 15 to 20% residual signal. That's huge from an optical standpoint. Okay, there is no isolation. The source always sees through this transducer the four detectors. So put your eye at the source, look down to the IOM, see a mirror and see two superimposed detectors. You see the two superimposed detectors on average with the same intensity. You have zero isolation from the source to the detectors. Let's look now at the phase modulators of Zeilinger. What they do is they introduce a modular phase varying in the gigahertz by uh, 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 electric signal in uh, 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 electro-optic modulation of a crystal, which induces a phase delay, which switches the path of the photons. But again, it's fully transparent. Amplitude 197%, huge signal. What we change is the phase. So on average, the source always sees the four detectors superimposed. There is no isolation from the source to the detectors. Of course, the story of Copenhagen, let's go back two slides and then I'll go to the experiment I did and I'll take five minutes and we'll be done. Of course, <clears throat> the story of the Copenhagen is very magical because it focuses on a hypothetical collapse of this very magical wave function that happens at the detectors. When we detect that Alice, there's a projection at Bob. So there's a causal story of separability that of course clashes with Bell theorem. But this is linguistic. This is actually a paradox of linguistics and just the wrong ontology, the wrong interpretation. The Copenhagen talking about dead cats and the live cats of course does not mean anything. So if we have no isolation from the source, these red arrows say the source always knows what's going on at the end. Even with the modulation of the phase and amplitude in the middle, on average, we have a standing wave of say like Faraday wave of the walkers with cavity resonance. Then there is no magic here. The system is not separated. We should in fact, trivially violate Bell. I have personally run simulations of walkers uh, in, 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 in Bell. Uh, uh, John has written recently uh, 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 with Alvaro a, very, a great paper on isolation of walk, uh, on walk, Bell violation in walkers. We're looking at systems that are not isolated. We have a signal from one detector to the source or the other. And when you have no isolation by the Nobel corollary, you should see as strictly superior to two. The magic is all in the narrative, not in what's going on. With that insight, uh, while I was at, at the Parisian Langevin with Emmanuel Faure, um, we came up with this experiment uh, in a classic Bell setup. And what this experiment is, is okay, well, if the source is not isolated from the detectors, let's put this rotating Foucault mirror in the middle. And Foucault mirror is a rotating mirror. Foucault uh, used it uh, in 1860 something uh, to measure the speed of light by uh, in Paris between Montmartre and I think La Sorbonne. And basically we bought a state-of-the-art Foucault mirror. This is actually, uh, I had to sign papers that I was not using this for military application and who the hell I am to buy this mirror, blah, blah, blah. So a thousand Hertz, so a thousand rotations per second, state-of-the-art. And what that does is you have the source in the bottom center, I apologize. I don't know if you see my, 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 uh, my mouse here. Do you see it? Okay, so this is the SPDC source and we have 200 meters of fiber on both paths. 
And the Foucault mirror is rotating so that the line is moving. The mirror is bouncing and the line is moving. So only very intermittently do I go through this aperture, through my polarizers, and through my collector. So in the event that the signal is from detector to detector, this isolates it and even isolates the source to the detector. I don't know what my linear polarizer is going to be instantly, okay? If all of a sudden this opens, even if I have an instantaneous signal, I cover that. The 200 covers instantaneous signal. I don't have enough time for the photons formatted by this information to reach my detectors. So I create strong amplitude isolation in the Bell setup. Of course, my hope was that we would lose the Bell violation. I called it the no Bell experiment. Good pun. Instead, I observe it. It took me four months of going crazy. I did this during COVID. It's not easy to do it. I literally do this in my closet. I have about a quarter million dollars of Zeiss equipment in my, in my closet and, and do all this crap. I've killed more fibers than I care to. I'm naturally not a great experimentalist, but I taught myself and I'm now a more than decent experimentalist. I'm very proud of that fact. But anyway, I observe a, a clear violation. All right, well, that's weird that I observe a clear violation. How, how can that be? Uh, because I'll go back one slide for one minute. If, if, you know, even if this is open and I have a signal that says, hey, cheat, I'm going to measure you along this angle. And over here, I'm going to measure you along this angle. So I'm constraining you crystal. So now you can send me photons that correspond to this violation. The time it takes for these photons to fly back by the fiber is such that I don't detect them. So it cannot be an instantaneous signal period. So I invalidate all classes of models that are based on a, on a field. I'm looking forward to the next presentation that do not you know, need a field to, bail, to arrive at bail violations. But because I do this isolation, I eliminate all classes of traveling signals. But I'm not completely isolated. I intermittently see the target. So could it be a standing wave? To the right is the photo, the pictures that actually gave us the idea when we were doing the Bell experiment in walkers at Langevin in Paris. This is a Faraday field. It's always there in the walkers. It's a background field that really translates the cavity in a way for you. Of course, the difference between the standing wave and the traveling waves is well known. Uh, it's those two diagrams. You can always have a standing wave that on average is there in the field, in the cavity, in the Bell experiment. I do not rule these out in my own, but I do rule out all traveling waves, including instantaneous signal. There are many properties of the standing waves that are very interesting. Well, first of all, that was the Louis de Breuil uh, hypothesis. Uh, uh, he took his wave duality, uh, he hypothesized matter as standing waves. And hypothesized a Zitterbewegung clock, a movement, the Zitterbewegung, the little vibration um, that gives us Compton standing waves. And it's interesting because if you Doppler shift it, you have a law in construction that is proper to the standing waves. This is not generic. It's not true of only traveling waves. You need the forward and backward traveling. But when you do that, you have a bit in a beating effect on standing waves by Doppler. And it so happens that the math, the bridge between the two is very specific. You go from Compton standing wave to De Breuil standing wave by a Doppler contraction and expansion of the component traveling waves. This is, I've stolen the graphics to the right from John Macken, who's part of our group and has presented to our group, where you see contraction one way, contraction the other way, and the sum is a standing wave with a moving De Broglie node, okay? And it's a necessary, logically speaking, condition in this case, first, that we have a standing wave, and number two, that the standing wave be at Compton, meaning an electron standing wave. So we may be looking at cavity effects standing waves in Bell. Therefore, could we interpret Ispe and Zeilinder with just phase effects? Phase on standing waves? Mind you, 
for me to maintain 400 meters of phase coherence across the fiber, meaning the, the cavity resonance across the fiber, took me months. It's really hard. I'm amazed that Zeilinger and company can do it over 100 meters with just one bat ear set up. I'm amazed that the Chinese can do it with an orbital station. That kind of experimental coherence is non-generic and really, really hard to do. So those experiments are remarkable. They, they may just be phase effects. Also, if we were talking about the quarter wave plate experiments I do with Verbos, but if you look at the formalism and you put a half wave plate in the middle, it disappears. The Bell effect disappears. Well, how I did that. I actually put a half wave plate in my setup. Just, oh, let's put the half wave plate and see what happens. It disappears. How interesting. Because if you're talking about particles, why would a half wave, like little quarter or half wave completely change what's going on if they're particles? Makes no sense. In fact, our setups are not that precise. It's just big on a breadboard that blah, blah, blah. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. But if it's a standing wave, then half the wave plate will completely destroy my signal by destructive interference. End of story. End of story for me. And I've done this, and Bell disappears with half a wave plate as the formalism dictates. And 1029, I'm right on time. I started with two minutes or three minutes late. So I don't know what you want to do, Jack. We can take a couple questions or just move on. Sure. So if there are some quick questions, uh, remarks, please ask. And, and, and uh, maybe you can stop stop sharing, and, and uh, Richard could, could share and stop. So. And uh... well, well, I did write in the chat that I think your summary of what Bell assumed is a little bit uh, uh, cutting it short. He did not just assume probability of A and B is probability of A times probability of B. He assumed no, no, something he rather complicated no, concerning uh, the interaction between four binary variables, third order interaction. Yeah, the hidden variable thing is, is, is a narrative. It's blah, blah, blah. The real meat of his Yeah, yeah it is. A, I, uh, for me, too. I mean, I don't believe in hidden variables, but he dis the experiments disprove hidden variables. No, it's just a story we tell with the hidden variables. The real meat is separability. And Einstein <clears> says <throat> it's separability. And the separability. Oh, we will continue to discuss. No, I, I, I'm happy sending the actual line from, from speakable and unspeakable. It's one line where it shows that. And once you have that, the, the rest of the math is straightforward. Yeah, it's yeah, I know it's utterly trivial math. I don't see the That's chat. Not... Oh, I do see the chat. My bad. Spooky observation. Well, Mark, I, I was wondering when you were talking, where, where did you put the halfway plate? Because in the experiment I run, I have on one path, like like the quiet Seilinger experiment, you know, of 1990 something. Uh, in one path of the of the of the Bell experiment, you put a quarter wave plate and a half wave plate, and that allows you by manipulation of the angles zero and nine zero and one hundred uh, in in the in, in the in the phase element of the wave function. You can cal you know you can manipulate that alpha that phase by a wave plate. So this wave plate will create either a psi plus or a psi minus EPR bell state. You prepare the system in that way, yeah? And, but you, you turn the system into a phi state, phi plus or phi minus by putting a half wave plate before the half wave plate and doing similar, you know, similar manipulations with angles. So I'm investigating that, but no, I didn't, no, no. The, so because the, I'm investigating that, I didn't know exactly where you put the half wave. Right, 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 right. Let me, let me, the psi plus psi minus is by putting a quarter wave plate in the pump. Uh, that's uh, one thing I can put in and out of my Q tools setup. So it's fairly easy. I always work in psi plus and it's actually downstream. So in the measuring section, not the source section, but the measuring section, if you put yeah. a half wave plate, it disappears. By the way, the math of the Copenhagen formalism says as much, put a half wave plate, the whole thing goes to zero, right? Uh, so the formalism is not wrong. It's just the story we tell about the formalism that is nonsense. And, you know, I consider, personally, I consider 
all of these paradoxes, including the delayed choice, you know, why the particles know what's going on, because you have standing ways that tell them it's like echolocation, really. This is what's coming on in your future. To me, all the paradoxes are proved by the absurd that the narrative we, we, we tell is, is BS. And the half wave plate, again, is a, okay with the formalism. It's, it's a five minute experiment once you have Bell going. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's not really complicated. The complicated part is getting all those phases in order to observe Bell. But once the phases are perfect and you put half a wave plate and you move the thing, it goes to zero immediately. I mean, that's a five minute experiment. I encourage you to do it if you got the thing doing no, I do, it's I've, done it. I, I've done that. I've done yeah. that. But I, I'm wondering, my question was, where do you put the half wave plate? Because in my I experiment- repeat, I, I put the half wave plate in one of the arms of the measuring apparatus, not in the- source. But I do that. I do that. And what I do with the half wave plate in one of the arms is to shift from psi plus and psi minus to Phi plus and no, phi no, 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 no. I don't think that's correct. Yeah. No, I don't think that's correct. Okay. If if you put the 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 plate in the source, you'll shift, but not no. not, not downstream. I could be Look, wrong. I can show you. I can show you the paper of Seilinger, which he does the same. We reproduce that, Let's and we can talk up. about that later. And I can show I you what I've done and my results. But maybe on that one. maybe your setting is is it's a little bit different. So. I don't know no, exactly. It, it, in the I, pump from Q tool, I have a, a quarter wave plate I can take in and out, shifting psi plus psi minus, and in uh, one of the arms. But you know that's the source, so it impacts the pump. No, I do it. I do it on the on the arm. I I do it on the arm, and when I do it on the arm, you're not shifting psi plus psi minus. It's one psi plus state period, but I shift yeah. the the, and it's not there, which it shouldn't be. I mean, the formalism says it it should not be. But it's, it's interesting because I, I'll have to, we can we can get together and I, I'll have to show you what I've done and that we're about to publish a paper on those results. So, and, and it's basically the, the baseline is Zeilinger experiment reproduced successfully. And then, you know, and-, and Right, and no, but, but, but that's how we did it. Saying, you know, uh, I'm not proved EPR correct. I mean, it, this, the formalism says this, this is not yeah. magic. We're not violating Bell or anything. This is what the formalism says. It's just that, that at the interpretation layer, you know, uh -huh. if you look at half wave plates, moving standing waves, you can see that it goes to zero, right? So the, our narrative is still particle because of Copenhagen. But really, if you think about this problem, just like you think about the double slit or single slit experiment, we think of the double slit experiment in terms of waves, not in terms of particles. In terms of particles, the double slit experiment doesn't make any fucking sense. You have ballistic trajectories, end of story. And if you think about I, wait, I, I'm, not, I'm not questioning your, your no no I'm I'm, I'm answering James uh, in the yeah. chat no All right, okay. not not a halfway so so what I, I think a lot of our problem is that we, we you, about, you might if wave. I show you one diagram um, can I share if we have time Jared so maybe maybe, maybe so we, let's I'm happy to take it offline by the way let, let's let's try try to try to go to the schedule and, and you can yes yeah, so <laughs> there will be the discussion after after that. Yeah, I think, yeah, I'm going to start sharing my screen now. If I can find All right. It. All right. Uh, Thank you. Pino Bell mini conference. Yeah. Okay, can you say this? See this? Can you see this? Yes, very good. Okay, and, and can you still see it now? I put it on play. Yes. Uh, okay, <clears throat> right. Okay, so I, I will briefly introduce myself in a moment, like the last speaker, which I think is useful because there are a lot of uh, different people here and we have many different backgrounds. Now I'm uh, going to try to keep this short because I am just going to tell you some terribly negative things about what I've been looking at the last couple of weeks. And uh, first of all, there was an email from Marianne Kupczynski who said, uh, uh, I, my contribution for the discussions of this session would be his paper. And I started looking at his paper, and I'm going to tell you what I thought about his paper, which won't be very um, positive, I'm afraid. And then there was a discussion with uh, emails by Sergei Rashkovsky, and I don't know if he's here. I was, hope I was hoping that both these people would be here. And, uh, okay, I'm going to say some uh, like rude things about uh, what he was uh, promoting. Um, now, I'm a mathematician and a statistician, I'm not a physicist at all, really. I've been involved for a long time in, in, in uh, belt inequalities because there's a lot of 
classical probability in there, reasoning, and there's a lot of statistical analysis too in the experiments. And I contributed new methodology for the experiments, which I'm actually using in the latest experiments. Like uh, in 2015, there were four experiments, famous uh, experiments, so-called loophole free. Now, all, all of those four, <laughs> all of those four experimentalist groups, they actually cited me and used a methodology which I'd invented. And I'd love to talk about it, but I'm not going to talk about it now because I'm going because I got myself. Uh, um, uh, into this uh, track of these things, which you can see on the slide now. Uh, briefly about myself, my, one of my main activities is getting, getting serial killer nurses out of jail. And I uh, should emphasize that I concentrate on serial killer nurses who are probably innocent. And uh, this was quite amazing that a journalist of science wrote a whole article of, about me, seven page article in science. And if you want to find more about me, you, you know, have, have a look at that article. It uh, <laughs> tells you what, what are the things that drive me. I, I mean, basically, I'm driven by, by injustice and fixing misunderstandings of statistics. OK, so that was a little self-advertisement. Uh, actually, I, do, uh, I did explain to the journalist who wrote this how my work on, on uh, uh, quantum entanglements actually helped get a convicted serial killer nurse in the Netherlands out of jail because I went over to my colleague um, Gerard at Hoofd and I asked him if he would sign a petition which I had composed and he thought about it and then he did and then the next day the journalist saw that Gerard at Hoofd had signed the petition and this was one of the things which forced the system, the establishment to take a bunch of um, yeah, rebellious people seriously who were saying that her conviction was in unjust. Right, so I want to talk about uh, two, actually two topics. And uh, the first one is this work by Marian Kupczynski, which uh, came out this year. And of course, uh, he thinks that what John Bell today would choose would be uh, um, contextuality. And I think that John Bell today would choose non-locality, and I'm very happy with that. Um, uh, OK, then a second topic, if there's enough time. See how it goes. Uh, right. Yeah, this is sort of technical. I, I, I want to <laughs> explain to you that uh, 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 my friend, our friend Marianne Kupczynski, has been writing about 20 papers the last uh, 10 years. Uh, attacking Bell and saying that it's all a question of non context of contextuality and not about non locality. And I'm afraid most of those papers are wrong and they make elementary mathematical errors. Now, uh, can you see my mouse? Or is my mouse not visible? Somebody can see it. Okay. Because I hear copying a couple of uh, formulas from. <laughs> <laughs> from his paper and uh, of course they're, they're sort of horrible formulas and next thing I'm going to do is sh show you what his idea is in in a much more simple way but the formulas are going to be important because formulas actually show an enormous confusion of notation so the people who study Bell's inequalities may have seen things looking like this you have settings Alice's setting I box setting is J then there are two outcomes, AIJ and BIJ, and uh, one computes the expectation value under an assumption. Uh, Bell has, uh, computes it under an assumption of, of uh, local hidden variables, what equals local hidden variables. And uh, uh, Kupczynski wants to basically wants to say that uh, Bell's assumption is much too narrow and it's unrealistic and it's unphysical because. It, there must, it, it is very reasonable to suppose that the hidden variables are not just sitting in the source going to the two photo detectors, et cetera, et cetera, but that there are also hidden variables in those, uh, in those detectors, in the apparatus, in the two apparatuses of Alice and Bob. And so he uh, uh, is got here, lambda one is a hidden variable going from the source to Alice's place. And lambda two is the hidden variable going from the source to Bob's place. 
Uh, now this is a bit dangerous notation because he's got lambda one and lambda two, and he's also got lambda i and lambda j, and i and j are indices which could be one and two. But when he writes lambda i, he doesn't mean lambda one or lambda two, he means something else entirely. So this is a danger of trying to write things up in, in formulas when it's, when it's much better to look at it in a different way. So the lambda one and lambda two are going from the source to the two detectors, uh, and the lambda i and lambda j are variables which are sitting there in the detectors. And actually, he doesn't put this little prime here. I, I added that. I'm, <laughs> I corrected what I think is an unfortunate misprint in his paper, because you mustn't think that, that you know, I mean, if j happens to be two, you have to know that lambda j is still the lambda j in Bob's apparatus, the lambda two in Bob's apparatus, not the lambda two, which could be analysis apparatus, not, not this one, not this lambda two. And both those lambda twos of Alice and Bob are not the lambda two, which goes from the source to uh, source to uh, Bob. But anyway, so there are four things here. There's lambda one and lambda two, a lambda I and lambda J prime, and I and J can both be one or two. So actually there's, uh, a lambda one, a lambda two, a uh, lambda one, and a lambda two with a little i, uh, and a lambda one and a lambda two prime. There are six lambdas in his model. That's a lot. He's got a lot of, he's got hidden variables all over the place, and they have all kinds of indices hanging on them, showing that they are, uh, uh, should be interpreted in a different way. Okay, the outcomes are plus or minus one, as usual. Uh, there is uh, he, he says lambda is lambda one, lambda two, lambda i, lambda j prime, and it's an element of a set lambda i j. So actually we have uh, four of these because there are four combinations i j. So it's a horrific notation and um, maybe is responsible for confusion which comes up. Uh, here's his basic model is saying that uh, the joint probability density of all the hidden variables does factor into the probability density of the stuff coming from the source and the probability density of the stuff in the detectors. So here are the detector hidden variables and here are the source hidden variables. And then uh, one, one of these two and one of these two goes to Alice. One of these two, well, I mean, this one is already with Alice. Um, Okay, now there's some words here which I won't go into, but his claim is that his model 10 allows explaining data from Bell tests in a local and causal way. And, uh, and he writes out some formulas and he talks about all that and claims that in, his, in this uh, setup, you cannot prove Bell inequalities and therefore Bell is nonsense because it's unphysical, because it's all just a question of contextuality. Uh, now, uh, I think it makes good sense to try to look at this uh, graphically and in statistics and probability and causality nowadays we use uh, graphical models a great deal, which is we draw, draw uh, simple graphs uh, of special type di uh, directed acyclic graphs explaining the dependence between a, a, a heap of random variables, some of which may be observed and some not observed. And um, so there's some lines of text there. Uh, one, one, uh, the thing uh, about a directed acyclic graph, and here's an example, this is, this directed acyclic graph is actually a representation of the formulas of Mr. Uh, Kupczynski in a graphically, in, in, a, in, a, in a, a visually, which explains how he thinks everything is going on. What is created in various places and then goes to various places and then things are made out of what came. Uh, so he starts off here top left with uh, the settings, I and J, Alice gets a setting and Bob gets a setting and they, he allows them to be statistically dependent. I'm not concerned by that, uh, that's certainly allowed. Uh, over here he has, the, there's the settings that are coming perhaps from the experimenter or experimenters. Over here are the hidden variables in the source, one of which goes to Alice's side, and the other one goes to Bob's side. They are lambda one and lambda two, uh, not to be confused with lambda i and lambda j prime. 
which are the hidden variables in in uh, in the, in the uh, instruments in the apparatuses, and he says they may be correlated. They are they are independent of these ones. So uh, the graph says the model says i and j are independent of lambda one and lambda two. Given i and j, uh, these things in the middle have some probability distribution depending on i and j. Now we can move move down. Uh, uh, then this node of the graph says that given the arrows coming into it, so given these variables and these variables, uh, this is some possibly random function of the values of, of, up there and over there. Now, um, it's a little bit complicated and confusing, and I already kind of fixed this notation by putting a prime here, so we would know that this lambda j prime belongs to Bob's instruments. Um, oh, I'm not quite sure if you can see it. Yeah, uh, his, his, what he keeps saying about his model is that uh, the I and J, the, so the actual settings which are chosen are dependent, statistically dependent on the instrument hidden variables. And um, not only that, if, if you look at this, uh, graph, you start with the settings, then you go to these variables, then you, whoops, sorry, and you, then you go down to the bottom, there is an I here, and there's a J here. So this thing here, A, is a random function of I and lambda 1 and lambda I, and this B is a random function of J and of uh, lambda 2 and lambda J prime. Uh, so that's, what, and that, I've, I've added ij there. He doesn't say that that's what he's doing. Well, he says it implicitly by uh, the line up at the top, which uh, I can't see because there's something in front of it. Uh, anyway, he's, he's assuming that the settings go to the instrument. Instruments, because they have to be available to the two instruments separately. And he said that they can be dependent and he said that these instrument variables are dependent of those. So, uh, uh, what basically what he's, uh, uh, well, to, to, to see that this is, is, is nonsense, is, you, is to see that you could model any correlations between the observations given the settings you like with that model. That model makes no restrictions whatsoever on reality. It's, it's more general than quantum mechanics. It, it, basically, it's a um, uh, uh, violation of locality. He's saying the settings are known throughout the whole experiment uh, before the experiment is done and influence the variables which are in the various locations. So, well, maybe Mark agrees with that because this could be the standing waves uh, uh, doing that. But it's, um, it's, uh, it's uh, silly. And uh, I... I won't say more about that, but uh, I, I, what I do want to say is that there is an enormous amount of confusion in the literature and people are making things much too complicated by making extremely complicated stories about things and not keeping them simple. So um, a similar topic is some more recent work. Uh, there are various uh, people out there who are saying, um, well, I'll show you what they're going to say, what they say. Uh, Sergei Rashkovsky, we had some emails from him recently and, and discussion with him, and he drew attention to some papers of his. Derat, Michelson, and Hess, uh, possibly famous or infamous, I don't know. Um, they, uh, Derat, Michelson, and Hess, they want to introduce a new loophole. Now, I'm getting worried what the time is. Well, it seems I like still got 10 minutes, so that's okay. Uh, Durant, Michelson, and Hess have decided to introduce a new loophole, and it's called the photon identification loophole. And their idea, their idea fix, is that um, uh, these experiments are about photons, and more specifically, they're about pairs of photons, and we have to uh, uh, look for and restrict attention to pairs of photons which were emitted at the same time 
which therefore might be entangled or correlated or whatever. And uh, if, we, if we don't make any attempt to identify which of the events which occur in these experiments belong to pairs of photons which belong together and which events don't, uh, then we're wasting our time. And I think this opinion, which actually is quite widespread, because I show you that uh, uh, the other guy, uh, Rashkovsky, has got the same idea, is, is based on a simple misreading of what Bell was on about, what he was trying to do, what the experiments nowadays do do. And uh, people should take account of this before uh, saying that Bell was wrong or whatever. They say, uh, it is essential that the identification of photons is included into any meaningful theoretical model of an EPRB experiment. Otherwise, the model is too simple. Failing to do so, only spooky influences can explain the observed pair correlations, specifically omitting the inclusion of data which select the photons and or pairs opens an Einstein local loophole, which we call henceforth the photon identification loophole. And they say, by design, Bell-type models for the recent experiments that claim to be loophole-free suffer from this loophole. Now, I think they have not read the papers of the recent experiments because it's, uh, that, that is simply true. So they uh, believe a myth and they uh, have been misled by what Aspect did long ago or Clauser did or whatever, and they're not taking any notice of what the experimenters are doing today. That's one of my messages. All the people talking about what was wrong with Weiss experiment or with Aspect's experiment or something, please just wake up and take a look at the experiments which got the Nobel Prize. They are doing rather different experiments. They are also aware of all the issues which uh, enable one to give alternative interpretations of Aspect's or, or uh, uh, Gregor Weiss, who's a friend of mine as well, by the way. Uh, Gregor Weiss, I've written a paper with him even, uh, Gregor Weiss experiment. Yes, it is vulnerable to uh, a, a loophole, which means the results could mean something else than what people, some people would like it to mean. But there has been a lot of progress since 1980 or whenever it was, or I forget exactly when, or 90, uh, a great deal of progress. And it's progress by experiments who are aware of the defects of the early experiments and have come up with extremely original and exciting and interesting new technology in order to neutralize those defects, to eradicate those defects. So with the experiments we should be talking about, it's not Aspects experiment 1980, but the latest experiments, for instance, of the, uh, the Munich group, uh, the one published in 2022 in Nature, fantastic experiment. It's completely different, or completely different type and it's, it's not open to the explanation, I think, which some of you guys would like to give them. I mean, I, 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 I'm happy to be proven wrong, but you are fighting uh, you know, dead cows or something. I forget the good saying here. Uh, this is what Durant and Michelson and Hess, Carl Hess say. They say specifically a physical theory that describes pair correlations of space-like separated systems must account for and include all procedures that determine the detection of the particles and the knowledge which pair of particles and data belongs together. That's what they say. I don't, I, maybe many experimentalists would say that's obvious. Yes, of course. Well, I say that's not obvious. It's not obligatory. There's no must. And Bell absolutely explicitly made absolutely clear that you shouldn't do that, not to do what he wanted to do. Of course, if you want to study photons, you're going to assume things about photons. But if you want to study local hidden variables, you don't need, you, you're not going to assume anything about photons. Uh, uh, Rashkovsky has exactly the same uh, uh, mentality. Uh, he notes that in the results of real experiments, all kinds of things play a role. Uh, he doesn't know about the newest experiments where they no longer play a role and uh, and so on he's got the same idea i think it's a wrong idea um so yeah who says you have to analyze experimental data in any particular way 
you may analyze experimental data in any way which is meaningful. And Bell experiments are done for a particular purpose. And the, the, uh, the good experiments nowadays are designed in order to give clear answers to the questions connected to that purpose. And the experiments should be analyzed in that uh, way. Uh, this was a little figure of, of, of Bell from the Bertelmann Socks paper, one of my favorite, uh, favorite papers. Um, and what I have written there at the bottom is the aim of the experiment is to test the hypothesis of local hidden variables being the mechanism which is this, uh, describing what is going on inside that long box. We don't want to and don't have to there's no need to think about what is going on inside the box. The question is, could what goes on inside the box be of a certain form? And Bell shows that if it is of a certain form, then those certain inequalities will be true. Experiments uh, violate those inequalities. And that means what is going on in the box is not of the type written at the bottom, in the, on the bottom line there. And Bell says <laughs> some words uh, in the paper there, which I like rather much, he says, you might suspect that the very notion of particle freely used above has somehow led us astray. Did not Einstein think that fields rather than particles at the bottom of everything? The following argument, and that's the derivation, will not mention particles, nor fields, nor any picture, whatever of what is going on at the microscopic level. It will not also not use the word quantum mechanical system which can have an unfortunate effect on the discussion. So forget about quantum mechanics too. The difficulty is not created by any such picture or any such terminology. It, it, those terminologies and those pictures are irrelevant. It is created by the predictions about the correlations in the visible outputs of certain conceivable experimental setups. And these are conceivable experimental setups, which are actually performed nowadays routinely. Uh, and in which one sees violations of those predictions about the correlations. And therefore you can conclude that this uh, picture of what is going on is, is wrong. And if you don't care about that picture, then you're not interested. I mean, Feynman was not interested. He already knew that this was not the way that things work. Um, okay, I think I can skip that slide. And this is the last slide. <laughs> uh, okay, so no. I'm being annoying. Uh, so Planck's principle is that a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because it is its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. And my comment is this is taking a bloody long time because the misunderstandings about what Bell was trying to do and what indeed the purposes of the experiments which led to the Nobel Prize last year a lot of people still don't know and haven't bothered to find out. And then we get interminable uh, waste of time. I mean, noise, uh, confusing the young people, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. What is the time? One minute past five. So, so maybe some comments. <laughs> uh, and I, I will switch to mine, and, and, and we can discuss for a minute or two. I have a yeah. quick question, General. Uh, and uh, who's um, that? Yes. Yeah. My name is okay. Adam. Can, can you see me? Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So I appreciate your engagement with uh, the Bell Deniers. I'm aware of some of your other work. And um, yeah. one thing I have, I've not seen you write about, and I'm curious to know your opinion on it. Um, if you're aware of it, is the literature on compatibility, probabilistic compatibility. And um, Carl Hess has written a little bit about this. Um, yes. Phillips. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And I think yes. in particular, there's a, there's a paper by Itamar Patowski, which associates, associates the Bell mathematics with uh, actually going all the way back to George Boole. And yeah, yeah. Um, I know. And I'm yes. curious to know what you think about that, because in my opinion, that <laughs> makes most sense in light of what you just said that, about the Bertelmann socks and Bell's comments about, you know, 
Yeah, we don't yes. need to know what is happening inside the box. No. Um, yes, I, I know that literature well, and I, I think uh, Carl Hess is a muddled person. I mean, he's uh, uh, a kind of a giant of his field, which was quantum electronics or something like that. And I think he just does not understand Bell. And I think I do. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, my, I, I come from Ireland too. I mean, John Bull came from Ireland, Bell came from Ireland. My grandfather's grandfather left Dublin for England at the height of the uh, famine in, in uh, 1850. So I have Irish blood too. So I appreciate Bell very much. And indeed, uh, Bull proves, you could say, proves Bell's theorem in his book. I'm one of the few people who actually check the proof in there. And lots of people say this. And uh, so the thing about compatibility is, you know, the, the hidden variable assumption the local hidden variable assumption is, is the assumption that a probability model with, uh, uh, yeah, with uh, various variables all existing uh, can, uh, can describe the situation we have in. So uh, Bell called it little lambda, I'm a probabilist, I call it little omega. I mean, it's just Kolmogorov's omega. And it's, it's, it's not, uh, like the physical cores or the physical variables, hidden variables, but it's uh, just a, 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 a kind of enumeration of all the possible outcomes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the answer is yes, but we, we already know that quantum mechanics uh, can't, can't, be, uh, can't be modeled in this way. It, it allows correlations which are not allowed in a, in a classical way in a certain sense. Okay, so maybe let's, let's take it to the end, or we can continue to, to chat, for example. Yeah, I, so I, I should I, stop I, sharing. I like yes, I have, I have already started. Do you see my slides, right? Yes. Oh, I have uh, already stopped me sharing. Great. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank you. So, so, so I'm sorry because I have a, a lot a lot to tell, uh, as, as, as always. So, so, so that, that's the big, big, big problem, that, that we, we successfully use Lagrangian theories, general relativity, electromagnetic quantum field theories, so, but they are hidden, hidden, hidden model. So, the, can we do it in 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 view of of, of Bell? So, so my my answer is that, that that yes, we can. The problem is that 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 we use this intuit, intuition of time of present is that we have this this current moment. It, it evolves in, in future toward future, uh, according to the Euler equation or. Or, or let's say Schrodinger equation from the simplest perspective, but that this is not a correct uh, view. That that physics in, instead has solved solved the, the equations to the eternalis block universe point of view, which is natural for general relativity. That, for example, solving to the least action principle instead of Euler regular. So one can say that we can translate between such solutions. However, if we the solution originally found with each of them have different different properties. So uh, the, the 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 ones on, on the right, the, this action, have super determinants. The, they know about all the future measurements. You, you can say so. So this is kind of living in in space time as a for the for dimensional jello that that each each moment in time is is in equilibrium between past and future. And for example, in in S matrix, there is this well known formula that you have two two amplitudes. One is past, second of the future. So that that's that's very na natural in many many perspectives a way to get board the borrow that one amplitude goes from from symmetry one amplitude from from past on future and second from future so uh, to, to show it I, I will talk about the Ising model which is kind of simplified view on on this Feynman path ensemble so Ising model is also path ensemble but now in in in, in time instead, instead of instead of in, in space instead of time our well, Feynman is in, in time and in, it is weak rotated simpler to understood. So I, I focus on this random walk along Ising model. So, so here we have the Komogor of the third axiom uh, on, on the left, uh, which leads to uh, Bell inequalities. But on the, on the right, we will get Born rule also in Ising model, uh, so which, 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 which allows to violate, violate Bell-like Bell inequality. So we replacing this simple um, equality with, with this sum of amplitude squares, the probability. There is some noise. Uh, uh, so please, somebody is controlling. I don't have control now. So please, please. Okay. So um, a big problem uh, for 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 them this deterministic view is is then the measurement. Can we can we? There is some noise. Could you mute? Uh, 
so the big, prob big problem is, is, is measurement. So, so uh, with this non-unitarity of quantum mechanics, like like measurement. So, so can you can you understand it in in, in, in deterministic way? So, so uh, so Stan Gerlach is an as a nice idealization of, of, of measurement. Uh, so, so it is that magnetic dipole aligns in external magnetic field, getting to, 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 to make the torque Q zero. Torque Q is, is magnetic dipole cross, cross the external magnetic field. So, so, so this, 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 this uh, being zero means to getting parallel or anti-parallel uh, alignment. So, so otherwise we have Larmor precession like, like here, uh, which means additional kinetic energy. So, 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 so non-aligned has, has additional kinetic energy like excited atoms want to radiate this, this, this excessive energy uh, as, as a photon, for example. Uh, so, so Mantita, there is, there is some noise from, if you could mute. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, I, don't, I see still your conclusion on the page with conclusion blank screen at principle. Is it uh, only on my screen or? Sorry, sorry, so can you see my, uh, so let me tell you one more time. Uh, uh, and now, do, do you see my uh, first slide, second slide? Uh, Not yet. You, yes, second slide, yes. No, I see only black screen. Um, uh, can anybody see my, my, my first slide, second slide? Ev yeah. Everybody else can. You I can see me have a slow computer. Second slide, computer okay. Issue. Okay, so, so here is second slide. Uh, about uh, the, the stem girl. Um, so, so, so if if the spin is not aligned, then we have this additional larmor precession, the additional kinetic energy, and 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 excited like atom has tendency to the, to release this energy because there is no no going back if it escapes to infinity. So, 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 so uh, an aligned spin has additional kinetic energy of larmor precession. Also, this alignment also changes the angular momentum because it is along the the spin. Uh, so, so. Uh, also, we have this uh, point pointing uh, so this, this energy d d density radiated. So, so having dipole, magnetic dipole, which is which is staying, then the electric field is zero. But it starts start start, uh, start processing, then it's got got, got non-zero from Maxwell equation. So, so we get some radiation of 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 of, of, an, of energy, and and so naively the question is, can we observe it? So. So in, while the exciting of atom, we get a photon which can, we can absorb. But in this case, we have cylindrical kind of antenna and cylindrical antenna produces cylindrical electromagnetic wave. So it, it, it dissipates one over uh, the density, one over distance, distance square. So it, it might be much more difficult to, to, to observe. It, it mostly turns it into heat. So, so also, um, it, so it is kind of the deterministic on uh, this measurement, a stem gerlach, and it could be also reversible, but the problem is that we would need to prepare reverse electromagnetic wave, which, which is very technically challenging. Okay, so let me go to the main, main topic. So I will talk about this random walk along Ising model, uh, Ising sequence, for, for example. So, so the question is, so this is called maximal entropy random walk. Uh, and so, so the question is, why should we maximize entropy? So, so this is, the, I have, I use the, this, this simple, um, the view so so having these um, n positions and with zeros and ones so so the question is how many uh, sequences are with some percentage of ones so so there is this uh, asymptotically it's two to power entropy channel entropy uh, of, uh, of of this, this probability so so focusing of some chosen probability we restrict to subspace of possibilities with this percentage of of, of let's say one and 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 it and this 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 uh, but is the largest for this percentage being one half. So, 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 so this, this subspace dominates combinatorially uh, all, 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 all the remaining possibilities. So this is, this is the simplest view on this, uh, this giant principle of maximal entropy that if we don't know some parameters like this P, the second assumption is to choose the one which maximizes entropy because it, it corresponds to subspace of possibilities which grows the fastest with the, the size of the, of the system, this N, yes, so. So now, now let's let's briefly look at this um, thermodynamics, uh, the classical mechanics. Um, uh, so 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 looking for example at this system of this containment with with some particles on the left. So uh, so from classical evolution, it should be nearly cyclic to the, the Poincaré recurrence theorem. It's deterministic. Uh, we have single possibility. So entropy is zero. 
So, so how to get entropy, some, some, some statistical mechanics? So, so we need to perform this approximation. It's called, it can be viewed as mean field, as source and that's approximation. And after this approximation, we can get the entropy growth because before we have entropy zero all the time. So, so here is approximate approximation of this setting saying that we say that you have just one value, P as percentage of how many percentage particles are on the left as the entire description. Using this simple description as just simple number P, then we can derive entropy growth. So, 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 so we, to get entropy growth, you need to get to the statistical picture, like this averaging over, over, over uh, to get the density. And after doing that, we can derive entropy growth. But before we can get Poincare recurrence theorem going back and back and back with the same situation. And there is this nice uh, Katzring um, model I, I, I recommend, which is kind of similar to, to what I have told that we have these black and, and white uh, balls and we get one step uh, around and there are some, some, some marked positions going through this marked position, you get black to white or, or the opposite. And so, so, uh, after, so using simply this Stoser and that, this, this mean field approximation, you can easily show that entropy should grow. However, if you do the deterministic, that after making two rotations, you get the same color because you get even even number two or the position. So, so, so the entropy grows. Then, then, then it becomes cyclically. Very nice, very nice simple model. I, I recommend to look at to understand uh, what how the entropy grows in in uh, in, term, in time symmetric models. And this also can be a time symmetric model, H theorem. Okay, so let's go to this random walk along Ising model. So, so, so this is this maximum entropy random walk. So, so, so there is a big question: how to choose probabilities in random walk on on, the, on a graph? So we have a simple graph, uh, ones and zeros, and and after one we have to use zero. After zero you can go zero or one. So, so for a random walk we have one parameter, this Q which decides what is the probability of going to zero after zero. The question is how to choose this Q, yes? Yeah? So, so in standard random walk, we would say that, that Q should be one half because one half maximizes entropy. However, it turns out it only maximizes entropy locally for this one step, but, but taking mean entropy, we don't maximize it for, for one half. You should use zero, six, uh, zero, six, one, one, eight. This is the, 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 the entropy maximizes entropy, uh, and the, the probability maximizes entropy, this is the entropy, Behavior depending on this Q, Q choice. So, so why, why why is it so? Why we should use different than one half? So here is here is some calculation. So for each Q, we can find the stationary probability distribution of, of the states uh, in on, on this graph, and we can use entropy as average over the probability of being in given vertex times entropy produced from this vertex. And we doing so, we get this this dependence from the Q. So 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 this is some a lesson that that this naive choice that one half it's not always optimal. It, it, it optimizes entropy locally for one step, but not, not, not on average. And for example, in Isaac model, going through some complex Isaac model, we also will not use this standard random walk, but it's maximal entropy random walk. So here is, here is some more sophisticated situation. So, so we, have a situation, we have some graph which the, the, the defines where we can jump, like here is the simpler graph, but now we mark much, more, much larger graphs. And we need to find a stochastic graph, a stochastic matrix for this graph. Uh, and for each, it defines some stationary probability distribution. And you would like to find it to maximize this entropy pro production. So this is average entropy over the stationary probability of being in given vertex. And here is some situation, uh, some, some, some lattice with defects. And so, the, 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 so there is a regular lattice. Defect means that, that, that you cannot, uh, there, is, there are self loops, but these self loops are, are, are damaged, are, are removed. So, so, uh, so without defect, we have degree uh, uh, five, and with defect, we have degree four. <laughs> so, here are um, this is probability distributions for standard random walk. It's generic, sorry, this is cut. As for standard random walk, so, so this is after 10 steps, this is some, some Gaussian. Uh, so, uh, around this is for this maximal the random walk uh, looks similar, but after 100 steps they start looking very different, and after 1,000 steps they are completely different. So this is uniform distribution, and for for maximal the random walk, walk we get a strong localization, understand localization. Turns out we get exactly the the, the quantum ground state uh, stationary probability distribution using this 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 proper this maximizing entropy random walk. 
So, uh, so here is some experimental data. So, so the semiconductor also this such de defected lattice, and we look with a tunneling microscope, what is the probability density of electrons? So we can see that it's not like this one, but like, like this one. It's, it's strongly localized. And, and, and qualitatively, for example, for semiconductor, if, if, if putting um, electric field here, then electrons should flow. But here they cannot flow because they are prison in this in this in this uh, entropic walls. Yeah. So so for so so this semiconductor would be wrong because you would say that that electron should be it should be conductor, but it, it isn't. So there are these two philosophies. So Sander van der Mock um, assumes that we have this dragon sailor that that he goes to the the to the uh, a node and looks sees three positions and throw a dice and and goes goes according to this this uh, this uh, probability distribution. And in MERF, we, we assume that, 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 that there is some, we take possible paths in this graph and assume a uniform probability distribution or, or Boltzmann among them and, 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 and go, go, uh, go. Uh, so, so MERF uses, MERF, MERF, we don't assume that, that the worker directly uses them, the probability distribution. Instead, we, it, it is us who, who use the model when we don't know what, what the, the worker does. So, is the, the safest, the maximizing entropy model for, for the hidden behavior of the of the worker. So, so these, these are completely different, different philosophies. So the, the worker doesn't use the MERV, only we use the MERV to get the, the safest assumption about the, let's say, probability distribution of finding the worker after some number of steps. Okay, so here are the formulas. So we have we have the the, the graph given by by a density matrix M. So for standard random walk, we would say that we should have the one over one over degree. Uh, the probably each outgoing the edge is equally probable. For MERV, it's more complicated. We first need to find a station uh, the dominant eigen eigenvector of the other density matrix. So this is this is the dominant eigenvector eigen equation, and then this is the stochastic ma matrix. And this is the stationary probability distribution. We can, we can see the Born rule, but we, we have to find the dominant eigenvector as for the la largest lambda. And the lambda turns out to be minus energy. So maximal lambda means, means, minus, uh, means uh, the ground state, the quantum ground state. So, so we get exactly the quantum, quantum ground, ground state using this uh, random work, which is mathematically kind of, kind of this quantum mechanics after weak rotation. So, so it's not, not a surprise, surprise, but we, we get nice situation where the squares come from here. So, so let, let us derive it to the Born rule, the, where the squ squares come from. So, so we have a graph and we would like to assume uniform probability distribution among all the paths on the graph. So, so now the question is taking such uniform probability distribution among paths, what is the probability of finding the, the, the particle uh, in given position uh, in, in this time? So, 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 so here is the, the, the summation that, that we need to sum over y and y and z. So here is y, here is z. We, we perform t steps. So here is here is t steps and t steps here. And the question is, what is probability of finding x in the center in the limit uh, t to infinity? So we perform this limit t to infinity. And in doing so, uh, so there is this Frobenius parent theorem saying that that should be one dominant eigenvector. Uh, so finally, we get this one dominant eigenvector square because one one psi comes from 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 this this left m, the second psi comes from this right right m. So literally, one amplitude go go from the left, the second amplitude goes to the, from the right, and to get the probability, we need to multiply both, both amplitudes. That that's that's the intuition for for Born rule. The right for Ising model asking about probability in the center of Ising model, we get the Born rule. To find to find the probability. Here is a more sophisticated, but I don't have time. But but it's derivation for for Boltzmann distribution. We have two ways to, to, to derive. One is as I, I have shown using using this this now and taking paths from minus infinity to plus infinity and asking what is the probability of going here. And this again this this derivation. We get the Bonnell. We get the the stochastic matrix. And second second derivation is going starting from from now and T taking um, paths to, to our future uh, and, and taking a sample of paths to our future and asking what is the, the probability of going the next step. So maybe here is here is a nicer uh, picture that, that in the random walk, uh, going up or down, uh, you, you look one step to in future. 
so there is one step here, one step here. Now length two steps. So here is one 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 step length two steps here and two here. Then this length three, length four, and so on. And in infinity we get the maximum of random walk. So uh, assuming ensemble of paths of inf infinite length toward toward future and asking what is the probability for the one step in, in such ensemble of paths. Okay, so so it can be directly used for Ising model, uh, for example. So there is this nice, uh, there is this Markov field. Uh, there is nice Hammersley Clifford theorem that 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 Gibbs fields like Ising model are, are also Markov fields. And Markov fields are, are this this nice, nice this picture that that the probability of the question mark under the condition of the the blue blue values is in fact only depends only on the on, on the neighboring values on, on the green values. Here is local uh, Markov condition. Here is global Markov condition that, that the probability distribution of these question marks depends, in fact, only on these uh, adjacent uh, values. Or we can also do the scanning that the probability of question mark, in fact, depends on the value on this on this interface kind of yes. So so using MERF, you can you can literally find find the, the probability distribution. For example, this model, this scanning model. So, so, so we use MERV to get the probability distribution of pairs of, of such, such, such slices. Uh, then we marginalize some over the, the, the stars and get the probability distribution of this, of, this, of this shape. And then we can get conditional probability distribution that having these values in the, the green, green positions, what is the probability of using the question mark here? Yes, and, and, and it, it works very nice for, for Ising model. You can get nearly, nearly accurate, accurate um, solution for Ising model here. You see this there are, are happy, somebody's interested. <laughs> Okay, so now going back to, to Schrodinger equation. So so the, the, so in standard random walk, so here is, here is the, the lattice I'm focusing now. So so we have one dimensional lattice with self loops, and some of self loops are removed. These are our defects. So so a few self loops are, are removed, and here are the defects. It is one defect of length one thousand cycle, uh, and and here is second defect, third defect, and so on. So so in standard random walk, what is the stationary probability of such such Length one thousand cycle with some de defect. So some random walk, the probability is is, is proportional to, to to degree of so this is two or three degrees. So this the, the, so there is very very weak localization, but strong localization. So here is logarithmic um, plot. So we can act, many or or the walkers are are in this in this uh, in this in this zone. Yes. And, and to derive it, we have this this um, this um, eigen eigen equation, uh, subtracting, multiplying by minus one. We get we get Schrodinger equation practically. This, this was Schrodinger equation, and we say that that that, that this is literally the Schrodinger ground state um, uh, density. Okay, so um, I also get recently made made working a P, P and diode diode model. So 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 can we do diffusion model for for semiconductor? The simplest uh, non trivial is the the is diode the, the P, P and junction and and it, it works literally. So here are some examples of of density of electrons uh, and, and and the flows local flows in in P and junction. So here is NP as, as semiconductor with two types of of defects and and the ohm law is the, we have we get the nonlinear uh, ohm law ohm law that that if we got the this Forward bias, then you, then you get the, the conductance. If you have reverse bias, then you ha don't have. But, the, but then after some breakdown voltage, the conductor starts. So, so here, here it slowly starts, and here is very, very strong conductance. So we can get working diffusion mod conductance model of, 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 uh, of, of diode. So, uh, so uh, there is also nice. So there, there is a big question should we use standard random walk or, or this maximal random walk? So for 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 large object like like for human walker, I would like to, like to do standard random walk. But for 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 example for neutrons, then sound that for neutrons, they also observe this this first first excite, this this ground state. That so here is here is a line for neutrons. Um, I don't remember the details, but so here is for the for the uh, standard random walk, and here is for the for the ground state. So and it turns out experimentally for neutrons, we should use. Diffusion uh, quantum mechanics or diffusion according to its maximum entropy random walk. And here is the simplest, simplest difference. So having this uh, this uh, zero one um, infinite infinite uh, well, uh, the question is what probability distribution inside this zero one well should we should we expect? Standard standard diffusion would say that it should be uniform distribution rho equal one. Yes, but quantum mechanics say it should be sine square. N neutrons also say that it should be quantum. It should be like this one. 
And in MERV, it, it, we get the sine square because, so if taking ensemble of paths from now toward future, then you'd have first power, uh, sine sign to first power. Or from now to the past, you have first power. But if using full full paths, we get the Born rule, we get the, the square because one amplitude goes from the past, second goes from the future. Okay, now, now I can go to the to the violation of the model like of, of, of bell like inequality. So I, I so why people can can try to hand wave about the original bell or, or CHSH. There is this nice Mermis inequality, which is much more difficult to hand wave around, let's say. So 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 it says intuitively tossing three coins at least to give the same. It's a completely obvious dish that principle one can say. And here is here is the here is written as probability of that equal two coins are equal, two coins are equal, two coins are greater or equal than, than one. So here is a derivation. Choosing any any joint probability distribution, we have a prop possibilities. So so this this probability corresponds to, to this for for situations with some or three, and we get something like this. So whatever probability distribution, joint probability distribution you choose, it has to sum at least one, or above if there are non-zero values. So so we have used in this derivation Kolmogorov third axiom, the probability of alternative uh, is sum of probabilities. Instead, if you replace it with the burn rule, you have the square, then here is example of choosing psi, which get the violation to two, 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 three, three tenths. So it's not above one, it's three tenths. So it's much, much lower than, than, than possible. And in Ising model, we can, we can, we can realize it by, by using a sequence of, of three spins and, um, and um, with, with interaction, which forbids this, this which enforces it to two zeros. So forbids uh, three spins up and three spins down. And then as measurement is measuring two out of three spins. And doing so, we should get, uh, we should get this variation to, to three fifths. So it's not, it's, it's, it's in space. So, so we get um, a, a stripe of, of spins and we measure there and, and the, the correlation should be, should be, should validate that this, this Mermin's inequality. So it's not in time as, as, as we would expect for, for, for Nobel, it's, it's in space variation. Okay, so so in time, let me let me go to, to more minutes. So so there are, so there are these a few quantum quantum experiments. There is this Wheeler experiments that 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 the question is um, that we can make the choice between classic and quantum after after it was the here series them 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 the aspects uh, realization that that the question is if it's classical or quantum depends on this this um, spitter if you lift it or not, and and so so then it turns out that that that. So if we leave it, it should be classical. If you if you put it down, it should be quantum. And turns out that, that the photon knew if we put it down or, or up before. So even if the shot was, was made after after the photon goes to this this green speed term. Okay, there is also this this short, short, short algorithm which also kind of uses time 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 symmetry, but I don't have time for that. There is uh, there is this. There are many arguments for time symmetry. Okay, and let, let me finish because my time's time's up. So 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 I so so there is a way to 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 perform field theories, classical and quantum, if we do it with the least action principle with the Feynman path ensemble. So the least action principle is the one action optimized in the Feynman path is Feynman ensemble among them, and in the center is kind of the Boltzmann path ensemble, the MERV I, I have talked talk about. Okay, thank you and sorry for. Uh, that, so. so. You're welcome. <clears throat> okay, so, so the next part, okay, uh, uh, yes. So, so we can, we can, share it. can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. All right, okay. Uh, I have to share a screen first. Okay, I'll share my screen, full screen share. Can you see my screen? Um, yes? Yes, 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 yes. All right, okay, I mean, I'm going to put, uh, this is a slide presentation. Okay, so you still see my screen? Yes. Okay, fine. So I'm going to connect two loopholes, um, which are the contextuality loophole and the correlation uh, loophole, correlation in background fields. Um, and I'm going to show how these two loopholes are related. And it's it's good. I think it's good news because if you close one of the, the two, or you think one of the two is closed, the other one is closed as well. So this simplifies things. Uh, I will be very brief, but I want to just to set the historical uh, line. 
recall how all this started. And I want to recall uh, the paper by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen in 1935, where they wanted to prove that quantum mechanics was not, was not a complete uh, theory. And for that purpose, they proposed an experiment to show that you could overcome the, the principle of uncertainty, which is the, the, the pillar of, of quantum mechanics. So they proposed uh, an experiment with two entangled particles, uh, the first and the second particle going through, a, that you entangled them by letting them go through a double slit. And then you measured, you can measure the position of the first particle, which assuming that uh, is a local measurement, you are not affecting the second particle. And from the fact that these two particles are entangled and you know the difference between their distances, you can compute the distance of the second particle without intervening this particle at all. Let's do this experiment once again, but instead of measuring the position of the first particle, we measure the momentum of the first particle. And again, because we are not affecting the second particle and we know that they are entangled, we can compute the momentum of the second particle. So they said, I can compute the position and the momentum of the second particle uh, without uh, touching the second particle and I have overcome the uncertainty principle. So if I assume that quantum mechanics is complete and then I can overcome the uncertainty principles, I run into a contradiction and they conclude in their paper that quantum mechanics is not complete. And they only have to assume two things, that when you uh, act on one particle, they are sufficiently far away, uh, you do not uh, affect the other locality. And they, they provide a definition of realism, which is here my, my main concern, where, which uh, says that you can uh, something is real if you can measure it without um, disturbing the system. So I'm, uh, it was where you can attack locality or realism in local realism. And I want to attack realism as defined by Einstein. Uh, but I was not the, the first who, who, who attacked uh, their definition of realism uh, because uh, Bohr, uh, Bohr in, in the same year, 1935, only five months later, he found a mistake in his in his uh, reasoning, and what he introduced, uh, apart from the principle of complementarity, which was introduced in this paper, he also introduced the concept. He did not say it explicitly, but he was introducing contextuality here. And what um, Bohr realized is that when you measure the, the position of the first particle, uh, you have to use a, a slit that is attached to the same table. Then the particles goes through the slit, transfer some momentum in terms of electromagnetic radiation, but the, the, you, you can locate the particle because it's fixed. But when you measure the momentum of the first particle, you are doing a different experiment. It's a different context because the, the, the slit cannot be attached to the table, the same table, because you need the particle to transfer the momentum to the, to the slit. And from this momentum transfer, you measure the momentum of the first particle, but you, you know the slit moves and now the particle cannot be localized. This is the uncertainty principle. So there are two experimental contexts. And Bohr is very aware in this paper that you are not measuring something possessed by the particle. It's not uh, that the, pro the property uh, was possessed by the particle before. You are producing through an interaction between the apparatus and the particle, the result of the experiment. So you don't measure, uh, uh, the properties are not real before measurement. They become, you produce them, you create the results through the measurement process. Okay. All right, but then, and I, I, I'm very happy with this, but then 30 years later, um, Bell, he was very inspired by, by the um, hidden variable theory uh, proposed by David Bohm in 1952, which could explain um, the, the quantum theory perfectly, but had the property of being non-local. And then he thought that perhaps he could demonstrate that there is no local theory uh, classical theory that can produce the results underlying theory from which quantum mechanics would be an emergent theory from which uh, you can derive the, the results of quantum mechanics. And so by if you renounce to locality, of course, you are just saying that there is an action in distance. So we have this terrible action in distance coming back, which was uh, put by Newton in the first place with his Newtonian mechanics. And the idea is that when you measure one particle far away, some kilometers away, the other particle suddenly collapses. Okay, you cannot use this perhaps to transform uh, to transmit information, but there is an action distance in quantum mechanics. That's the idea. This has problems with relativity principle. At least it's not easy to think both of them at the same time. 
All right, so very briefly again, the idea, I want to talk about hidden variable theories. Uh, perhaps you do not want to talk about it, but I want to talk because I think that quantum mechanics do, does not represent um, the apparatuses, neither the, the, the electromagnetic background fields. So there are hidden things, of course there are. And, and my point is that you can use these hidden things to, to, uh, to explain them. Um, more stuff. Uh, so the idea of a hidden variable theory is just like the, the metaphor is thermodynamics. Uh, you, Boltzmann showed that uh, you can obtain the results of thermodynamics from averages from the microscopic particles uh, in, the, in, in, in the theory of Newtonian uh, mechanics. So all the thermodynamic properties emerge from the averages by making just uh, averages from the uh, properties of the particles. So here is the same idea. Quantum mechanics is not fundamental. It's an emergent theory. And it's all its predictions in terms of uh, averages and correlations and higher order moments must come from the hidden variables through a statistical averaging. So in principle, it's a very clear uh, idea and, it's, and it deserves attention. So, to, to prove the, his, his theorem, Bell, and, and also his advocates, well, Bell started using a, an experiment a little bit different from uh, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, and it's a, an experiment proposed by Bohm and Aronoff in 1957. And instead of uh, position and momentum, they used the spin, the angular, uh, internal angular momentum of the particles. So the idea is that you have a beam of particles, you have a stenger lach apparatuses with a non-uniform magnetic field, and then the particle interacts with the magnetic field and then it can go up or it can go down. And so the experiment is just, you have a source, you know all this, all of you know the experiment very well. Let's say you have some pi on zero particle, it integrates, and then you have two entangled particles through their spin, they are in an entangled quantum state flying apart each other towards the respective stenger lack apparatuses. You can orientate the stenger lack apparatuses differently, and you can compute the correlations uh, of, the, of the combined product of the spins of, of both particles in quantum mechanics, and you get these uh, famous uh, results. So the idea of, of Bell is that if you try to do this with some classical theory, underlying theory, you cannot explain these correlations. That's the whole idea. No? Okay, I'm going to use the last, uh, the, 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 the version of the theorem, which is the most modern one, which is the one which has least, the least number of assumptions, but there are some assumptions here, and, and I'm going to discuss if these assumptions are good for field theories. And my proposal is that so two of them well, are not uh, completely correct, and you can modify them, but you must make assumptions to derive. The whole idea is that if you want to derive the CHSH bell inequality in field theories, you need to make uh, further assumptions beyond these uh, four. So, well, in principle, we assume that the hidden variables are whatever you want. Fields is the most complicated thing in classical th uh, theories you can think of. Uh, so dynamical fields, if you want. Um, but then there is a function, there exists. Um, a function uh, which is the result of measuring the spin here Alice if you want measures the spin of one particle and this function depends on some uh, hidden uh, data uh, and this uh, hidden data they, they it's always believed that this data correspond to the source and I'm going to show that you cannot only use in field theories data from the source okay you have to put here the fields the background fields all over the initial Cauchy surface so this this property, uh, if you only refer to hidden variables at the source, is, 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 is wrong. I mean, in field theories, you need more information from the background fields to, to, to propagate the, the initial conditions. And also, it is assumed that there exists a probability measure. Again, if you think that this probability measure uh, does not involve the apparatuses, that only involve hidden variables at the source, you are wrong. You cannot obtain all the information from the particles you need, but because the background fields are playing an active role. They, they are contextual fields all the time fueling the sitter by weapon. Well, anyway, these two properties are the properties I'm concerned with. Um, I will assume locality. I don't want to go into non-local stuff. I, I don't believe in action in distance. So basically you can express uh, the measurement of a spin by Alice uh, without saying anything about them, uh, uh, just by specify, uh, specifying the orientation of the apparatus uh, uh, of, of that stenger like apparatus and not the other one. So the both stenger like apparatus, you don't need to, to cross them here in the measurement of the spins. So there is no dependence on B here, no dependence on A here. I assume that that's correct. 
So, okay, the, the, the theorem, the inequality of, CA, of, of cluster, uh, Horn, Shimani, and Holtz, uh, basically is this inequality. You can use two different orientations for each stenger lach apparatus and combine then the correlations to produce this inequality. This can be done as long as you assume this uh, hidden uh, variable integral. And these two statements are uh, implied, uh, each other implies. This was demonstrated in a paper in 1982 by Arthur Fine. He proves that if this holds, this holds. And if this holds, this holds. So this is necessary and sufficient condition. So if one of these two does not hold, then the other does not hold as well. And I want to show that the first one here does not hold unless you make assumptions on background fields. That's my point. Well, not my point, it's, it's Morgan's point. I just connect this to contextuality. So quantum mechanics violates this inequality and it is uh, believed that classical field theories obey this integral so you can, uh, classical field theories cannot uh, violate this inequality. Uh, but I, you have to make further assumptions. Okay, so the first thing, because uh, I'm going to introduce contextuality and, and people usually mix this happens in some papers also of Marian, they, they, they mix times. So I'm, I, you have two different times and you have to connect these times. The first time is the time of measurement, if you want, or the, well, that's the second time, the, the latest time. That's when you measure correlations. Correlations are not measured in the beginning, it's just when the particles arrive at the apparatus. So strictly speaking, um, you, your correlation function must be computed with the probability density at the time of measurement. And the hidden variables appearing there is the particles hidden variables, and also the apparatuses hidden variables because you have the magnetic field of the stenger like apparatuses, but that's at the time of measurement. So what you have is a probability density evolving in a space time, which you have a stochastic process if you want, and, and you have a, a measure on a set of events. And um, moreover, this probability density at the time of measurement is contextual. It depends at the time of measurement on the apparatuses. Because if you change the orientation of one of the two stenger like apparatuses, this probability density is going to change the interaction between the particle and the uh, apparatus is different. All right. So you cannot avoid here in this, uh, at the time of measurement, I insist, the, the dependence in the probability density of the orientation of the apparatuses. So now the question is, can we go back to the source and forget about this dependence? about putting in the probability density this uh, orientation of the apparatuses. And uh, you can if you make certain assumptions. Okay, first I'm going to show that in a Newtonian-like theory, which is what everybody has in mind, I mean, people do, don't worry about fields very, very often. So if you don't worry about fields and you think that properties are coded in the particles, if you really assume that, uh, you can do uh, the inversion. You just have a Newtonian-like theory. The spin is possessed, a property possessed by the particle if you want from the very beginning. Uh, you don't need contextual fields. And in that case, you just need the flow. You have some initial conditions in position of momentum or spin, whatever in the particles of the hidden variables. You evolve them through a... Uh, like in differential geometry with, by a flow, and then you obtain the hidden variables at the time of measurement. So you can undo, you can backward propagate the flow, and you use you make a change of variables in the hidden in the in the hidden variables through this integral, and you obtain uh, the the desired uh, integral correlation with the one which allows you to de derive CHS H bell inequality or well with another assumption bell inequality original bell as well but when you put fields things are different and the and i will show in, in what uh, sense so uh, this is again the integral at the time of measurement this is the fields in some region where the particle rests I mean, you can assume that particles are extended objects, or if you want points, you can assume they are points, but I put some functional integrals because I can assume some very little region where the particle is. And here I have the fields, right at the time of measurement still. And of course, you have a dependence on the orientation at the time of measurement. And now in, in, in partial differential equations, because uh, in, uh, you have to take into account the evolution of the fields, the, the contextual fields. So. If, if, if you want to find out the fields of the particle here, you need to specify at the beginning when you set the source, all the fields in the past causal past light cone 
in the Cauchy surface. Okay, I'm going to use a, I'm going to suppose a linear theory just for simplicity because you can use a Green's function and you have a propagator, but you don't need it. You only need to use Cauchy Kovalevskaya theorem of uniqueness and existence of solutions, and it is guaranteed that if you have this initial data in this past light cone at the beginning, then you can obtain the value of the fields at the time of measurement. Okay. So let's see if we can backward propagate to the source now and what happens. So when you do that, the problem is, okay, forget about the green region. You have Alice. Uh, this is where the particle is measured in, inside the stenger lach apparatus. This is where uh, Bob measures the spin inside if you want the other stenger lach apparatuses. These are the world lines of the particles. This is the source where they are emitted, but you need all the information to obtain the result in the entire uh, causal past cone at time zero where the particles are created at the source. And the problem is that now that the, the, the apparatuses are inside these light cones, okay? So in principle, when you undo and uh, revert the flow to get the initial data, you cannot avoid a dependence on A and B, not for the moment. We will discuss if you can avoid it or not, but uh, in principle, you cannot avoid it because you have the apparatus here, all, all right? Uh, and these fields, it's not just the, the apparatus, it's the fields in between the apparatus and the, and the source. There are fields, background fields, fields fluctuations all over in the entire. So you, so you need these fluctuations. They are traveling uh, through the electro vacuum. Okay. So in which case can you uh, neglect or avoid this dependence? So here is what you need to assume two things. Uh, and these two things are explained in a very amazing, brilliant, I think this is a very brilliant paper. It's not very cited because people in Bell, in Bell world, they don't really care in general about fields as far as I have read. Not, not truly care about fields, all the details of fields. But this guy really cared about it. And he said that there was an enclosed loophole. He called the correlation loopholes. A loophole. What he's saying is if you want to go from this probability um, density all defined all over the the back uh, the back um, uh, past causal past initial data initial hidden field data uh, you need further assumptions so let me be brief and concise this is the past cone the red region of alice this is the past cone of bob in the initial uh, data i'm going to define uh, the intersection where the source is between both uh, initial uh, past light cones, and I'm going to call this sigma C. I'm going to define uh, the region of the past light cone of Alice uh, uh, that does not intersect with the past light cone of Bob as sigma A, and I'm going to define at the, by the same rule this region sigma B, where you have all the initial fields except the intersection with Alice. And you have these three regions, this region uh, for Alice, this region for both, and this region for Bob. So in this case, if you assume, you have to assume uh, two things. I think one of them is quite reasonable. And the other one, it must be proved and it's not easy to prove at all. Uh, you must assume that the probability uh, density, uh, or if you want the fields here, all over the region sigma A are uncorrelated to all the fields in region sigma B. And if you guarantee this, you can separate both. And then uh, if you also assume that the probability density of the where the source is does not depend on A and B, which is very reasonable, I think, because otherwise you would get a super determinism in the original sense of Bell. I will say some more, more words now. If you assume this, if this holds, you can derive the CHS H Bell theorem. But if you don't have uncorrelated fields here and here, or here and here, you have to prove that all over this region and all over the region they are uncorrelated. And you cannot derive the CHS H Bell theorem. And some people would say, well, this is some other kind of super determinism. Uh, in some sense, you could say yes, but but it's not the original one. I'm not saying that the fields of the source are correlated with the orientation of the apparatuses. No, no, the it's not the fields of, of the source. It is the fields outside in this light cone in sigma A and sigma B. And that's different. If you want to call that some kind of revised super determinism, OK, I think it's a misnomer because I'm going to show you that you don't need determinism at all. And if you don't need determinism, it would be quite weird that you need super determinism. But I, I don't like this word anyway. But OK, 
because if you are deterministic, you don't have to worry about super deterministic. But whatever, I understand. I, I would call this conspiracy. That's how how uh, it was called also by Bell and how Morgan calls it. This does not depend on A and B. This I can assume quite good, but that these are uncorrelated, ooh, that's saying too much. It doesn't hold in quantum electrodynamics. And I don't think it holds uh, easily, but you have to prove it experimentally. It's a loophole. And it's connected to the contextual loophole. I've shown that. It's just Green's, Green's faction connecting both of them. Okay. So if you want to assume that you, your apparatuses are dynamical and you set them in flight, last instant choices, and you want to assume randomness, whatever, it's the same story. If you want to put randomness, okay, you put some Langevin, Langevin current here in your, and you get a stochastic partial differential equation. You have a Langevin force and you have yes, a stochastic fields. Yeah, okay, that's, that's fine. But uh, still uh, uh, you have the same, the same problem. And, and the problem is that when you put the apparatus A and the apparatus B, even if you did last instant uh, random choice, uh, all when you compute the correlation integral for these two values, A and B, you are choosing from the initial hidden data in the Cauchy surface, uh, a, a part of the of the whole ensemble of, of the of the sample space, you are selecting, uh, you are restricting your, your original sample space to this situation. So it's going to appear A and B here, and the same problem is gonna, is gonna be here. Uh, so you can use also stochastic field uh, theories. I, I, I don't mind. The mustache of Langevin is bigger than the mustache of aspects. And I can cover also stochastic field theories, it doesn't matter. You have the same problem. You need to guarantee impact. Morgan paper is about random fields, but I don't I don't believe in randomness. i I come from chaos theory, so I think randomness is a redundant concept for me. Anyway, um, how do you close this loophole? Well, <laughs> well, well, in principle, you just have to measure all the background, of the background fluctuations in in this region. Uh, if, if you have photon experimental aspect, I mean, oof, I would see very, very hard to close the loophole because all the background field fluctuations here, you have to measure them somehow and prove that they are uncorrelated to the background field fluctuations. And these regions, you know, photons travel at the speed of light. So it's the fastest you can go. So the, the intersection region is just going to be the photons. So there, this, these fields will be correlated with this one. So I don't think experiments with photons are very good to close the correlation loophole, but I don't know, perhaps some experimentalists has better ideas than I do. But from the from the theoretical diagrams, the space-time diagrams, I cannot tell. Uh, this is a really good setting. I would use instead to try to better close this loophole also, although, I, although you still would have to measure background fluctuations. Elect, uh, fermions, like I showed before, the EPRB experiment, and they would have to be relativistic electrons at half the speed of light above. So this region is maximized. And in this way, you avoid the problem of having correlations between this region and this region. If this is three kilometers away, it would be hard for me to assume that this is correlated the background fluctuations with these. Anyway, if you want to be rigorous, you would have to prove that this isn't correlated with this. So the loophole would persist, although I would be quite satisfied if you proved in this kind of experiment with fermions have the speed of light, the uh, the, the, that, that there are violations of the Bell inequalities, but it's really really hard to measure to measure background fluctuations. There are experiments. I found some beautiful experiments here. There is an experiment uh, to measure background, but you have to use uh, lots of apparatuses, and you are going to distort the background fields quite a lot. I don't know if you put here an, an experiment to measure the the background fields. You are going to destroy entanglement, in my opinion. But I don't know. That that's. Uh, it's not easy to, to close this loophole, or, or, as I see it, at least. So finally, to, to conclude, uh, with I will say a few words on how I see, from a reasonable perspective, what entanglement can be. And, well, I, in other talks, I've shown that how standard electromagnetic objects can uh, have sitter bewegung. I have also shown in other papers that perhaps background fluctuations are also required to sustain this oscillation. It's a very nonlinear oscillation. It is called self-oscillation. And I have derived it from the memory in linear beaker potentials in, in, in classical field theories. So it is very well known in the world of nonlinear dynamics that if you have two nonlinear oscillators and you couple them, and here you have a background field that allows to couple them, they can synchronize. So you have two particles and they can 
at the synchronized uh, uh, in, syn in synchrony. And, it, and if this happens, whenever you measure one, the other can be uh, anti-correlated with the other. This can happen if there is synchronization. So the, why, why do I think that background fields are important? The reason why I want to say this is because if the, if the, if the background fields are totally uncorrelated, it is quite likely that you are, these particles are going to lose their synchrony. And then you are going to produce a decoherence of the entangled state. So my, po my point of view of entanglement is that entanglement is just synchronization. In, it's a nonlinear dynamical phenomenon coming from the oscillation of the particles. And this was already found in clocks by Christian Huygens in the 17th century. Um, and that's the only way I can picture. Of course, perhaps we don't need to picture, but, but I, I still think there is something uh, there. Um, finally, I would like also to say a few words uh, about Sitter Bewegung because I used uh, Maxwell theory to derive self oscillation, but in a more fundamental theory, particles must come from fields. And you know, if you want to have uh, when when the the two particles uh, start at the source, they leave the source and they are uh, their spin, their angular momentum internal must be oscillating very very. Uh, uh, dramatically and it must be because uh, I think the shape even the shape it's not just that particles are extended they shape is evolving because if their shape does not change you cannot get two options up and down spin to get two options you need that the shape of the particle changes if you have a rigid magnet you have if you put on a, a, a field then you have only one stable direction and one that is unstable. But if you get both attractors as possibilities in a dynamical system, that means that the shape of the particle must be changing. So I think the particles are oscillons and that these oscillons uh, are, are producing background radiation. Uh, and and this, uh, well, I, I found this beautiful paper I read uh, a week ago about oscillons and quasi breathers. So perhaps you people are very interested in, in, in soliton models. Perhaps uh, oscillons and quasi breathers can uh, 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 produce this sitter. And I think also it depends on, on background fluctuations anyway. I don't know really how uh, in, in this case, because I don't know if an oscillon can absorb fluctuations from the environment, but there is an interaction with the environment. So my conclusions um, is that quantum mechanics is incomplete. And the reason uh, is that it does not represent contextual electromagnetic fields. Uh, fluctuations and it does not represent the apparatuses. Uh, quantum electrodynamics, which is much better theory than quantum mechanics, um, does represent the, the background fields, but not the apparatuses, so it's still incomplete. And my conclusion, this is uh, Henry Casimir, is that because there are background fluctuations uh, in the context, is that local classical field theories do not comply with the principle of local realism, because they are contextual. The, the, the particles are interacting with their environment. They are not isolated particles traveling in the in nothing in nothingness. They they are, they are going through the vacuum and the vacuum is is alive. So particles are dissipative dynamical structures interacting with their environment. No isolation that was already said by Mark Fleury, and that's my point of view. And that's all that I had to say. And half an hour. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. I, I, quick questions, comments? I'm skeptical, but I, um, that we that with oil reactors you can get violation. But I have I have a, a few comments for Alvaro. First of all, wonderful talk. Then you uh, you, you showed the aspect uh, schematics with just two detectors and claimed there was randomness in there. If you recall. Yeah. In my presentation, I show that technically speaking, they never really have that, uh, you know, in-flight setting of the measure that Bell uh, 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 prescribed. They have a choice on four static measures. So uh, I, I would love to, you know, to hear one, one, in, include that fact in your thinking. You know, the isolation, the, the four measures are there, and I would love to see a mechanism by which, whether contextual, you know, you seem to be thinking a lot about that. What would be the mechanism for these photons since they see the four uh, target? Is it something at the source because they see the four targets? Is it something evolving like a Stern Gerlach where the output is a dynamical interaction? I, I, I don't know. The second thing I want to inject in your thinking, sorry, just, just to put it all in, uh, mm -hmm. is, um, you, you know, in my own experiment, I do remove the synchronization. Uh, you know, it's intermittent. Yes, in that, the, the, no, the one before. 
Um, yes, yes. In, in that analogy, I love that analogy. This is something like that is going on. But I also want to inject into your thinking that in my experiment, I think I proved that it has to be uh, an intermittent, you know, it, my signal is intermittent, so it cannot be an instantaneous or a traveling wave. It has to be something averaged. It has really to, it has to be a, 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 an average field. That, that's it. Okay, okay. Okay, I, I I I must confess I have printed I have printed your paper, but I I have not arrived at it yet. But I, I will read it and I will contact you and tell you about about uh, how I can rethink these ideas in relation to your your experiment. Me encantaría hablarte directamente. Un placer, lo, lo haremos, lo haremos. Palabra. Vale, muy bien. Uh, Alvaro, I wrote some uh, remarks in the in the chat. I I think you misrepresent Bell. And I think you are bringing in a, a non-locality loophole because you're allowing Alice's setting introduced at the very last moment to have immediate influence on, on uh, Bob's outcome. Yeah, yes, that's what I think. But I mean, we can discuss this. Uh, in, in, but certainly I want to say that what you say about Bell's assumptions are definitely wrong. Bell did not assume the kind of things you claim he assumes about lambda. That lambda of Bell may be very, very, very non-local. It may be all over the whole universe. It's the situation of all the fields sometime before the experiment starts. And then of course it can evolve in time. The assumption of Bell, at least the local hidden variables assumption, <laughs> which is the question whether or not it's true, is that the settings A and B can be in inserted at the last moment. Yeah, 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 and that's that, what the experiment. Yeah, but do. but the problem is that you need to. The, what is the the orientation of the apparatus, Richard? It doesn't it, matter. It no, it's it, fields, and you have sorry? to backward propagate those fields. This is the integral, and when you backward propagate those fields, you are selecting, restricting the initial set of hidden data so to a certain symbol. But, 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 no, no, you can. No, no, it's pure statistics. So you are believing in retro causality. No, no, stop, stop. This drawing. No, no, stop, no, stop. No, no, and the fields no, no, are different. No, okay. No, drawing from Aspe is misleading. We do not have, we have dynamical switching, but we do not have dynamical setting. Okay, anyway. and you are wrong, Richard, when you say it is not important the orientation of Wait. the polarizers. The polarizers, of course, it's important. Always, I did not exactly. Say thank you. Important. They're always seen, oh, wait, wait, wait. They're always seen by the source. The polarizers are completely known at all times. Statically, yes, that's not by the, the point. I just, just else is and and okay, the death just, just a few words. So convoluted, I, I but no I, I want to respond. I want to respond, Richard, assuming that he, the, the, the experiment is as he says. So let's assume that he's right and, and they choose it. I, I have assumed that. The point mm. is that when, when you are selecting, I mean, you have to backward propagate to initial conditions and the initial fields here. Okay, if, if you are selecting all the cases where you obtain A and B instead of A prime and B prime, for instance, then you are also making a restriction in the sample space of the initial hidden fields. And this well, is why you cannot, oh, you disagree? So you are telling me, no, okay. because, no, no, the whole sample space is the whole set of fields in, 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 in all the cases. And if you make a selection in this uh, you are space- You not a selection. You are yes because yes no. of course you are because here no, I don't agree it here okay, yes we disagree that's because that's you do not understand you do not understand field theories because when you backward propagate the, the flow of a field theory you are restricting it you are not going to get well, all the you're talking about retro okay. causality. I will say it. No, I will see. I will say it. You, ha, you don't understand field theories. You don't understand field theories. You if you think. Oh, okay. If you think that when you put here, you have not understand the argument because where it's contextuality no, produces. Yes, you. yes. Look, look. If you said here a wrong. prime, a prime, then you are selecting a different sub ensemble of the sample initial space. So you get here a prime no, and b prime. Well, okay. So you are saying that if you get the sample I'm space, saying, you are I'm a statistic. If you say that, no, no, no. Okay, you, you are a statistical man. If, if you are yeah. a statistical man, if the whole sample space of all the fields is restricted. Yeah. You must get something that denotes this restriction, and this is A and B. Yeah, that's and retro causality. You are assuming retro causality. No, it's not retro causality, for God's sake. It's, oh, okay, okay. Whatever. Why not? Whatever. Yeah, so let, let, you can take, take the discussion to the chat. I'm not okay, against okay, okay, retro causality. Field theory, field theory, Richard. Study field theory. 
It's static. It doesn't yeah, come to the future. It's please. static. I, I yeah. study statistics. I teach us yeah. the processes. I tell you she this. Talk some more. Okay, study, 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 study fields, please. Okay, so Robert, no idea about fields, Sarah, of you can continue, continue at, at the end. <laughs> so at the end, there will be a lot of time for discussion. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's okay. I'm sorry. I get excited. Forgive me. Uh, Robert, could you could you uh, share? Uh, could I you stop? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, oh, yes. Sorry. sorry for for the, the delay. <laughs> okay. Uh, get in slideshow mode here. All right. Can you all see that? Yes, 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 yes. All right. Let's use that little thing there. Okay. So I'm going off on a completely different uh, line of thought here. Um, just looking at simple geometry and the actual Bell theorem itself, and I'm not going to talk about experiments at all. So, um, let's see, can you all see that? Because um, I'm kind of blocked here. Um, so, what well, you all know about the EPR paradox, I'll just skip that one. So, uh, the basic problem is that uh, there's this appearance from the experiments uh, of, that it looks like making a measurement on one particle seems to affect the other particle. And so that's why it's called a paradox. Um, and as a lot of you have been saying, that uh, makes it look like physics is non-local. Okay, but I'm gonna give an alternative uh, explanation. Um, and what I want to do is look carefully at uh, Bell's theorem, the way he actually derived it in the first place. So he says you've got this two particle correlation and it's a, a, the sum of the product of the measurement at A and the measurement at B, right? Um, and those are binary, um, plus or minus one. So um, the theoretical, uh, value for this correlation over many experiments is you have some density of states. Uh, then you multiply the two measurements together and you do this integral over the all the different states. And then he looks at the, uh, well, first of all, he says, well, suppose uh, measurement at B is minus measurement at A. This is for spin correlations. Um, he says, uh, look at the difference between these two uh, correlation functions and writes it out. Uh, this is A and B, this is A and C. Um, then he factors out um, the A part. So you get this uh, product of the A and B measurements and then you have one minus the product of the B and C measurements. And then he says, because the maximum is one, uh, you can state this inequality here. Uh, nothing controversial there, I think. Uh, but then this last step is he says uh, that this uh, term here is the correlation between B and C. And it's this last step that I claim is uh, incorrect. And I'll just give you a simple example uh, of why that's incorrect. So uh, suppose you have a spherical surface and one hemisphere is plus one, the other hemisphere is minus one. Uh, and the picture I have, I think I have on the next slide here. So the theta equals zero um, at the top here, and you're measuring theta this way. So that's theta A. And the division of plus and minus is along a, uh, circle where the azimuthal angle phi is constant, could be zero. Um, and in that case, the measurement at angle A uh, for a uh, given azimuthal angle, I call it phi, some people call it phi. And, uh, it's just the, the sine of sine theta A sine phi. Okay, uh, very simple. And then um, the catch here is that 
your density of states, you have to define in terms of the angles. So the uh, solid angle, you can write as uh, magnitude sine theta a uh, d theta a d phi. Um, but notice that you could also, if you're looking at the measurement b, you could define the solid angle as sine theta b uh, d theta b d phi. So there's different ways of defining the solid angle, you know, for determining um, the density of states. Okay, so let's just assume that entanglement account amounts to uh, fixing the azimuthal angle. Um, and then your measurements A and B are equal and opposite. So you've got like basically two copies of this, two copies of the sphere. They go off in different directions. Uh, one of them you measure at angle A, the other you measure at angle B. And the angle, the one you measure at B is inverted for, for whatever reason. Uh, maybe because it's traveling the opposite direction. Okay, so once you've picked your angle A, um, and then you've also picked your angle B, so once you've chosen your angle A, the position of B is completely determined. You just add the difference between those two angles. So um, you can just, you can either pick uh, you can pick any uh, description of the solid angle that you want. You can use theta A for your solid angle, or you can use theta B to define your solid angle. Okay, but uh, once you've done that, so if you say the probability uh, for A is in terms of solid angle A, um, the probability of B given A is is just one because it's it's completely determined from the angle between the two uh, measurement locations. So the joint probability of A and B, again, you can either write it in terms of the solid angle relative to theta A, or you can write it in terms of the solid angle relative to theta B. Either of those is valid. Um, okay. Um, okay, so for equal, solid angle, um, you know, that, that's a definition of density of states, but of course the parameterizations are different. Um, so um, this d theta a and d theta b are in, in general different because they depend on uh, which, which uh, angle you're looking at. So when you get to uh, Bell's theorem and you're looking at these two different uh, correlation um, calculations. Uh, when you get over to this one, so these are all calculated. You can use either theta A or you can use theta B. And this one, you can use theta A or theta C. Uh, but in any case, both of these, you can use theta A. Um, but if you're using theta A here, then you're not matching the density of states with the angles that you're actually measuring. So this last step is not the same as the probability of uh, you know, the joint correlation between B and C, because you can't, you know, neither of these angles corresponds to theta A, which you have to use for both of these. Okay, so this last term is not the same as P of B and C. Okay, and then just to give a little uh, calculation, just to show that this is uh, legit, uh, I said that for my hemisphere, um, the measurement at A, you can write as the sine of sine theta A sine phi. The measurement at B would then be the sine of uh, sine theta B sine phi. And if you work out the correlation, uh, you've got this integral where you're multiplying these two things together and then you're dividing by, you know, essentially the total solid angle uh, to normalize it. And the result, um, when you do that calculation, the result is minus cosine theta AB. Uh, I just did it numerically. Um, you, you get exactly the uh, cosine correlation. Uh, so the same as what you would get for uh, spin measurements. Um, that, of course, leaves open the question of uh, 
what exactly is a spin measurement or what exactly is our photon measurements and I don't have an answer for that but just in terms of the theorem uh, it's very clear that uh, you know which step you know in my view is wrong in the theorem is is calling this thing here p of b and c is not correct um, and oh let's that's just plugging in the numbers there so Okay, so uh, my summary is that Bell's theorem does not apply to rotational systems, which is what, what I just did, because the expression for density of states is different for different angles. And if you look at other non-commuting variables, for example, position and momentum, momentum is essentially the uh, uh, Fourier uh, component. And you know, if you're calculating things in uh, space with the uh, differential volume dx, dy, dz, uh, that's different than calculating things in the Fourier, Fourier domain where you have dkx, dky, dkz. So if, if you're using dx, dy, dz, you can't suddenly plug in a Fourier component and try to calculate something with Fourier components. Uh, you're stuck in either one domain or the other. Um, so <clears throat> um, I'm not... I'm not able to prove this or anything, but it seems to me that this inability to define a single density of states uh, seems to be a general property of non-commuting variables, which are what Bell's theorem uh, addresses, or at least the EPR paradox addresses. Okay, so uh, that's the end of my talk. <laughs> Thank you. So there is a, a lot of time. So the problem is there are some questions, comments, especially from Richard. I, I have a question. I think I made some remarks. I mean, um, Robert, I think you were looking at the, like Bell's very first try and, and things changed a lot since then. And uh, I was very proud that in 2001, I wrote a paper in which I showed how to take care of things changing as time goes by, by using a statistical technique called randomization, which physicists don't seem to know about, but the rest of science does. And I proved a different Bell's theorem. I make a bit stronger assumptions. I make slightly different, sorry, different assumptions. I don't assume a constant probability density of lambda. I assume that Settings are chosen at random again and again. That's the randomness. And I prove a Bell's theorem. And it was used in the experiments in 2015. So I'm, I'm yeah, I mean, this is another example of a, uh, what was it, flogging a dead horse. <laughs> I mean, things have changed. The, the newest experiments are very, very different. And people are still picking holes in Bell's original proposals and, and work. And he saw the holes too. He spent his whole remaining life fixing the problems and, and uh, his theory grew and changed and evolved and got better and better. And that went on after he died as well. And it's still going on today. So that's kind of my summary of what I think to what Mark is saying and, um, and say what that Robert the tech is has evolved, but actually the tech Yes, it can be interesting, but uh, please uh, catch uh, up. Uh, uh, the electro optic modulators are all the same. They still do that. By the way, it's weird that- Yes, so what? Well, so do you never have isolation? No, hold it. I, no, when stop. you do a, an experiment it's with it's neutron, it's I'm it's sorry, it's with it's nitrogen it's vacancy it's defects- out, out. I have run in... these claims by Gregor Weiss. Gregor's thesis- Yes, I know that was 30 years Grenoble. ago. Gregor is still involved with the modern experiments. I know I'm still involved it's with still him. the same components. It's still the same. They design. still have some of the same components and some we of the experiments do not, are getting to this day, rather set, different. Stop, stop, Richard. We do not to this day set the settings of the polarizer. That's just not true. Stop saying that. I, I'm not saying we that do you not do. do a real Bell test. Experiments with We're not doing a real Bell test. Bell wanted us to set the settings in flight. We don't have the tech to do that. Stop saying the contrary. We don't do the experiments the same way at all now. The photons the now go from the Alice time. and Bob oh, to God. Charlie. It's the same components, Richard. The components no, haven't changed. No, sir. No, no, it isn't. No, sir. No, sir. I do the experiment. No, sir. No, sir. When you measure the spin of an electron 
Oh, in a nice just, in Vegas. Just, I, I just don't I mean, if I diamonds, papers, you are not doing the same thing. And diamonds on top of photons. I don't know what the heck is going on. I don't. I well, don't I think try. you should have a look. I have had a look. I don't understand these papers. I don't try to understand these papers. They're too much. I, I'm well, not a professional. Not. I'm here to but understand. Even I can understand them a bit. Well, I try. Well, you say that, but anybody who claims no. well, I can understand. Mechanics does not understand. I can understand the scheme of the experiment, and it is totally different. From no, 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 no. The photonic experiments use exactly the same EOM component. They use some of the same components. Oh, no, exactly. Look at the totally schematics. Different. I put it on my slide. Look at the schematics of the Malta experiment uh, uh, recently. Look, I mean, it's all of the which same experiment? EOM. It's the which, same EOM, Richard. Which experiment? The, the hey one guys. with the submarine fiber. Submarine guys, fiber. can I ask Richard a question? I, I think you should have a look at the latest Munich experiments. Oh, God. Whatever. Or uh, Robert, I mean, can I ask Robert a question? Sure. This was, this was, this was his talk. I'm, I'm curious. Um, um, going, going, but going back uh, to the actual original theorem, I think that Richard's point is quite relevant, but the thing that I'm interested in is that your overall point seems to be that, and I'm, I may not understand, but um, it seems to be relevant to the question that I asked originally, which has to do with probabilistic compatibility. Um, and it seems to be that what you're saying is that um, you can't collect all of these correlations in a single density function. Um, uh, and I may be wrong. And, 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 um, and that's what I'm curious about because the thing that I find interesting about probabilistic incompatibility is that it seems to have been discovered independently by many people. And if that's the case here, it's another instance of that. And then I think that you would be interested in the literature on that subject if you don't know it. Um, yeah, actually, uh, I probably would be interested. But um, yeah, this is just a basic, um, how do you say, uh, observation that you know, when you when you choose a density of states, which Bell does in his original theorem, um, you have to describe that mathematically somehow. And when you do that, you pick, in this case, some parameterization. And once you pick that parameterization, you have to stick with those variables. And in, if you pick theta A, you can't then use that when you're not using the angle theta A, basically. Um, yeah, it seems it seems similar, and I have to dig into it a little bit more to really understand. Um, but it it does seem similar, so I can try to send you some of these papers, um, and then that would be really cool if, if if this is just another case of of another person independently discovering this same idea that that has happened has happened multiple times. Okay, yeah, I mean it's a very simple example. You know this uh, this sphere with the uh, two measurements on it. It's a very simple example, um, and to me, I think it gets to the heart of Bell's theorem. Although, like I said, I have no idea how that relates to actual um, experiments. Yeah, and as Richard says, there are lots of different versions now, um, and so it will be interesting to to try to distill this. Um, and, and see if it applies to the later, uh, the later theorems, the later versions of things. Yeah, I think um, there, there may also be some connection with uh, what Jarek was talking about with the Born rule. Um, again, you have to look at what are the probability, probability densities that are associated with uh, the variables that you're measuring. <laughs> but I will add that um, I think it's crucial that this applies to non-commuting variables. Um, you know, 
you wouldn't have the same problem, I think, if the variables commuted. So. I mean, since thank you very much. Should we move on to the next speaker then, Jim? Yes, yes. But another three minutes, so, so we can we can sure have some discussion. Or, I don't know. So, or we can start that here as you want. All right, I'll start. Uh, And move on then. Okay, let me uh, present. Oh, and uh, I should have pra practiced this um, ahead of time. Um, I need to allow my app to share. This is uh, uh, Anybody know on an Apple how to allow my system to share? I always get caught with that. I go to present and I can't do it. Um, or I mean, I, I, that's Apple ever. It says, as I try to share, I'll need Which this. Which app is it? Maybe I can share. Google it while you try. Yeah, or Which ask ChatGPT. GP, I'm on a Mac. Uh and I'm, I'm on Zoom. Um, it looks like I'm on the app of Zoom. And I went to hit share. And it told me I picked what I want. And it said, try it one more time, share sound, doesn't really matter. Optimize for video clip might be good because I've got a visual demo. Open system preferences go to security, privacy, and grant access. So system privacy, grant access. How do I do that? Uh, looks like I need to find Zoom. I apologize for this. Try to talk while we're doing this. Um, why? Okay, Zoom, here it is. I need, I, I got it. I'm five seconds away. We started early, so you have extra time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, I think I can zoom now. I believe that it's going to work. Yes, and I'm a, I'm a computer programmer. I should be better at this stuff, but uh, embarrassing. I just presented to my whole company. First time CEO saw me and my computer locked up and I'm like, oh, this is great. You probably think I'm incompetent. All right. Um, I, first of all, I, 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 I apologize a lot of, I tried to listen, but I also wanted to do a good presentation. I put together pieces of this while this was on. This part I just put together. I've been working for quite a long time building the rest of the stuff though. And just as a quick preview, um, this is what I'm gonna show you. Something that Richard Gill spent some time looking at and saying, add this, add some seeded generators out to the output and yeah, really appreciate his help. And then like, okay, Prove to me that these particles are not communicating with each other. I'm like, it's in the JavaScript. And, and Jill said, I don't read JavaScript. So um, we're, let me show you what we got though. Um, but appreciate very much everything. And, and the, the names I saw here, just uh, some of these people I've read in these magazines, I'm like, wow, and Bush on his, yeah, amazing. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Chantel, for putting this together. Incredible. I love working there. Just discovered her blog. It's really cool. So wh why does a computer scientist something interesting? I beat the hell out of this data and tried to figure out what's going on. Because early in my career, you know, as a high school student, I learned relativity and it, this makes sense. And I started, you know, I came up with a, what do you call it? A Gedenken something where it's like, okay, some questions like, does the universe, I, I have an idea about, uh, you know, is, is there an, a universal I don't want to go off topic, but is there a reference frame through your rotation that is universal? And does that work with relativity? Apparently it does, but I came up with the same thing that uh, I'll mention something, but there was a, a Isaac Newton had this idea of rotating buckets. I'd come up with the same idea. It's like, oh, he already did that. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so I created a little site where I've got you know some of these ideas. But the biggest thing is when I found out EPR is supposed to be wrong, I said, no way. Um, this is, the, it, it offends my, my senses of, you know, does this really work? So I had to prove it to myself. I had to write a computer program and long story short, found out it's really easy to violate uh, Bell's inequalities. If you're writing a test, you're getting a violation. I don't believe it. I, it's like, there are so many ways that you can, it's just like, it says violated. 
because the computer and and I is the math right? I heard people saying it wasn't. So I proved it, and I know the math is right because I I can simulate exactly what's happening. This is the quantum theory where it has no properties, hits something, and the math comes out. I'm going to put this in fast mode. It's slow so you can see it, but it just everything they said it was supposed to do. Um, it, it's it's you know two point eight. It comes right there, and and I a lot of the math I was like, oh, this is probably a cosine thing, and then later. Bertelman socks. Thank you, Gil. It's like, oh yeah, this is something I can understand. And, and, um, and then I went back and, and was with these guys, what's going on? What sort of ways can it be faked? And as I understood, and I've got a, uh, I did early on, the main thing I'm focused on is control tests and saying, why do we want to, to do control tests? What's the argument for that? Oh, that's, uh, so over here on my actual test, here we go. So here, uh, this is a paper on it. And I started seeing these patterns and was like, okay, uh, where does it, where does it have to, and it mostly started with loss, but later rotation, what particles cause violations, what don't, and found out, okay, when the particle hits the deflector, and I'm thinking in the terms of, you know, classical particles, these have properties, so, because that's my mindset. So, okay, if it is classical, by the time it hits the particle, if it's exactly aligned or, or opposed that part to, to the deflector and then it goes and gets hit, wow, there's a strong violation. So either by losing ones that aren't or by rotating things to match it, we get the strong violation. So like, and, we, and then Chantal Ross said, wow, that looks like Mollus Law. And you know what? Um, when you go through a deflector, it gets rid of, you get lost on just the ones that are, are not well aligned with that deflector. It's like, wow, it's inherently flawed. And so what do we do? Okay, sorry, come up with ideas. But the main thing we came up with is we can actually do control tests and find out if there's inherent flaws, you know, simple ones, not exotic loopholes, but simple things. We can say, hey, I can make this experiment and then, and, and like, okay, are we really doing this right? Are we thinking right? Chantel, literally yesterday, asked ChatGPT and got the answer back from ChatGPT and it said, oh yeah, that's been proposed. This, here's evidence and, and here's how to do a control test for negative, for positive. You can show that your experiment is capable of violating and capable of not violating with control tests. So without going, maybe I'll just jump to that because that's where I've been spending my time. I was going to go back and add more and, and I'll show you a little bit on, on the, uh, this presentation put over, but you know, I'll show you a little bit with this, this diagram and some of the stuff Gil said is, okay, give me seated you know, advanced random numbers so that I can recreate it and uh, let me dump the data, this export button and it dumps it out. But the main thing is I have this one and I'm gonna rename these, it, it, Real Perfect's gonna be called Classic Model. Um, and what it does is it just models what classic you do and make this slow so you can see it. Um, so it just it just does what, what Einstein said it would do. These particles already have polarizations, polarizations, they hit the deflectors and they go one way or another. And we get all, you know, and I speed this up and let us see what the actual numbers are. And, you know, you'll see, yeah, it's not violating. I guess like a 1.4 or something. There's no violation. We added some Eberhardt and uh, I think some of my Eberhardt was cracked. Some need some work, but, and another mode I was going to do is, which I haven't done yet. These, and, and then we have ones like we can simulate, you know, violations with loss. And the other one that I need to add is where you do the exact same as loss, only just rotate the, the polarization so that it gets the same numbers and you will get the same. It'll, it'll equivalently end up with, um, depending on how much you rotate it, 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 you completely rotate it to exactly violate, you're gonna get the 2.4. If you do just partial violations like quarter plates where you can, you can change uh, pol uh, polarizations without loss, um, you, you know, then you'd get some, something in between. Um, so, so I'm coming back to that and I'll update my papers, but basically, so the main thing is, you know, it's like everybody, there's always a loophole, no loophole, everybody tries new experiments. There's people like uh, Mark Payne who, who helped me understand this early and said he looked at the data in detail and found, you know, possible issues, but I don't want to have to do all that work. Can we just, you know, design control tests and say, let the experimenters do a chat GPT. That's this great API. If you haven't seen it, it does not repeat what's on the web. It learns the web, for, learns concepts, and returns those concepts back to you. And it is absolutely amazing. So literally, I can put my code into it and say, I'm getting this weird error. What's going on? And it'll say, oh, it looks like you messed this part up and it'll rewrite it for you. Unbelievable. The singularity is coming, people. All right. So here's the control test. And I would hope to eventually get this 
I've been wearing the small group for a few weeks now. I uh, haven't bothered Gil with it yet because I want to get it clean before I waste your time. But um, <laughs> but uh, we think we're getting close. And I especially like when I got that feedback from chat GPT that said, oh, yeah, and it was so close, but so much more clear than what I did. So I, I, um, I, this is kind of what I wrote. Um, to, in, there was a great movie called Fargo. How do you know? So a nice quote. So, so with the computer simulations, I learned a lot of stuff, figured out how, how easy it is to violate stuff and how am I doing that time? I'm only five minutes in. Wow, yeah, I thought I was running out of time. Okay, so here's the criteria. It's basically, you got an, uh, an experiment, it's possible to fake a violation to, to for, and it's possible to not have a violation if, if you so so accept that part that you can any experiment if you just before the experiment starts you don't touch the experiment you don't change but just at the emitter if you you have three ways to do it one the standard standard experiment you admit you, you admit particles all you know is that they're entangled um, but then you can also say for a control test i can say at the emitter I'm going to let you have full knowledge of the application actually in the violating mode of, you know if you want to do quantum I'm going to let you pre-correlate it just so I can prove that, hey, I can violate. This is a violate. And, and this is a test that's only needed if you want to prove Einstein, which is good. So if you if you want to prove uh, quantum, you need a much simpler test. All you have to do is, is your test violates. That happens all the time. You know it can violate. But do a control test that says, prove this possible, not violate. Show me that you're not rotating those angles or doing something with your know, waves or something so that when it hits the deflector, it's already biased to give me the answer that you're looking for. So the way to do that, if your test is truly unbiased and maybe start with a simple test, you should be able to take at the beginning, take particles, pick random numbers, nothing fancy, but know what they are, you know, set a polarizer and say, everything come out of here. I know it's that polarity. So create these orthogonal or anti-parallel particles, send them out. And if your test is on bias, it's gonna get, it's gonna not violate Bell. If your test is biased, it's still gonna violate. And somebody has gotta be able to, to say, wow, something's going on somewhere in my experiment that's causing a false violation. So, so I wrote some of these rules up and it looks, uh, you know, we'll do some more work with this, the new AI. If you haven't tried it yet, actually, unbelievable. You can literally say things like, and I did this. In, in, in this last conversation with you above, you had a formula. It's got some pretty advanced um, physics symbols and, and multivariable calculus. Can you, you know, can you write that in Python? And it did. It was amazing. So um, it's like, that's the language I understand. Um, or JavaScript or whatever. So anyway, um, that was really quick. This went faster than I thought and better than I thought. Maybe I'll go through the top part real quick. This is, um, so my background is not like some years, a computer science guy, I was at ROTC, spent some time in Germany. I recently started the process of applying for a master's um, and, in, and focusing on AI. Um, in the process started that, my daughter's at Lawrence University doing multivariable calculus and as her teachers saying, you should be a math professor. So I'm super proud of her. And uh, she may be helping me with some of this stuff. And ChatGPT is my friend, just got the, started paying for the, the paid version just because uh, uh, it's only 20 bucks and I'll maybe go back to the free one. But anyway, study the book on relativity is an infield thing. Um, I mentioned that Isaac Newton, I thought that was pretty cool. I, I love this idea because basically the idea is uh, it, you prove that there is an absolute rotation in space with his experiment. Read about it. It's like there's there can only be one. If 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 he spins buckets and they well, like this is like I won't go into that. another subject, but it's it's pretty cool. Um, and I've got this little site kind of like the Chantel does. Some of these over the years, and this was three years going into this experiment, and three years. But anyway, I, I, some of these ideas I had, and I read stuff, and it's like oh, this is so neat. Um, okay, experimental slides went over that. Yeah, this is most of it. Um, I guess I don't, I don't really, I can go to questions now. What do you guys want to see? I'm done. Well, thank you very much. I love it because that's exactly, <laughs> yes, yes. I feel like you, you know, they're all one, 
you ex you understand one experiment, and I you know I actually have the data and I simulate it. Now there's a new experiment. It's like come come on, I have to read this again, ask for the data, write simulation. It's like it never ends, right? <laughs> I mean maybe like you Richard, you understand all of them, but it's really hard to keep up with all these experiments. So I really love the idea of control experiments. Just just doing a control that proves that there's no bias because there are so many parts involved, so many steps involved. I mean, you know, it turns out years later, we find some some issue with the experiment. It's like, you know, we wasted a lot of time. So I, I would love that. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. So are any any uh, any other opinions on this topic about controlled experiments? Um, can I just ask a question to James? James, can you go to the beginning of your paper where you had your simulation running, please? Where you yes. Um, yes that, so, yeah, that one there. Now, if we look at your uh, first table there, where it says E1, um, A or A uh, prime and B or B prime, and you've got zero and 22.5 degrees, you know, that is all okay. If I read the Friedman PhD thesis on how they did the first uh, uh, experiment, sorry, I see that I'm... <laughs> I'm, I I'm really ghosting them. <laughs> My apologies. Let me uh, switch this <laughs> off. <laughs> um, um, basically, um, where do I take off this background? Anyway, uh, let's just keep me ghosting there. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, basically, your summation should be. For uh, your summation should be over, instead of naught degrees, it should be alpha plus naught degrees and alpha plus 22.5 degrees. And that alpha should again be a random uh, angle between uh, zero and two pi. Uh, do you do that? Um, I'm struggling to even keep up with you. And I did this three years ago. I think Chantel helped me with some of this stuff. Um, the main thing I'm just using with this is showing that it's easy to violate. Um, I would love to make this better. Uh, um, I'm sure it's way out of date, but ju just the kind of concept. What I'm kind of focusing on more now is just the, the control test. Can I just you know get what's a good control test set up and let people do that? And this is just a good demo, but I would like this to be accurate. I think I need to fix one of the modes for the the um, the, the Eberhardt stuff. But um, yeah, basically what is I can explain to you in general what I remember from three years ago. Um, so at this point, you can see the particles going out. That's you know, I have no idea oh, okay. what they the are. Okay, the particles are pre-polarized up or down. No, no, not not in this mode. Right now, we're simulating quantum. So when this leaves, and this is not a control test. This is simulating quantum. So this is this is very different. Um, so what this is doing is trying to say, okay, if I'm a computer and I'm going to follow quantum mechanics, I'm going to do what quantum mechanics says. What should happen? Okay, so I start particles, if, and, and I'll freeze that again when they start coming out. So I emit particles. They have no variables. I literally have variables to say, what's my spin? They're empty right now. So what happens then is when they hit the deflector, it's going to adopt that, um, either, either that, you know, it's going to randomly adopt either uh, a parallel or um, orthogonal, um, one of the two. And then when it does, it's a, its parent particle over here is going to be just the opposite of this particle. Oh, has okay, no fine. relation to this yeah. polarizers. So really, whatever one hits first, that one becomes polarized, talks to the other one and says, oh, be opposite of me. And then it hits this polarity. And then the math just works out. So it's, so it's basically literally simulating quantum. When you do a control test, that's when you have to say, oh, well, um, you, you know, you're going to have to have really simple an experiment where I do know what these polarizers are going to be. And I'm also going to have to say, you know, if my experiment has like quarter plates and is rotating, you know, if we go back to the, um, to a control test is going to use um, classical particles. It, you know, it, it, all this sounds really um, counterintuitive, but if you read it, it's like, so the, the control test, I need to fake just to show that I'm a capable of, and this is a control test, it's only gonna need by the ERP people. But if I'm going to um, fake a violation, then I've got to pre-polarize these exactly author, author, oh, 90 oh, degrees or parallel with, with one of the deflectors, you know, one of them, and then that's opposite the other. Um, so that's that test. But I don't think people are gonna even need to do that because most people are gonna say, you know what? I just wanna prove that my experiment that already, violates 
can, can, is also capable of non-violating. In that case, you do what I'm doing here. This is actually this test, really simple. You just emit particles, pick a random uh, polarization, make the other one orthogonal or anti-parallel, know what it is because you set some polarizer, let it through the test. So these just keep ranging randomly and you should not violate like this one won't. So, so I think that makes it pretty applicable to a lot of tests that already violate. You run this easy test and it's like, oh, wow, this one's violating too. Why is this violating? So if you're getting numbers, let me go back to fast mode, um, yep, that are that violating, is, I got to ask why. Yeah, but you, that is, it's violating because you already set it uh, to those, um, uh, uh, to those specific um, uh, angles. And, I'm then, and it, then Mahler's law comes in. And then, uh, you know, so that is basically a control test would be just two random particles with random yes. um, uh, polarization. Now, yes. Can you do that? With yes, control? yes. Well, that I, I, I'm not sure if I understood exactly what you said, but I heard the control test. So this is literally a control test. You do what I'm doing here for real. So if you have a regular, you know, quantum test you've already built, it violates. Now you want to control test it. All you need to do is create a different emitter or, or put a little polarizer that constantly randomly flips between the, the emitter and the start of the experiment. So, and, and just, just randomly, and I'll just put this back on slow and slow, just randomly emit them. Now what, and chat GBT confirms to us is these should not violate. If you do that, you shouldn't get a violation. So suddenly before when you were running it and you didn't know when you didn't pre-polarize, they violate. Now that I pre-polarize it, very similar to what, what I heard the uh, first speaker, Mark, talk about, uh, he put these quarter plates in and stopped violating. Um, so that's interesting. I, I need to get that in my head. But um, if that's actually what, um, I'm losing my train of thought, but um, the, I'm going to stop talking because I lost my train of thought. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um... Is this available online somewhere? Then I can explain. Yes, it is. I, I put, understand it. Let me put a link there. And, and granted, this is three years old and I haven't updated it, but it just runs in a browser. You just go to the page and it just runs. Um, mm -hmm. Let me give you the. Uh, this is my website that someday will be hooked to Chat GPT, hopefully sooner rather than later. I guess the point is, you know, there are these Beldenaris like I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm skeptical. I'm not a denier. I'm just skeptical of these complex experiments, you know, and, you know, is there really no bias and so on. So with a control experiment, you could rule that out. So you run it, ideally, even blind, in a sense that the experimenter wouldn't know in which mode it's running. Is it now using the entangled photons or not? That would be perfect. Like, like you do uh, when you do a medical, you know, uh, tests for new medications you do a double blind studies right that would be perfect so then and if you still get the violation there only when you have entangled photons that would be really a strong a proof in my opinion because then you rule out all the, the bias basically <clears throat> wrong one delete so if somebody um, claims that, that he, he can violate inequality, I suggest trying with these Mermins, tossing three coins, at least two are the same. How to violate it? So it's completely crazy, but, but, but you can do it. Quantum, quantum for Mermins allows for that. Isaac model also allows for that. So, yeah, the so, model allows it, but you know, the experiments are there to prove it, right? So now the original, we all, I think we all agree that the original CHSH experiments, they were flawed, right? But they people didn't know it at that time. It sounds like when I read Bert Bertelsmann socks, it sounds like they thought that was a good at that point time. They thought it was a good experiment. But later we find out, you know what? We can actually violate it because of this detection loophole. So if if they had done a control experiment back then, maybe we never had this discussion, right? So and maybe now with these modern experiments, they sound really good to me. Like I just read the one that um, Richard advertised, I think device independent quantum key distribution system. That sounds really great actually, but it takes a while for me to understand it. And who knows, maybe there's some issue in there. I, I haven't, you know, I don't understand yet. So I wish they would do control experiments. Then it would be much easier, I think, to believe these experiments. <laughs> uh, Chantal, already in 1970, we knew about the detection loophole and Paul yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. figured that out. 
Now, uh, when Aspect did his experiment, he invoked the, uh, what you call it, the no enhancement hypothesis, which is a physical assumption that the missingness of photons is not connected to the settings. And th that was the basis on which he concluded that he'd found something exciting. And this was known back then too. I mean, I, and I think probably lots of people didn't, didn't know all these subtleties, but all these things have been known for a very long time. Uh, nowadays we have, have experiments which do not have a detection loophole, I believe. And uh, these are the, uh, the Munich and the uh, Delft uh, kind. Uh, they are subtle and they are more complex because they are three party Bell experiments with three people with, with <laughs> doing measurements on, on two pairs of particles. So that's four particles, two of which are interfering at Charlie's place and being measured, getting one of four different outcomes. And Alice and Bob all the time are busy measuring their particles at their places, not knowing what Charlie is seeing. And I'm a little bit concerned about how well those three measurement stations are all separated from one another, because in a number of the most recent publications, you see that Charlie and Bob are basically sitting in the same lab, and I'm not quite sure if that's okay. So uh, I'm all for people being skeptical and being very skeptical, but I think they should look at the more recent experiments where people have done their best to take care of everything which we knew was wrong in the past. And, and uh, yeah. That's, that's just my opinion. So, do you think it would be hard thing. to do a control experiment? I mean, it would be possible, or, or what kind would you recommend if you? Well, don't don't ask me. Ask ask the experimenters. The problem is going to be to convince them to do an experiment which they think is a waste of time. <laughs> the the beauty of this thing, I think, is that um, the it looks to me like the 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 clear non violation should be an, an easy test. But what I look at is um, the difference between Hubble and Webb. Um, Webb tested the heck out of everything. No matter how sure they were, they tested it and they tested it again and tested it over. Hubble said, we are so good at the math, at least the management did. It's like, we, we know this will work, send it up. Didn't work. They didn't account for a bolt in a test. You know, it's, um, I, I think this stuff's so complicated. As a programmer, I've learned to test everything. I just learned, there's just so much going on. It almost looks like it's non-deterministic when I know it is deterministic. So. That's my, 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 my take. I would love to see somebody uh, do an experiment and, and uh, try some control tests. <coughs> you know, maybe Mark. Gary, uh, is it possible for me to ask a question to Mark? Because I, I think I didn't complete my question with Mark. Yes, I'm sorry. And I don't know if Mark no, is this. here. If Mark is here to answer, I will get. So, so can I share my screen? Hey, <laughs> nice to see you. Can I share my screen for a moment? Sure. Because I think, you know, it's better when there is a picture because, so this one here is a paper by many of you may be familiar, many not, but this is a paper published by Quiet and others with Seilinger, yeah? And also you have Yang Hoshi and other people there. Okay, so there, so if you if you need me to to wait for a moment, you can read. I will wait. But um, did uh, Verbus right. give that to you? That's the uh, no no no. This I yeah. found. This I found in in the internet when I started my experience with um, at the lab in Oakland University, and you know, and uh, and so this uh, particular um, experiment is the baseline we replicated to then tweak stuff to get into the things that um you know that are questionable about um let's I, I would call it correlations instead of entanglement okay so so i wanted to see that and i wanted to see the you know the effects of the phase and that so this is a spontaneous parametric down down conversion type two all right so these are the two cones and here in the intersection of the two cones which we photograph too you have this state generally speaking depending on how you prepare that state with this angle here, you will have a side plus or minus. And if you put a half wave plate in the middle, you'll have a phi and minus plus. You will shift that state to that state. And this is the diagram, which is pretty clear. 
And this is what we reproduced. And we reproduced these results with a little bit better precision even. So, so I may not have understood how you manipulated your half wave plate uh, or your quarter wave plate, but in this setting in particular, I guarantee you that these violations are obtained. We replicated that. And I'm actually running now one experiment remotely from 300, you know, like 300 kilometers away from the lab. So, and, and, and so this is what I mean, yeah? Now, my question mark here, it's a very important one because these guys talk about the quarter wave plate um, in here. Let me, okay, so let's see. Here. So they talk about the quarter wave plate here and they say using an additional bifringent phase shifter, slightly rotating the down conversion, the value of alpha can be set as desired to the value zero or pi. Somewhat surprisingly, a net shift of pi may be obtained by 90 degree rotation of the quarter wave plate. That statement set my alarm bells. So I thought, well, what is this phase shift? And then I've been talking with a physicist in Salerno, Giuseppe Vitiello, who is a really good physicist in condensed matter physics. And he has proposed in that in that um, in that chamber where you know or table where where the experiment of down conversion is performed that you can have maybe a condensate which could explain the correlations without this spooky uh, uh, distance interpretation. And then hearing your talk, I really and I've I've read your paper some years ago because you sent them uh, or Paul sent them to me, but I think it was you. And I really enjoy the fact that you were trying to explain the correlations without getting into the Copenhagen interpretation. And so for me, that was very interesting and it still is. So I am working to show that um, regardless of how you conceptualize that hidden variables or condensates or whatever, um, we cannot equate entanglement with correlations and we can show that with this kind of experiments, which they didn't show here. They just they just tested the correlations of four four bail states, the four of them. So we reproduce that and we show some other things with the shift. Now, with the paper you wrote with Paul Werbels, and it's in ResearchGate, as far as I saw it last time, you played with the phase shift of a quarter wave plate. Okay, and, and that was significant because your oscillations changed. They were attenuated when you put a very slight angle on the quarter wave plate, which is not usually used. Well, I've done a whole spectrum of that. And I think there is a lot to learn from that. And I acknowledge that, I acknowledge your work in that paper because that was kind of a pioneering work with Paul Werbos on how to play with the quarter wave plate to shift the whole, you know, the whole understanding of what's going on in there. And on top of that, you, you know, he probably brought the Markov random fields and other kind of ways of, you know, density matrix to, to, to understand how to deal with noise. Well, we reduce the noise and, and, and we, don't, we don't use uh, actually density matrix, even though we could, but we use the quantum mechanics formalism to show that these phase shifts are not necessarily entanglement. They are correlations, yes. And you can, you can shift the correlations and restore them after measurement. You can restore them on the go. You can, you know, you can do so many things in there. And that's what I'm trying to, at the moment, organize to publish, because I don't, I don't like, you know, I, I just dislike that. I, I want to question the field. I just want to see what's really going on there. And I think that's maybe that's maybe where I'm going from. Shift the discussion to, to the end, and then we should now start start with the next next uh, talk. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, now you I understand my the... point, Mark. Yeah. 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 I, I got you. Uh, can you just one second go back to the top of that of that? Can I uh, can I just interrupt a minute? Can we have this discussion when we finish? Yes. 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 yes absolutely. Let me just take that. The discussion to the, to the... That's good. Thank you. I'll say. Yes. Post the paper, please, in the, in the chat. Yeah, sure.
Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just going to finish the formal talks and then people can discuss as they like, I guess. Um, I'm not going to show any slides, by the way, so uh, I'm just going to talk. And uh, just to give you some background about myself, I'm a professor of physics at Oxford. Um, I did my PhD in, uh, in general relativity and quantum gravity. Um, I spent most of my career working on nonlinear dynamics uh, relating to climate change. And uh, actually, I've just written a book. It's called The Primacy of Doubt. Uh, it's about the science of uncertainty. And it's almost certainly the only book that includes chapters on quantum foundations and climate change. So if you want, uh, let's say, an unusual perspective, uh, do buy it. Um, I've been writing papers on super determinism and nonlinear dynamics in the context of Bell's theorem since 1995. I think I possibly predate uh, Gerard Tohoft in this area, um, but it's kind of been a sideline of mine. It hasn't been my main activity, but it's something I feel uh, as strongly about, and I, I feel as strongly that it's an area that's been misinterpreted uh, over the years, um, and that's what I want to talk about. And in fact, my, you know, the, the, I came into this seminar, this current one, rather late, and. Um, Sort of the reason I I did I did it was I I was um, I was sitting uh, at, you know as one does perhaps these days in the evening with nothing much to do and you know twenty years ago you just switch on the TV uh, but now you just kind of randomly go through YouTube videos and I came across um, an interview of Tim Maudlin by a guy called Kurt Jamungal um, who I who I don't really know but anyway. Uh, and Tim was um, giving a uh, an exposition about why superdeterminism uh, was completely ridiculous. It was complete nonsense. Uh, nobody who kind of counts themselves as a scientist um, should even think about it. It's not scientific. Uh, it's you know any you, the, almost you know the worst possible um, thing and. You know, he he brought up uh, the example which people probably have heard before, um, of uh, a, a, a drug trial. Or this was actually a case of uh, 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 of uh, uh, I think the example he had was was splitting a group of of rats, R A T S rats, into two groups uh, with a randomizer, some random number generator. And one group gets put into a, a chamber which, with a lot of smoke, and the other group doesn't. And uh, you know, you find sometime later that the guy, the gr the group of rats that have been put into the chamber with smoke uh, get uh, lung cancer, and the the ones that don't don't. So the question is, can you deduce uh, that that smoke causes lung cancer? And Tim's point was that, well, if you believed in super determinism. Uh, then you would believe that there was some weird, there could be some weird correlation uh, between the, the the rats, the properties, the sort of genetic properties of the rats uh, and the number generator, the random number generator, which somehow kind of invalidated the, the obvious conclusion that the smoke caused cancer. So he was kind of making the point that if you believe in super determinism, you're kind of the whole scientific method goes out the window and you can't do science, you can't do anything. And that kind of, I mean, that, that sort of thing, I've heard that argument many times. It always annoys me because I think it's a misinterpretation of super determinism. But what really, um, got got me going in this particular video was a particular comment that Tim made, which was that he said that anyone who believes in super determinism should read John Bell's paper, Free Variables uh, and Local Causality. Um, so it's in, it's in the famous speakable and unspeakable collection. It's a paper that Bell published in 1977, and it's called Free variables and local causality. And Tim, Tim Maudlin was basically saying, you know, anybody that would dare to propose super determinism as a solution uh, should read that paper first, and he would get he or she would get disabused of that um, that idea. So, 
this is this struck me as bizarre because I have read this paper, I would say, hundreds of times over the last um, whatever thirty odd years that I've been kind of uh, proposing this notion. So what I want to do in this talk is actually go through what this damn paper says. So we're, we're all on board with this because I think people quote Bell sometimes and and sort of, you know, it's a bit like the Bible, you know, they quote things that actually don't really exist in the Bible. So let's let's be clear about what he says. So Bell and actually, this is something where Tim, Tim Maudlin said as well, that the notion of free will here is a little bit of a red herring. And that's kind of a point that Bell also wanted to draw out in the paper. And to do that, he says, let's imagine that um, we set our measurement settings, our polarizers, uh, by with the output of a pseudo-random number generator. And this this pseudo random number generator um, is the output is sensitive to the millionth millionth digit of the input to the pseudo random number generator. So actually, I'm going to read what Bell says to illustrate the point. Suppose that the choice between two possible outputs, this is outputs of the pseudo random number generator corresponding to A and A prime depended on the oddness or evenness of the digit in the millionth decimal place of some input input variable. Okay, so that's fine. Then he says, fixing A or A prime, fixing the output, indeed fixes something about the input, whether the millionth digit is odd or even. Okay, that's fine. Now, this is the crucial sentence. This is the crucial sentence, which I want to read and I want you to focus on. But this peculiar piece of information is unlikely to be the vital piece for any distinctively different purpose, i.e. it is otherwise rather useless. Okay, so he is saying, let's imagine, uh, you know, you are uh, uh, an alien living uh, on the Andromeda galaxy somewhere. Your life is completely unaffected by whether that millionth digit is odd or even here on Earth. I mean, that's that's the kind of intuitive, I think, I mean, that's the intuitive thing that, that probably most people would imagine is, is kind of a reasonable assumption. Okay, so I'm gonna take that just a tiny bit further and just express that a little bit more mathematically. So let's imagine indeed, let's think about the whole universe, or if you like our local cluster of galaxies, doesn't really matter. Um, and we're going to uh, we're going to imagine a state space which encompasses all the degrees of freedom of all the stars and all the atoms in the stars and everything else. We've got some humongously big state space, and the state of the universe at some time uh, I just represent as a point in this humongously big state space. And I'm just going to label that point, let's say, with a capital U. And included in that state is the this notion that we have a random number generator here on Earth, which has been fed with an input variable, uh, which has it, as its millionth digit a certain number, which is either odd or even. Let's suppose it's uh, odd for the sake of argument. All right. Now, what I want to do is consider this question that Bell assumes is correct about whether that millionth digit is relevant for any distinctly dis, distinctively different purpose other than for setting uh, the the you know the polarizer for a Bell experiment. All right, so I'm going to imagine mathematically creating a hypothetical state of the universe which is absolutely identical in every respect except that the millionth digit, the millionth input, sorry, except that the input variable differs from the actual one by the millionth, at least the millionth and perhaps beyond the millionth digit. So it's a very, very slightly different uh, input number, which has a different millionth digit. So what I'm doing is I'm taking that point in state space and moving it very, very, very slightly 
in the direction of the variable that corresponds to this input variable to the pseudo random number generator. And I'm going to call that U prime. Now, it's a hypothetical state of the universe, it doesn't really exist. So, am I, I mean, what's my intuition about U prime? Is it a sensible state of the universe? Well, Bell's intuition is it should be a sensible state of the universe because, I mean, the rest of the universe can continue on exactly as it does, whether or not the millionth variable is odd or even. But I want to ask a rather deep question. Oh, is it inevitable that that slightly perturbed state of the universe is consistent with the laws of physics, whatever the laws of physics are? Is it necessarily consistent with the laws of physics? Now, I want to make the point that actually I think Bell himself realized that that was a key question in his theorem. And to, to, answer, to, to make that point, I'm going to turn back a page in, in Bell's paper and just read the following paragraph, actually. So just, just when I read this paragraph, just think about this U and U prime. U is the real world. U prime is a hypothetical world, which is in where the moons of Jupiter are exactly as they were in the real world. Everything is the same, except that millionth, the millionth input uh, digit is different. Okay, so here's what Bell says. I would insist here on the distinction between analyzing various physical theories on the one hand, and philosophizing about the unique real world on the other hand. In this matter of causality, it is a great inconvenience that the real world is given to us once only. We cannot know what would have happened if something had been different. We cannot repeat an experiment changing just one variable. The hands of the clock will have moved and the moons of Jupiter. Physical theories are more amenable in this respect. We can calculate the consequences of changing free elements in a theory, be it they only initial conditions, and so can explore the causal structure of the theory. I insist that what he calls B, which is his paper, Theory of Local Beables, I insist that B is primarily an analysis of certain kinds of physical theory. Okay, so with that point in mind, I want to ask the question, could one envisage a type of physical theory where a, a, a hypothetical perturbation to just one variable of the state of the universe is actually inconsistent with that theory? Can one imagine that such a theory? Could such a theory exist? What? What would such a theory have to have to, to be like that? Now, I would say in ordinary classical theory, you know, we have initial conditions, we have laws. Sort of, we decouple the two. Classical theory, the initial conditions and the laws are totally decoupled. So we can, we can perturb the initial conditions, any initial conditions, as we like, and then we just run our evolution equations from the perturbed initial conditions. But there is a type of theory uh, where that's not true. And it's, it's I, I was kind of uh, curious to note that uh, Alvaro's talk, uh, I guess on the, the opening slide, had a picture of a chaotic attractor. And there is a class of nonlinear theory, that, and this is the, this is the class of theory that interests me, a class of theory which is deterministic, um, it's, um, but it's nonlinear. And it has the property that uh, you, if you define the dynamical system by differential equations and you run the, and you let the system run from a sort of an arbitrary initial state uh, indefinitely, it will eventually or asymptotically evolve on a special, uh, measure zero, what what a dynamical system person would call an attractor. 
uh, I would call it an invariant set. It's the set of points in state space uh, under which the the dynamic the the state is is invariant under the dynamical evolution law. Now, I mean, the very simple type, simplest types of invariant sets are just what are called limit cycles. Well, actually, a very simple set is where you have a, a state which goes to a steady state. So you have a fixed point. That's the simplest type of invariant set, a fixed point. But, then, you know, that doesn't describe the world very well because that would be completely st static. Then you have limit cycles where uh, the system is periodic and it just goes around a particular orbit forever and ever, just repeating itself. But the much more interesting class of 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 uh, invariant sets are the chaotic ones, which are uh, fractal, and in some sense, they, those are the most generic. But all of these invariant sets have the property that they have a measure of zero relative to the Euclidean n-dimensional state space in which they're uh, embedded. And what that means is that indeed, if you take a point on the invariant set on the attractor, if you like and randomly perturb it, let's say in one direction, when I say random, random with respect to the continuum measure of the Euclidean space in which this attractor is embedded, then with probability one, you take that point off the invariant set into, into its neighborhood, um, maybe into a kind of gap in between uh, the, 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 the trajectories. So we have a potential class of theory where actually Bell's example or Bell's, Bell's intuition, if you like, that the value of that millionth digit was irrelevant for any other distinctive purpose other than for setting the polarizer is false in the sense that randomly perturbing that millionth digit, keeping everything else the same, takes you off the attractor if your theory demands that states of the world evolve on this invariant set then what you've done is violate your your hypothetical what a philosoph philosopher might call counterfactual perturbation um has now violated your laws of physics now i'm not arguing i'm not you know in this talk i don't want to convince you that this particular dynamical model is correct. The only point I'm making is that it's a theory, and that's what Bell, that's what Bell was saying. He said, "Don't philosophize about this because that's going to get us nowhere. If you if you think my intuition is wrong, come up with a theory where it's wrong." And this is a class of model where that intuition is wrong. It's not. You know, just to be clear about this, it's not that the the alien on the on Andromeda suddenly, whoa, what happened? Somebody changed the millionth digit of a variable back on Earth. It's just that the whole the laws of physics are inconsistent. So that world U prime will never be realized according to uh, your this particular theory of physics. So in that sense, it's a sort of an existential perturbation on Earth for the moons of Jupiter for andromeda for everywhere it's just it's just like the whole universe goes up in smoke if you were to perturb that millionth digit keeping everything else fixed so in my view um this is actually fundamentally what super determinism is about i mean the the technical definition is and actually this link, links a little bit to robert's talk it's about whether your probability measures um uh, it, 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 uh, a super deterministic theory is one where the probability measure on the hidden variables uh, cannot be treated as independent of the uh, measurement settings. But the way in which that is violated is by doing a, counter, a counterfactual perturbation on either Bob or Alice's setting and showing that that keeping the lambda fixed, that that hypothetical universe would take you off this special set of points, this invariant set, and so would be inconsistent with the laws of physics. Now, it's worth saying 
at the end here, well, I want to make two points. See, 20 past. I want to make a couple of points and then I'll finish. Um, Maudlin, you know, Maudlin's categorical that this is a rubbish idea. This is this is not even science. It should be pointed out that Bell was much, much more ambivalent about this. And he says at the end of that paper, so this is my third and final quote from Bell. Of course, by the way, of course, he starts the paragraph with the two words, of course. Of course, it might be that these reasonable ideas about physical randomizers are just wrong for the purpose at hand. A theory may appear in which such conspiracies inevitably occur, and these conspiracies may then seem more digestible than the non-localities of other theories. When that theory is announced, I will not refuse to listen either on methodological or other grounds. So I, 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 you know, it's a great tragedy that we can't discuss these things with Bell. I, I would like to have thought he would be, uh, well, let's say at least interested in these proposals and certainly not as dismissive. Uh, and Maudlin's not the only one, I should say. I mean, uh, there are a number of other people who um, uh, make similar points. Uh, and are very so completely dismissive. I just think it, 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 it it just shows people are not thinking, you know, out of the box, if you like, about the type of physical theory we may need to explain Bell's theorem. Now, one, I mean, one, you know, one reaction I get when I try and publish papers, I get reviews saying, God, you know, is this what we need to solve Bell's theorem? I mean, is non-locality that much of a problem? I mean, my view is, as I say, my, my PhD was in general relativity. General relativity is a deterministic, uh, locally causal, nonlinear, geometric theory. Quantum mechanics is linear, if you believe in Copenhagen, not deterministic, seems to violate local causality, not terribly geometric. So I, I take the view that the difficulty we have had synthesizing quantum mechanics and general relativity just comes from that that fundamental incompatibility and that finding something that can explain quantum physics but is non non-linear locally causal geometric and non-linear i think is a great uh, goal to aim for because that will hopefully make this synthesis much easier so I'm just going to end with the drug trial. Um, I think the point I would make about the drug trial is that, see, what I'm, I mean, the key point I'm trying to argue here is about whether counterfactual worlds are necessarily consistent with the, with the laws of physics. Of course, it depends what the laws of physics are, but I I, I'm, I'm suggesting at least a class of things. So just to be clear, my, my idea would be that the universe as a whole is a deterministic dynamical system evolving on some, you know, super cosmological attractor, fractal attractor, you know, and it goes through maybe multiple epochs going around and around this attractor. Uh, but basically that's what it is. Um, and counterfactual perturbations to states, in other words, ones that you make from just hypothetical assumptions without any particular constraint on the with the dynamics, they they are typically typically going to take you off the attractor. Um, by the way, the the philosopher Michael Redhead wrote very persuasively years ago about the importance of this assumption of counterfactual definiteness in the Bell theorem, and this is really what I'm kind of saying. There are classes of theory which seem to me perfectly sensible deterministic theories where, where counterfactual definiteness is violated. So I'm not saying all counterfactuals are wrong, but there's a class of counterfactuals that would be inconsistent with the laws of physics. Now, just to say, what's this got to do with drug trials? I don't think it's got anything to do with drug trials for the very simple reason that experimentalists don't ever make use of counterfactual reasoning to justify their experiments. You know, if somebody, if somebody has done a, a drug trial on a group of rats and says, 
you know, I'm a little bit worried that there may have been some spurious correlation between your randomizer and the rats. You know, God knows what that is. But then the experimentalist will say, OK, well, we'll repeat the experiment with a different randomizer or we'll let another group in a different part of the world with a completely different uh, setup do the experiment. And that's the crucial aspect of uh, what that makes experimental science scientific it's the ability to reproduce experiments it's rep reproducibility i mean that's why cold fusion you know got nowhere because nobody could ever repeat those cold fusion experiments and that's the key it's not you know believing in counterfactuals is not something an experimentalist you know unless they're uh, you know at night they go they're, they're a kind of a, a part-time metaphysician or something where they might worry but the scientific method doesn't pay any attention to counterfactuals um so that that is just a, an illustration that the this kind of drug trial thing is just a grotesque in my view um sort of caricature of what is actually a much much more subtle uh assumption in bell's theorem which may be false. I mean, all I don't know, you know, who knows, but I'm just saying, I think one can envisage a class of theory which violates this counterfactual assumption. It allows experimental science to carry on without any uh, impediment at all. And, uh, but on the other hand, I do think, you know, I would argue, you see, who invented or who discovered, say, fractal attractors? It was a colleague of mine, Ed Lorenz, uh, from MIT, a meteorologist. Um, so in some sense, I, I, try, I tend to think of fractal attractors as, as kind of post-classical. They're not really classical. It, it's a kind of, a, it's an interesting question whether you can't, can't call them classical. I, I tend not to call them classical. There's, there, if, you, if you read my book, there are many beautiful, um, uh, you know, you can, you can do things like discuss Gödel's theorem in terms of the geometry of fractal attractors. Um, you can talk about piadic numbers. I mean, beautiful ideas in number theory uh, come out of looking at these things. So my view is that they are they are kind of post-classical. So I'm not I'm not proposing a classical solution to Bell's theorem, just to be clear. I'm not doing that. I don't think personally, I don't think there is a classical solution unless you're prepared to you know, swallow non-locality, which I, I don't find a very uh, appealing idea. So this is non-classical, but uh, but it does it does uh, yeah it does preserve the locality and determinism, and it attacks the what would be called the statistical. It's kind of a bad word, by the way. I don't like it either. Statistical independence. That thing with the the probability density is sometimes called the statistical independence. I again you see it conjures up ideas in people's minds and i don't think that's a good thing but anyway that's it i think that's um that's uh pretty much yeah done thank you thank you very much so so um so now now we we'll discuss uh, any questions comments so let, let, let me let me maybe make make one question comment so you, you could talk about the general the relativity so for this is the, for me a very nice example that we shouldn't use Euler Lagrange, Lagrange equation that Euler Lagrange would mean that, that the space time un, 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 unrolls, it, which kind of makes, makes little sense. How we solve general relativity is the, the least action principle, saying that we have some 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 four dimensional jello which minimizes tension. So why shouldn't we just just try to solve with the least action principle? It is also super deterministic, and I I I I can argue that it, it violates very very inequalities. Again, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to get into the the argument. My 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 idea is better than yours, or, or anything like that. So, um, all I'm saying is, you know, if you go into Euler Lagrange, you you got these issues to do with the uh, you know the, the 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 past and the future boundary conditions. Um, and uh, the great thing about these fractal attractors is that there are no boundary conditions. There's no initial condition. There's no final condition. These things are, they go on forever in the future. They go on forever in the past. So it, it's a way of completely, uh, you know, the whole kind of retro causality stuff. It just, it just, it's, it doesn't play a role. The, the boundary, there are no, there's no role for boundary conditions. Now, on the other hand, I don't know of a simple, you know, if you like Euler-Lagrange, and this is something I do think about, but I haven't come to any 
profound conclusion. I, I, I have yet to kind of come up with a very with any kind of simple, let's say, minimization principle like like Euler Lagrange, which could generate one of these fractal invariant sets. You know, we, we know they exist. I don't know how to formulate them in in a in a in terms of a minimization principle. It wouldn't be something simple like Euler Lagrange. It would have to be more complex and and almost certainly based on piadic piadic numbers, which are the sort of natural mathematical tools for for describing analysis on on fractal geometries. Um, so yeah, so um, you know your 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 idea is uh, your idea kind of uh, is. It, you know, invokes the the future and past boundary conditions uh, in some kind of symmetric way. My 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 approach, time the time boundary conditions don't don't play any role whatsoever. Um, yeah, that that's all I got to say, really. So this fractal is, is inside the space time as a subspace of a subset of space space time. Yes. No, no, it's not space time. No, 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 no. It, this is important. It's it's a subspace of state space. This this is like a super important point. It's not space, space time, and and it's, it's a, space. Kind of, it's a curious mm. question to know. Sorry, I missed. It, it, it's state space, yeah, fundamentally, and that's and that's uh, super important because there are no, you know, state space doesn't come with us with a causal structure. State space doesn't come with a Lorentz, uh, you know, metric or anything like that. The the space time does. Um, so these holistic structures, you know, they don't they don't violate any causal, you know, any causal uh, properties because they aren't they they're, they're not they're not uh, they're, they're constraints in, in state space which doesn't have a, a, a Lorentzian metric. So I have a question. Yeah. This uh, I mean uh, this fractal set um, yeah. uh, concerns uh, hidden variables. Uh, Related to the particles, the fields, or both, or what's your what's oh, your both. idea? I would say both. I mean, I I definitely agree. I think it was your point, was it, Alvaro? I can't remember now. Um, that that one shouldn't think of the hidden variables as uh, as localized to the particles. In some sense, you know, uh, the the support of the local variables has to be quite broad. But you know, as I think Richard said. Um, you know, Bell's theorem doesn't say anything about, you know, local variables being uh, localized in to, onto particles. So, um, so you know, I, I just just I think he was probably right. Just to say you've got somehow a delocalized hidden variable quantity doesn't excel doesn't itself explain. Uh, you know, can't be used to explain the violation of Bell's inequalities in a deterministic, locally causal way. Um, so there's more, there's more to it than just saying the the hidden variables are somehow delocalized. But I think it is a, it it is a consequence of my. Uh, we, I'd have to talk more about it, but that that somehow they are they're not lo well certainly they're not localized to to the particle. Okay, okay thanks. Uh, I've got a, I have a question. Uh, uh, well, Tim, first of all, it's a pleasure to listen to you. I think we last met about 10 years ago with Roger Penrose and Basil Hiley and yourself. Oh, right. Yeah. And um, we talked about some of the things that are relevant to this at that stage. We were talking about, uh, uh, about quantum events, about events that went from A to B and, uh, and retro causality. I'm sorry, I missed that talk. I was unfortunately not able to, to listen to that part of it. I think it's part of another kind of system that also illustrates the thing that you've been looking at in terms of in terms of uh, in terms of a, of a bounded state in state space a strange attractor that is as soon as you have something which is transactional both forward and backwards in time that one also has a system where one can't change the states a little bit and have something which obeys the laws of physics in the whole of, for the whole of space and the whole of time so i think that's another example of a, of a, of a system which um, fixes the whole system. One can't get a finger in between what Alice and Bob are looking at and what's happening in the detectors because the whole system yeah. is both forwards and backwards in time. The, the, thing, the thing though is, um, I, I think my, um, so I, I, I deliberately tried to avoid like talking about anything technical if you like. But I have a, I, I do have a kind of a technical, um, I could, you know, I could give another hour's talk on on, on the sort of technical <laughs> side of it. 
and and one way and one way of actually talking about it is in terms of, i'm coming i'll come to your point in a minute is is about um you know the the, the thing about um you know i mean Max Planck introduced his quantum hypothesis as a way of sort of discretizing the energy of, of, you know, harmonic oscillators and things. But we've ended up with a theory where the continuum uh, still plays an absolutely million percent critical role, which is the continuum of Hilbert space. Hilbert space, you know, is, is a continuum space. It, 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 and indeed, it's a, it's, a, it's a vector space over complex numbers, co the continuum of complex numbers. Now, one way of formulating my uh, approach it actually is, is actually quite simple, and that is to sort of discretize um, Hilbert space so that the coefficients, if you like, in front of a, a sort of set of uh, basis vectors for a for a quantum state, are are uh, well the, the 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 amplitudes are rational numbers, and the and the complex phases are rational angles. Now, what this gives you. Is something kind of subtle when when you apply it to the uh, let's say the CHSH Bell theorem. So you have these four different possible uh, pairs of of angles for Alice and Bob. You know zero 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 one one zero one one, and you say, well, let's let's consider a particle where uh, Alice and Bob measure. You know, let's say zero zero for the sake of argument it could be whichever choose whatever you like. Um, then the other three options let's say zero one one zero and one one are all counterfactual for that particular lambda now in my theory it's not the case actually that all three of them are disallowed it's actually only it's actually the only one of them i mean like we don't know which one but two out of the three counterfactuals are allowed by the theory but you can't all three counterfactuals are are not allowed so you you violate yeah. so so what i'm saying is um i'm i'm i've got a little bit more flexibility than perhaps you're suggesting i'm not saying that absolutely well, I everything is saying, fixed. i wasn't I'm saying you're right, saying you're right but there before. are many counterfactuals that are possible you know that are consistent with the laws of physics but for example with with the chsh the three additional counterfactuals for a given lambda not all three of them according to this theory would be consistent with the laws of physics, only two of them. I think that, yeah, that's a very interesting point, but with, we could get, I, I suppose we're now in this in the position where we've actually finished all the talk, so we can get properly technical. I, I think Hilbert space is a bit too simple here as well, because what you're doing, what you're doing with it, if you have a Hilbert space, you, you, you've done something before you have the Hilbert space. What, you do, what you've done, there's something hidden there outside setting up a Hilbert space, because to set up a Hilbert space, you have to have a quantum, you have to have a system which is quantized, which is a quantum system, which contains that space. You have to have a, you have to have a state space in which it exists. Well, now, well, wait a minute, stop, stop a second. I mean, you can talk about Hilbert space for, you know, classical systems. If you want to, if you have a system yes. that's uncertain, I, I, you know, you could, a dice or a pack of cards, you don't know what the top card is. You can represent that card by, you know, a, a Hilbert's, a Hilbert's. That's uh, right, that's right. But a Hilbert space can do simpler things. That's true. But taking it to the level of its ultimate complexity. So if we're looking at something which is as far as it'll go, because well, it's a complex number system. Yeah, it's complex well, numbers that, that make Because it's it. a complex number system that you're using there, you're still, you're, you're limited by something which is, which is still one of the, um, one of the division algebras. So, um, so complex numbers being one of the division algebras, you have a you have a state space which is defined by that Hilbert, which is defined defined by your system. So you have a system, but if we come back to what that quantum system is, and this also addresses the thing with the Delft um, uh, uh, with the Delft experiments as well. Clearly, in the case of photon experiments, if you have something which is has an emission and an absorption, just relativistically, the emission and absorption have to take place at the same point in space time. That means that the actual setting, whatever any, any Alice and Bob have done to their polarizers, is known by the entire light speed system before there is, a, there, there is no time to do anything other than have the state as is, the physical state as exists, the factual state, not any counterfactual state. So for photon systems, you're always dealing with a single point in space time for the emitted and absorbed photon. So all of those experiments really you can propose the experiment happens, but in setting up the experiment and saying that Alice chooses to do this, well, she can't 
because the whole thing has happened bang at one point in space time. So you have something which the, which the whole premise of the idea of, uh, of what you're doing in trying to set up these experiments is already flawed at the level of special relativity. Now, when you go to doing the experiments in, in, uh, in, in, uh, with, with electrons and you start looking at electron states, in order to do things there where you're looking at, at entangled states or mixed state states, and this may be causal as well, and I love the stuff that's been done on that. But when you're looking at those states, what you have to do first is set up a quantum state. And to set up a quantum state, you have to wait for amount of time. You have to have it go backwards and forwards. It has to go ding, dong, ding, dong. It has to be resonant and harmonic. Once it becomes resonant and harmonic, okay, you can then let the thing out. And okay, they can sit there doing the resonant harmonic things as long as they like. Now, provided that experiment is then done within the elastic mean free path, so the states have not been interfered with, they are still ringing with the quantum state that they both had at the point they were fixed in a quantum state, which is, a, okay, it can be described by a point in Hilbert space, but it's more complicated than that. Hilbert space is not sufficient to describe the entire system that's sitting there oscillating because it's not simply two-dimensional like a two-dimensional plane in quantum space. It's at least four-dimensional in space-time, especially when you're letting a thing wander around in space-time and doing things through angles. You should be thinking about things like Berry phases, for example. Yeah. Take something and even doing the computer thing, which was done just now, if you run something through 90 degrees, you will get a 90 degree phase change, a Berry phase change. And that thing is not even considered in, 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 in these experiments. I think it's interesting also that the, the thing that you highlighted, the, that was highlighted, that you're getting a 90 degree, you're getting a 180 degree phase shift with a 90 degree turn of a quarter wave plate. I think that's also interesting because you're looking both forward and backwards. If you're looking at the thing as a transaction in terms of an interaction, then it's going through that thing twice. Uh, okay, so, I, I, can I, I interrupt here? Uh, John, in whatever you said now, I think I might have counted 10 hypotheses in there. It was no physical reality. I think in order to find, really get down to the, the, the cause of the um, Bell inequality, uh, we should not argue about probabilities and so on. We should really be- No, I agree, I agree. I agree. The, the ontology of physics and- I'm not, if, I'm, not arguing about, I'm not arguing about probabilities, Anton. I'm talking about the actual physical space as it exists in a proper quantum space. How do you know it? You don't know it. Exactly, you don't know it. Exactly, you don't know it. You know, it that's the it. point. You know, and and if I may share my screen, um, I, I've got you know. There's a very simple experiment that will. Could I could I stop a second? Yes, um, of course. It's, you I, were we're just going on. off off topic a little bit. Um, could I invite, I just see, I'm trying to read it and I haven't really read it, but I've just read the last sentence of Richard's comment, which is something about science fantasy. Could, could, and I, I could see he's referring to my uh, talk. So could I just invite Richard to say whatever it is that he thinks is fantasy? I, I, I'm, oh, no. I'm trying to read it. Yes. Um, okay. Well, I mean, this just sounds like fantasy to me. If, if, if you can figure out a theory on this basis, which enables you to uh, you make a grand unified theory of physics and solve all the problems of the Big Bang and so on, I will be very, very impressed. But I don't think it's going to help people understand Bell experiments. I mean, for me, it's very uh, intuitive, but maybe that's because yeah, I spent, for you, it's very intuitive. For I me spent not. 40 years of my life uh, working on chaos theory and stuff. Yeah. So no, I spent my hard. life working on chance and statistics, and I would love it that the universe is driven by quantum randomness. I have no problem with that. Yes. And, and except, that, except except that the randomness express no... itself in some beautiful no, sort of non-locality, which that now makes, allows makes collaboration at distance, though not action at a distance, I yeah. think that's wonderful. Well, it doesn't make much sense to me. I mean, Einstein's famous example just of a single particle uh, coming out from a single point source and, and moving to onto a hemisphere of photofluorescent material. Yeah. Um, the, the problem is, you know, he pointed out that the problem with that is that uh, when the, when the, uh, the, let's say the photon, uh, the, when the wave function of the photon collapses uh, at a point on that hemisphere, Mm -hmm. um, if you say it's random, 
then somehow every other point has got to know not to collapse to produce a photon. Yes, so it's so a weird kind of randomness. And yes. I think it would be better to just accept there is something deterministic going on there. May, 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 may I, 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 I think one I could perhaps decide to accept that there is something non-local and random in the universe. Okay, look, look Richard, I, I accept that, you know, you know, people have different views and I, I respect yeah. your view, but I don't think it's fantasy. I think I'm I'm proposing <laughs> something we, which we, is, we can which is mathematically... Some... So, we can don't you finish my sentence, just one go second. Ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I think what I'm proposing is mathematically correct and sound, whether it's physically correct, I mean, I don't know. Obviously, you know, the million dollar, billion dollar, trillion dollar question will be uh, uh, finding an experiment which can test this. Yeah. Uh, my own belief is it will ultimately come when we get close to being able to test particles which get close to the Planck mass. In other words, testing part testing quantum mechanics in a regime where the particle's gravity is non-trivial. I think that will a lot that will sub, that will sort a lot of problems out. We're a long way from doing that, sadly. So um, I think we just have to accept we have different views. But I don't, you know, I don't think it's fantasy, Richard. With respect, I think it's it's sound mathematics, non-linear mathematics, and I don't see anything particularly wrong with it. But whether you agree, of course, it's entirely up to you. <laughs> You, you'll have a hard time convincing me, but I mean, you try to convince some other people. Yep. I, I'm, Can I'm I ask you, I want to interrupt, but just I, John Bell wrote about the, the deterministic, uh, super deterministic and deterministic chaos a bit you, you raised. It's actually just to read <clears throat> scripture, La Nouvelle Cuisine, ah, page 244. My, my, it just shows how long I've been working on this. This is an earlier edition, which uh, was came out before La Nouvelle Cuisine. Okay, La Nouvelle. Oh, you don't have La Nouvelle Cuisine. Well, no, it's not in. It's not in this edition. You will love this. You will love this. And by the way, just for the little story, I was with uh, Tim Mudlin two months ago at his place in New York, staying with him, and that's what we discussed and we 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 prayed on this passion. Give me a second. Yep. An essential element in the reasoning here is that A and B are free variables. One can envisage then theories in which there just are no free variables for the polarizer angles to be coupled to. In such super deterministic theories, the apparent free will of the experimenter and any other apparent randomness would be illusory. Perhaps such a theory could be both locally causal and in agreement with quantum mechanical predictions. However, I do not expect to see a serious theory of this kind. I would expect a serious theory to permit deterministic chaos or pseudo randomness for complicated subsystem, e.g. computers, which would provide variables sufficiently free for the purpose at hand, but I do not have a theorem about that. Okay, so John Bell clearly, you know, thought about what you just said, and he comes out with, look, that map between deterministic equations of GR and non-deterministic formalism of QM, many people start with the non non, uh, on, on the non-deterministic of QM as the basic ontological brick, but in fact, he constructs a map via deterministic chaos. We have seen it in the walkers of Kuder. Uh, uh, Yves Kuder uh, put a walker rotating in a bath. John Bush here put it in a coral. And really what we see in this dynamic is that, you know, the, the walker is basically coupled to this nonlinear surface. And so the path of the walker is a deterministic chaos. I have written a paper, it's published in Chaos Magazine, characterizing actually the chaotic phase state space of, of, of the walkers um, uh, with Burak Budan, who are here at Georgia Tech in, uh, with uh, Predrag Zvitanovic team here. Um, and, 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 and the Kuder uh, or, had already said, look, it's very possible that what we call superposition uh, is, in fact, um, is in fact intermittence, chaotic intermittence. The particle orbits this, then orbits that. It jumps between orbits randomly. 
And the component that is missing to your point, you know, you say the fractal attractor, yeah, but that's the, 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 the component that is missing and, and Kuder himself in the walkers insisted on this point, it's the standing little wave that's there, that, that information, that memory, that nonlinear memory uh, that guides the particle and creates this, this, this path divergence. So it's the memory, according to Kuder, in the standing way, it's almost tautological at this point, a standing wave is a memory by definition of standing there. But it's a very, very fine thing. And well, being okay. long wine, just to, to finish on the, I did read the papers that Joshua was talking about where they do modify the source by putting a half wave plate in the arm. And I did not realize that. Uh, and so where I'm going with all this is, Maybe the source of that little wave you talk about, the source of that non-determinism that is so critical in quantum is in fact the electron zeta bewegung. De Broglie hypothesized this standing wave. It's enough to create this non-deterministic behavior you, you need, you know, as an emergent phenomenon. That's it. I mean, all I'm saying, yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, it's good to good to hear the the bell quote. Uh, I, I mean, I think the the, the problem with uh, these uh, little bouncing drops and so on is is explaining, you know, entangled particle systems rather than just single particle systems. They obviously do a good job in explaining the, uh, you know, the two slit experiment and things. But like John that. and Alvaro but, have an excellent paper on on entanglement that's coming out. Right. It's a static test, but it, it's yeah, a but, very but yes. my point. My point is that it's that it's for the entangled is for the Bell theorem that you that this if you like the fact that the invariant set puts a non-trivial measure on state space it, it it creates if you like no go regions where the measure is zero that is the crucial thing which um which in my model allows you to evade uh um uh which allows you to to violate bell inequalities without having to assume non-locality so uh so i do think i i think you know it's more than just saying you have let's say differential equations which are chaotic which you can start from any old initial condition i think you know the 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 co combination of well it's basically the 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 invariant measure which which see the point about the invariant measure is it it it, it constrains not only the evolution equations but it constrains what those initial conditions can be because you can't have an initial condition on a, on a you know on a, on a part of the state space where the measure is zero, and that's what I'm claiming is the thing which allows you to evade non-locality. I'm I'm pretty damn sure this is correct, but whether people accept it or find it too complicated, I I can't. It's not science fantasy anyway. I think it's it's uh, it's it's fairly rigorous mathematics. Could I ask one thing, Tim, about yeah. that? Um, and it may help me understand uh, understand your point of view a little bit more. Um, I'm wondering if it's possible to translate what you're saying into a simpler context, right? Because you're talking about a zero measure subset on a phase space, and right. you can't just arbitrarily perturb something from there because you will then wind up in a different point of phase space and violate the laws of evolution, right? Um, but can you not basically make the exact same point about the wave equation? You know, imagine that you have some initial conditions, whatever they are, and then uh, a wave is propagating through space according to the wave equation. It is then not the case that you can arbitrarily perturb from one moment to the next, say the position or the velocity of a given particle, um, and then stay within the confines of the wave equation. Um, and it seems like, it seems to me like that, that is kind of like the same point you're making. Um, only it, it is maybe a little bit more simple than the way that you made it. Um, or at least it seems more simple to me. And I'm, I guess I'm wondering if that seems on target to you. Well, um, it's just that, you know, I mean, isn't, I mean, you, it sounds like what you're talking about is, is, uh, is uh, De Broglie Bohm type theory. And I'm, I'm talking about the wave equation, like not just the wave equation. I think the issue here is, 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 is about, about wave the, equation. A, yeah, a so the equation. issue here is about theories and, and you're talking about like physical theories and what they do and what we can expect from them. Right. 
Um, and and so I'm I'm just wondering if we can't translate this exact same point you're making into the classical wave equation and and look at the evolution and and you can say say the same thing and there, I you, think you can you well, cannot. I, I'm sorry, but to to have a fractal attractor, you need nonlinearity, yeah. and the wave equation is purely linear. So yeah, all these invariant problem, sets. The one thing they yeah, have you, in common. One thing they have in common is that they're nonlinear systems. That's a quite a fundamental and, point. And you also so need to, to be dissipative, of also, because if you have a conservative dynamical system, uh, you, you would have, so you are leaving something and this has to do with radiation. Mm -hmm. Perhaps yeah. it could be, I don't know, but. Hmm. but can, I, can I make the point yeah. that, that you're right, absolutely right to bring out, there is an element of irreversibility here, but that irreversibility can be, uh, can be, can be localized to an arbitrarily small region of state space. It doesn't have to be, in other words, I mean, if if now Richard will just roll his eyes now, but if if one is thinking about this as describing a a multi epoch universe, I mean, it could be that all the irreversibility occurs just in the transition from one epoch to the next. That would be enough to generate an attractor. You 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 could have a a, a dynamical system that is Hamiltonian on ninety nine point nine 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 percent of phase space, but it's, right. it's dissipative on the remaining point zero zero one percent, and that would have a fractal attractor. Uh, as its invariant set, so the 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 dissipation can be very very localized to different parts of uh, space and time. If you look if you look physically, um, then the phase isn't interfered with with an elastic transition. If you're looking at the solutions of the Schrodinger equation, but then looking at them experimentally. So if you experimentally form an electron beam, say in the solid state, and have a look at how long the phase coherence persists. You find that the phase coherence length is longer than the scattering length, but uh, is close to the inelastic scattering length of the uh, of the system. So once it undergoes an inelastic event, then that phase is randomized. But before that, even with small scatterings that it has uh, from one point to another, it retains phase coherence more or appears to maintain phase coherence in that one still gets quantum interference effects. I did an experiment on this back in 1990. Uh, in uh, there's a, there's an experiment in uh, in Fizrev on that, um, just just for information. Thank you. I'm sorry to say I'm going to have to leave the call in about three minutes, um, but um, I'll let the rest of you argue it out. Um, I'm just very happy I've been able to uh, at least put my point of view over. I'm not asking any of you to believe it, but. Uh, I just would say when when people like Tim Maudlin sort of just completely rubbish this idea with these drug examples, I, I just you know they're they're not they're not they're they're not good examples to use. That's all I'm saying. And thank you. It was a pleasure to, to listen to you again. So you take care of yourself, and we'll talk okay. some other time. Okay. All right. All right. I just have a comment about uh, this idea of a state space that the state space is not the same as the measurement space. And in particular, um, you can have a single state and two different measurements, and those two different measurements uh, are drawn essentially from different probability distributions. That's You're basically. absolutely right. In fact, in fact, the state space is always different to the measurement space because the measurement is always a perturbation of that state if there's any interaction with it. So in fact, they are separate, absolutely correct, yes. In fact, I think I think that um, th there is a problem here in that one often confuses the fact that, th that the thing has to be in some specific state with what happens with the measurement, because the measurement is going to perturb that state, both in, in all theories, uh, both forward in time, but in some, but in theories which deal with inter interactions between emitter and absorber, also backwards in time. So, 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 so the measurement then is quite crucial. Where you set your boundary conditions outside of the, outside of the experiment is actually also completely crucial. And each individual experiment can be done, as Tim was saying, only once. You can't, uh, reproducibility is so important in physics, but in this particular case, of course, you don't know where you are in the Zitterbewegung phase, if you believe SS needs a Zitterbewegung inter interpretation of quantum mechanics, or if you want to go for the Copenhagen thing, one cannot know where one is in the phase of the wave function. Both things give the same result. But there are certain things that you can't know about a particular state because they can't be measured by 
it, by, by by any means. So um, so and, and those things that that measurement is often neglected in discussions of this kind, but it does perturb the state space of the system. It puts it into a new set of it it it, 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 it introduces an extra an extra dimension to the state space in which this unperturbed system sits. So it so it so it changes the system simply every time. Um, but even um, given the fact that the measurement perturbs the state, um, presumably the result still depends on what the initial state was. No, the, a, a proper measurement where you absorb a quantum destroys the state. We're talking about creation and destruction operators here. Right, but oh. in, in a realistic model, that still depends on what the initial state was. So my point is that um, if you have two measurements that are made on the same state, the probability densities of those two measurements are not necessarily equal. Either, either the measurement, either the intermediate measurement was not carried out, or one cannot do that because the initial measurement perturbs the state for the second measurement. If you get any information out at all, that gives you information about the system, which then changes that state. Um, well, I, I'm not using any uh, loop, any of these uh, non-local loopholes. Just uh, even if it's the same state, um, they're essentially those two measurements are drawn from two different probability densities. No, I mean the yes, uh, and the simple experiment of taking two linear polarizers, which are which are which are at right angles to one another. Then introducing a third one at 45 degrees that allows no light through then introducing a third one at 45 degrees light starts coming through you've changed the state by introducing an extra polarizer you do that with any kind of polarizer a circular polarizer or a or a or a, 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 a at an angle polarizer whatever you do if you do a pair of measurements you change the state in the in the intermediate measurement otherwise you haven't measured anything you've taken nothing out of the system or into the system yeah, the, the problem is we don't really know what that measurement is doing. <laughs> That's just what I just said. You know that it's changed it, but well, you, you do know how it's changed it because you've got a new set. If you take a polarized in this direction and take one at 45 degrees, then everything coming out will be polarized according to the 45 degree thing and nothing at all to do with the first polarizer. Although you only have a quarter of the light, but there you go. But uh, excuse me, but we have to take a time to explain all of this. Uh, we must not take a sort of a local view of and say this uh, the state space has changed. Uh, if one takes God's view and looks at uh, all of the universe, then nothing can wobble the universe or jiggle it. That means, that, makes, that, makes, that means that light is a god, is the god, because it can't be jiggled. No, no, no it's, it's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that, uh, that there is a universal state which cannot change. You know, but, but within the, the universe, things can change to the detriment of something else changing. And the Bell experiments or, uh, show exactly show us this. You know, that's why we have the, the entanglement. Because the, the, the universe is changing all the time. Look around you. It keeps yes, changing. Yes, <laughs> it's that what we see. That's yeah, what I know. we see. But uh, the, uh, from a uh, conservation point of view or from a uh, and uh, Nurta's point of view, if we take the whole universe as an entity, nothing can change it. That is, if something changes here, something else has to change somewhere, somewhere mm -hmm. else, that the whole thing stays in, uh, in balance. Are you suggesting that Alice and Bob sit there frozen in space and time as a single point in the whole reality of all space and all time? Because No, no, I'm not suggesting that. You know, what I'm suggesting is that the, the whole ontology that we use to describe physics is wrong. You know, I'm developing a new ontology, which I will be presenting in two weeks time. And, you know, and therefore my view is completely different. And if I just may share one slide that, uh, which is uh, for today's talk. Now, uh, hopefully, you, yeah, there you can see it now. I devised a new Bell experiment without correlations. You know, Alice on the right-hand side has a 25%, uh, 75% uh, or 75-25% polarizer. And Bob on the other side just uses a 50-50. And I predict 
that Bob will see a skewed polarization. Now, if that experiment is performed and that comes out, we really have to rethink what we have to do. And poor um, Richard will be out of a job in this group. Uh, in, uh, I have performed something similar. This was one of my starting points, putting circular polarizers and testing that because if you put, you know, if you filter out one circular polarization, you have it in the other, it's not, it comes with a null result. I mean, I'm happy talking more about that, but I don't wanna, yeah. there's nothing there. Well, I, I thought it was a well, good I, idea. I, I, I doubt it because that paper that Joshua showed us where they introduced these uh, half wave plates in the one leg. Yeah, uh, that's very proved, interesting. I just read it. my point. Yeah, that's fascinating. You know, that that yeah, proves I, my point. No, no, time out, time out, time out. I, I, again, that was my starting point. Let's polarize circularly. Let's select one because it's going to be untested. The whole idea that, you know, if you put two perpendicular and you and you do circular in between, you're going to get a signal. So let's do it on one arm. Let's do it on the other. I did that experiment with the quarter waves. Nothing comes up. It's an illusion. It's it's a narrative. I did not, I, I had not seen the, 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 the stuff Joshua sent and just, for, for reference, that's what he sent before. Now that is fascinating because essentially what Zeilinger and she saw in 95 published in PRL uh, is that sentence he, 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 he showed, which is uh, somewhat surprisingly, a net phase shift of pi may be obtained by a 90 degree rotation of a quarter wave plate in one of the paths. Now that's fascinating because I counted him before because I never encountered this idea, but okay, if I put a, we put a quarter wave and we change between psi plus, psi minus, that's how we prepare the states in the actual pumps. Uh, but here, what they do is they put the quarter wave plate downstream, not in the source, but downstream in the measuring apparatus. And yes. I was telling him, dude, that doesn't change anything. That's not how we change the psi, psi minus. Actually, they saw a change. And so this goes to what I was talking about earlier. We discard the idea that the polarizer have a fundamental immediate influence on the source. And that's what these guys saw. If they put just one quarter wave plate down, it completely changes the, the phase at the source, meaning the crystal actually contorts itself to emit the two cones so as to match what's going on. And Paul actually insists on, look, we may be, need to revisit Klitschko and what's going on in the polarizers. We have no idea how the actual absorption is being made and re-emission. We may be missing a big, big thing in how the polarizer is coupled to the source. So, you know, just, just to wrap it up, I've tested those ideas with a the circular. There's nothing there. The she stuff i would not seen, and that is really, yeah, really interesting, actually. Do you have a reference for that? Did you get it published? Well, uh, uh, the, the, the work, uh, we, uh, Paul and I have written the work. We've tried to publish. Uh, Paul wraps it up in a narrative of retrocausality, which gets shut down. But the, we have the data published, and 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 we can send that to you. I, I'm not going to say it's I'd up. Love to, I'd, I'd love to see it's it. Not yes, up please. for publication, but we do have two papers on the quarter wave play stuff. I, I'm happy to share that. It's not Thank public. you. Yeah. Thank you. But the she stuff and Zeilinger is uh, PRL ninety five. <clears throat> and that I had not seen. Can I ask you a question, Richard? So I, um, I very much appreciate you being here as a representative of the fundamental randomness of reality uh, <laughs> school. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I, I have a general question about your intuitions um, along those lines, uh, because you know, as, as we have, if we have an entangled uh, particles uh, and we measure their spins, and the magnets are perfectly aligned, say, we will always get, say, Alice sees plus one and Bob sees minus one, mm -hmm. right? And and then Bell said that the um, this this fact seems to cry out for the existence of a hidden variable explanation, right? Because you have yeah. basically perfect correlations or anti-correlations mm -hmm. in certain physical situations. 
and then um, through a uh, through a statistical argument, then he shows that we've got problems with that. And so it's a pity, he says, it's a shame that it, it actually just doesn't work, <laughs> right? Um, and I think from my point of view, just thinking about things very simply and looking at the case where the magnets are perfectly aligned or anti-aligned and you have perfect correlations and perfect anti-correlations, it seems to be that the story of current physics of you know the, the idea that quantum reality is fundamentally random, the story that was promulgated by the Nobel committee when they based, when they granted this prize and the citation seems to be that these correlations have no explanation, right? Yes. They're perfect correlations in this case, but because reality is fundamentally random, they have no explanation. And my question is just like, and I'm just curious about your intuitions here, that just seems absurd to me because since when do perfect correlations have no explanation, right? So I'm just curious to know what, what you think, right? And, uh, and what's your response well, to that? I, I, I absolutely agree with you. It seems absurd. I thought it was absurd myself for many years. I got, got so very upset about this and I've been thinking about it for 30 years, I think. And um, I come to conclusion that the universe is absurd. <laughs> And uh, I'm, that's I'm, a perfect uh, answer. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just is. It's crazy. OK, I mean, there are more crazy things we don't understand. Uh, I think we're all men here, so I could say, oh, nearly all. Like, I mean, women, you can never understand if you're a man, for instance. There are just things which are just beyond <laughs> humans understanding. And I, I think uh, uh, I, I do have a kind of theory about this because I think that our uh, brains uh, evolved Right. I mean, we used to be fish or, or, or lizards and later we became mammals and so on and so on. And we've made a very big thing about seeing patterns and acting on them. Right. And it's made us into the, what we are now about to, you know, destroy our whole planet. Uh, probably the fungus will take over afterwards. So it will be OK in the long run. And um, we we just know that everything that happens does have a cause that's built into our sort of primary building blocks of, of cognition. There are some things we, ju we just know when we're born, which we need to know when we're born in order to cope with all the inputs which we get and start to organize them and, and learn more. And we, uh, uh, the uh, psycholinguistics people call this systems of core knowledge. We have a basic understanding of causality. We have some basic understanding of, of, of geometry space uh, causality, I already mentioned, number, like, I mean, one, two, and possibly three are built in, and the rest we can figure out after that. And um, so we always know that when anything happens, it does have a cause. But uh, unfortunately, we're wrong. Too bad. So that's how I think about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that it, it distills things down quite nicely and I would only propose um, to expand on that in just briefly by by saying you say you know we have systems of core knowledge we uh, almost hardwired uh, we're almost hardwired to look for causes probably all animals are um, yeah, probably too yes. and and I think that probably the the way of naming uh, what you just identified is uh, the philosophical uh, principle called the principle of sufficient reason. Yes. And is yeah. a, there's a little bit of work on this by philosophers basically saying, well, quantum randomness defeats the principle of sufficient reason. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that really, in my opinion, that distills the essence of the actual quantum debate here. Uh, yeah. Is it the case that the principle of sufficient reason is false? Uh, or do we just not understand the deterministic underpinning yet. And, and that's, that's all I'll say. That, that's the choice. And that's why we have uh, uh, Tim coming up with his theory and other people with uh, retro causality and so on and so on. I'm like the options are kind of getting more uh, uh, narrowing down and getting more um, um, extraordinary, I, I think. But of course, maybe somebody can find out that there's some stupid uh, loophole being overlooked in, in the latest experiments or whatever, and uh, we shouldn't be I shouldn't be thinking of them, of those results, what I think about them. 
Yeah. Yeah. Can I answer, nice, nice question. Can I answer Adam as well? Um, please don't forget that all our uh, theories that we use are figments of our imaginations and might not have uh, to do anything with reality. Yes, but but there are theories which are which work. There is general relativity. There is other no. theories and models. So why they are working? They are hidden local general relativity, local realistic. Schrodinger right. equations, local realistic. How do they can work? They, they yeah. are still models. They are still models. But somehow they work. You know, they, they are corroborated. They are corroborated. But there may be another theory that does exactly the same. We right. just we just don't know the other theory. We cannot say uh, special relativity is correct. General relativity is correct. In, in some so, the regimes, they they work great. So okay. so so the question still, still the bellies say that they shouldn't. They cannot work because they, they it's completely different correlations that then than, than Bell say. So how these theories, which we, we know work, somehow work? What uh, is the I can give you, a, uh, I can show you that special relativity is self contradictory. Therefore, no, it cannot. I, I completely disagree. I'll, I'll take any bet on it. I'll take any bet on it. <laughs> you know, uh, I'll, I'll send you the paper. I'll send you the paper. But anyway, let's, let's beside the point. But my, the point is we cannot, the, our, uh, the, certainty that we are putting onto our, the theories that have been developed in the last century, or let's say from 1900 onwards, um, uh, might not be correct. And this is something that we really have to address uh, to understand this all. And then, you know, and, you know, and that is basically all that I wanted to say to um, Adam's uh, question that he asked at this stage. Let's get back to the topic of the of this um, uh, subject that we have. I want to add. I think the thing that's missing from this discussion is the uncertainty principle, because uh, we're talking about uh, non-commuting variables theoretically, and we know that uh, those cannot both be specified exactly by any theory. Um, it's you know specifically ruled out, um, and you know I gave a simple example of how Bell's theorem is violated um, without any kind of detection loopholes. It's just simple geometry. Well, I, I'm dubious, but I will uh, study. Why did theories work? And so, so let me finish. So, 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 how do we solve the general relativity? We don't solve it through the Euler Lagrange trying to unroll the space time. We solve it through the minimizing the Hilbert Einstein. Um, so, this is the least action principle. On the other side, there are quantum field theories, like standard model. We solve it through the ensemble of Feynman diagrams, Feynman, Feynman trajectories. So, we, in both cases, we use time symmetric formulations and it works. So, 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 so why, why, why cannot we? The least action principle, the the, the Feynman Feynman ensemble. Why can't we just accept what works? That's my big question. <laughs> well, the reason is because it leads to things which we find incomprehensible. But okay, so, so <laughs> but if, if it works, we better yes, get on with using it. And you are using human intuition that that we evolution from past to future. But maybe human is are wrong. Maybe we are not 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 perfect. And maybe mathematics is right in this case, which says a bit different. Mm -hmm. Mathematics oh, yeah. says that we should use one action optimizing space time shape, ensemble of histories in space time. This is mathematics. I, I can I don't know how to how to use Euler evol evolving Euler Lagrange for the for the general relativity. It makes no sense. For quantum field theories, it makes no sense. You have to use these time symmetric formulations to solve the, 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 the theories which work. I'm happy to various, take various crack at um, I've been 30 years on Bell. Um, I do this for pleasure because I just want to understand. Uh, and uh, 
increasingly, you know, forget the metaphysics of life's a dream and so causality, blah, 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 start hermetics with causality stands, even though life's a dream and above, so below. And then uh, to, uh, to Richard's point, uh, the polarity of male and female is called out in the Hermes Thoth Trismegistus principles, blah, blah, blah. As far as I'm concerned, I'm, uh, I've lent my equipment out uh, for Bell because I'm done. I consider myself done. I wanted to see certain things. All that intuition came from the walkers, you know, uh, John and, uh, and, and, and Couder and Emmanuel. And five years of looking at that, I'm going like, I'm revisiting Bell with that, right? I do the experiment. My conclusion is, eh, there's probably something with standing ways or we're full of it. And you're right, Richard, there's nothing there. And we're just deluding ourselves with statistics. Honestly, I still don't understand that argument correctly, but that's on me. You know, as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to dig my hole with experiments. So where I'm at, just to answer the question is, first of all, it needs to be experimental, in my opinion, because the I call it the, the, the Nobel Tower or the Tower of Nobel referencing Babel, right? Everybody has his own opinion. We yell at each other before the wine and after the wine, we go metaphysical. Great. You know, but there's, we, we talk about this. Um, and for me, what's really coming out of the walkers is this revival, not just of Bohm, but of De Broglie, because Bohm really had this magical wave function parachuted from the sky. You know, De Broglie is very specific about, about where, it's not specific, he has the wave. I was just reading Dagan and Bush paper, John, that you sent me. Thank you for that. I realized I financed some of it, but I never dived into it. Uh, you know, where you specify the source of the wave, where you specify the interaction of the wave. I think it's called the velocity potential in hydrodynamics. So I can see where you're coming with that. And at the end of the day, to me, the key, key insight from De Broglie is the standing wave. And, and Emmanuel, uh, John, and, 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 and Yves Couder put that back on the map. If you have standing wave, you have really, really interesting things going on. First of all, because you're looking at cavity effects. Second of all, and to me, that's the big thing, it's the special relativity. If you, if you Doppler compress standing wave, not traveling waves, but standing waves, and you assume Compton, meaning the electron standing wave, just like the walkers have a standing wave about them, then you have the proper Lorentz factors. And if we assume like Feynman that the internal clock of the electron is the Zitterbewegung, which is a fundamental property, we have no idea, you know. And so what I've been doing for the past year with uh, Herman Batlan at the University of Nebraska is revisit the Guanaire experiment that some of you may be familiar with. And it's the only, not the only, we have also recently, uh, you know, uh, Bose-Einstein condensate, but it was the first real experimental evidence of something that looks like uh, the Zitterbewegung clock. Uh, nobody's redone it because it's, it's and uh, nobody talks about it. They had to cheat their way into the Sacré accelerator. So I'm in contact with the team. Uh, they're gonna redo it. A new, acceler a new accelerator's coming in Paris. Uh, we went with Herman to visit the Frascati accelerator uh, in Italy, in Rome, where Guaner and his team redid the experiment. The equipment is not sufficient. It's not going to work. The Parisian at, at Orsay are doing a new accelerator. And uh, Denis Dauvergne, who was part of the Guaner team, Guaner died, unfortunately, last year, uh, is part of the Cahier des Charges, meaning he's designing the, the magnets to redo the experiment. Um, and so just to finish on, you know, how, wh where do I go personally that I'm just, you know, this is me, you, you seem to be doing other more theoretical approaches. I think we need to settle it with experiments. And in fact, there's something in me, because I've been reading a lot of the Rivas models and the Hestenis models following the Guanaire rabbit hole, meaning, you know, what is the, what is truly the electron, right? We think the electron is this point particle, but obviously if it has so many properties, you know, a mass, a spin, a, a charge, it has to have extension, just platonically, philosophically speaking, it has to have an extension. What is that structure? We don't know the structure of the electron. The Zeta Bewegung is one such hypothesis. And in these models, just to finish with that, there's actually kilo electron volt effects that are really interesting because Guaner was at uh, 50 mega electron volts, meaning you need a, a relativistic accelerator to go prop that stuff. But there's actually other effects, you know, which would have to do with this Dirac B spinner structure of the electron that we could tease. But I'll just finish with, we need experiments. We, we can't go on with, oh, I think this, I think that. 
you know, as much as as much fun as this is, I think we need a a, a dramatic new photoelectric effect kind of thing. You know, so I'm all for that. I help finance that and blah blah blah. Go ahead. Sorry. I couldn't agree with you more. And for anybody who hasn't read De Broglie's thesis, there's a translation by Cracklauer into the, into the English, but it's very well worth reading because that standing wave that he sets up is both relativistic and is the thing that derives lambda is h over p that derives the basis for quantum mechanics. And this is this is the this is the 1920s. You know, this is before quantum mechanics. This is so crucial to an understanding of what you guys are doing in this that it cannot not be read. If you've not read it, you haven't studied enough of the literature it's it's if you read french it's some of the most beautiful french i've ever read and that includes poetry it's gorgeous read it that's the first thing second thing is you could not be more right we need a new that experiment has to be king here you have to look at these things in terms of experiment and experiment is what's kicking out a, a bunch of talk 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 shit and there's been a lot of that going on so experiment is where it needs to go guanera experiment is a superb experiment and, and, and it has been repeated in, in, in different ways. The Zitterbewegung stuff, stuff is very important. CERN doesn't touch, I worked at CERN. Uh, these guys, they're so far beyond the energies where you need to study this. I mean, the electron, the electron mass 511 kV. So looking, looking at sub that and looking at around that is where experiment needs to go. And there's too little of that kind of experiment being done. Actually, our problem, uh, uh, John, is finding the accelerator. So we- You're right, because the accelerators are too powerful it's too, too powerful. Right. It's it's not fashionable yeah. anymore. No. It's not fashionable. I know. It's we gone, need. To... It's well, that's what that's what that's what we're trying to do with Quicycle. But you should check out my website as well, quicycle.com, because we have a new theory which is relativistic, which does the De Broglie stuff. If you want to have a look at how the stuff has been, well, Martin van der Marek put a paper into, I, I, I see, uh, in, into. Um, uh, in, in, uh, at San Diego 2016, which is looking at looking at looking at extending the De Broglie uh, stuff to three dimensional changes, and that's worth looking at as well. Uh, so Chand uh, Chandra, Chandra, who's online here as well, hosted that uh, conference, and uh, stuff's uh, freely available. It's uh, open source, so if you want, it's also on our website, Quicycle. So perhaps I'll stick up. Uh, I'll stick up. In here if anyone wants to check these things out thank you john <laughs> yeah. can i just make a comment sure so um i, I uh, very much enjoyed the day thanks to all the contributors i just want to uh, make a counterpoint to richard's point he seemed to suggest that the, these realist interpretations are getting more and more um surreal if you like but uh what i see is a the and i think what should be the area of focus is the commonality between the various perspectives so that of tim you know trying to appeal to some chaotic dynamics that of the walkers that of alvaro they all seem to suggest wave you know chaotic wave induced correlations so again uh correlations at a distance not action at a distance and the walkers seem to suggest the possibility of this and this is uh, i don't follow the jargon i'm uh but i am interested in violating bell with the walkers and so this is what we're doing now we have a static violation that you know the jury's out even among the co-authors as to whether we'll get a dynamic uh well whether these um correlations will survive once we separate the two subsystems but um we shall see and again i but i think it's very you know the fact that the walking droplets evokes de Broglie's mechanics you know the fact that it it's you know very closely aligned with Hessen's view you know these are these are commonalities certainly worth exploring as we go for as we go further yes but with this classical field theory so, so still we have this bell 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 violation uh, problems so sorry say that again uh, so, so this is classical field field theory so I completely agree I also go go, go this way the big question one question is how to get the clock because this is this is uh, so like a pendulum some oscillation this means additional energy so how to make the, the, this it, it you cannot call me down to zero this, this pendulum of, of electron kind of yes so that, that's a big, big question uh, another problem is for classical theorem how to get the bell, 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 violation especially of these tossing three, three coins uh, at least to, 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 to our uh, equals so, so so it's completely obvious but somehow quantum formalism allows for that so i don't think classical theory with euler lagrange could, could allow for that but if there is action principle it, it allows for that experiments will tell us yes 
but the clock, the, there is some, some mechanism for, for the clock. Right. Uh, yeah, John, I mean, John, yeah, the origin of the clock, I mean, this was sort of proposed yeah. by Debray, and it's throughout, you know, even Wilczek's book, The Lightness of Being, he talks Yes, about, yes, uh, but, but the question is, the, yeah. how to get these additional energies. So, so the question is, so usually if you have additional oscillating like pendulum, it wants to come down to zero. The, the big question is, what, what propels the clock? Why why it does not want to come down to zero for electron? So maybe John John, do you have some maybe some some some? Well, I mean, from my view is you know, ob physical objects can have re resonances like a spring. So if you throw a flu uh, uh, spring into a turbulent fluid, so if you have some back energy in a background field, it will start oscillating at its natural frequency and and feed energy into the field at that frequency. And that's the sort of picture we have, which is yes, uh, but that's also, relevant that's also the walker. The, yeah. That's also the Matthew Faber, Faber view, and we, we argue, is it sufficient that, that to have the resonance, or, or do we need some pro proportion, or, or resonance is sufficient? That, that's a big big question. I, yeah, I, they also sure. that, that also comes up in stochastic electrodynamics. So the question is, you know, they view the particles as an oscillator, which are being excited by the, uh, you know, electromagnetic quantum vacuum, and um, and, and then they sort of they they again lock onto this picture of the particle as the source of waves. You have a local dynamics. Um, that can possibly give rise to non-local correlations. So this pro 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 proportion is some some noise of of vacuum, yes. Uh, in your well, no, it comes from the particle's interaction with its own field, which is excited, right? So, as in the walkers, you basically have the particle bouncing. It creates its own wave field, and despite the fact that the wave field is symmetric to start with, it goes unstable, then it becomes asymmetric, and so the particle can propagate. For the bouncer, you have external proportion. For electron, we need. Using Sorry, you cut it there. For, 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 for the bouncer, you have an external source of energy. Yeah, driving, yeah. So that, I mean, basically that background energy is playing the role of whatever the, you know, oh, yes. whatever so, quantum field is involved. <laughs> yes, so, so that's the, the question, where is the source? So you are saying that, that the vacuum, noise of the vacuum could be, could be the, the yeah. plus resonance could be the, the reason for the clock. And I think another important distinction to make is between De Bruyne bow mechanics which was, of course, favored by uh, Bell on the grounds that it was non-local, and it's favored by the Bohmian community. And de Bruyne's original double solution, which is local, and it's that solution rather than de Bruyne bone that's evoked by the walking droplets. So the walking droplets, you're really exploring local pilot wave dynamics and its potential, yeah. So how do you violate Bell if you're purely isolated, John? <laughs> Through the influence. The, the, okay, so you want to get it, you want to get into it. So you know we have the we have the static violations. Uh, you've seen that paper, yes. and so Andre Nashbin, who's working with us on this, has done numerics where he considers. And so you guys can all guess what the answer will be. Okay, so you have two walking droplets. Again, they're they're in a vibrating bath. And um, they're not communicating. So basically, there's a wall in between them, but these two cavities, they're moving and they move randomly. They, they're not talking to each other. There's no correlation. Okay. <clears throat> now you do a second experiment. You start the drops together. Now there's a coupling cavity uh, between the two subsystems. And if you start the droplets in that uh, cavity, they will tunnel across and then be stuck in their subsystems. And now, because they're communicating with each other, they go into a very highly correlated energetic state, okay? And so that's no surprise, they're talking to each other. Okay, so then you close the coupling cavity. So you have dynamic topography, which allows you just to slam it shut so they're no longer communicating. You would think, what do you think happens? Do you think it goes back to the state which was obtained in the absence of the coupling? That is to say, weakly uncoupled, or does it stay? And it turns out that it stays, okay? And so it actually stays in this highly correlated state and it's just basically established through the initial conditions um, and it persists. So the big question is these bell violating states that we found in, uh, in a, our uh, first paper on the static test, will those survive isolation? And the jury's out, but there's reason to believe that they might. Well, if they're correlated, they should still uh, violate, but you're not sidestepping the fact that your preparation is what correlated them. You, 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 you did not 
No, no, that's right. That's right. So, so the point, the point is you have to then change the measurement settings after the, um, after you se separate the subsystems. And if you do that, you should not, the, the results should be random. Should be. We don't know. We don't know. We're going to let uh, nature speak to us, I think. All right. <laughs> Again, even the co there, there are five authors on the first paper, and the we're sort of a hung jury as to whether we think the dynamic test will work. But again, in the spirit of let's see what happens, the walkers have surprised us many times before, and we'll see if they can do it one more I mean, time. I've read Andres' paper, but he points to a transient regime where. Oh, no, 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 it's not transient. The, the not transient. highly correlated states that. were persistent. Persistent. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. It's okay to everyone to upload the videos on YouTube, just in case anyone yeah, not like that. I could cut it out, but otherwise, you cut, cut, cut to the, to the end of the last talk. And, and, and if somebody would not like to ask to be there, so we, we can cut, cut out. Is that a song? Okay, so maybe you can go to, 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 the, to the questions. Maybe if, if there is, uh, uh, can you clarify um, what part did you need to cut out or cut out? Which well, is in uh, case so, so someone we're... didn't want to appear on so, YouTube, you know, I could cut out that part. Just, just yeah. That's what that's not. <clears throat> okay, so maybe we can we can go to the to the, to the questions. Uh, if, if there is there is uh, no discussion or, or, as as you want, so. Uh, so isn't that what so, we so were that... doing? Go on yeah, so, so... Oh, I, I read John Bush's article, I think the one I posted in 2014, and was uh, uh, amazed yeah. that you're here today, John. Um, it's uh, about the fluid systems, quantum mechanics, you're mentioned in it. Thank you. Okay, so maybe we can, we can discuss, there, is this, there was a discussion about the, the uh, stem girl -like experiment. Can you, can you, can you see uh, measurement uh, this way maybe, maybe maybe let me let me show show this 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 slide um, okay so um, there is uh, this uh, this this slide so 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 there is this basic problem of understanding quantum mechanics is the, the measurement and and there is this Stan Gerlach I think well acknowledged um, uh, idealization and 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 uh, so 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 then the, there is this magnetic dipole aligns in, in a external magnetic field. So, so there is classical understanding that, that if it aligns, then the torque goes to zero. Then, so we have no longer the thermal precession. So the energy can be minimized if, there, if, if it's aligned. Uh, and there was this discussion about this, 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 this paper. It's the semi-classical, so this, this term is, is uses, uses um, Dirac equation. And he, he, he got, um, Sergey, uh, he got alignment. Generally, uh, uh, so 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 uh, in this alignment, there should be radiation of this uh, excessive energy. Also, you see, by looking at the, the pointing vector, it also there is some non-zero radiation un, un, until it is aligned. So so, but but we cannot observe this, this photon, and 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 the, the suggestion is that, that that the electromagnetic wave should be cylindrical symmetric because this is a cylindrical symmetric system. So. So maybe it's it's not optical photon, but but some some just some EM wave cylindrical symmetric. Uh, so what do you think about measurement uh, about Stern Gerlach? Any ideas here? Comments? So what are you trying to show here that this system is completely dynamic? When I put, we're not talking about intrinsic spin. The spin is always the result of an interaction with an elect external. We think about, about the object as a magnetic dipole, some tiny magnet. Right, tiny and magnets. It, and there's yes. no such thing as a spin up, spin down. There's a spin in any direction. And so then when we is, add uh, along the, in one direction, we force the outcome. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so, so if, if the spin is not aligned, then we get the thermal precession. 
Okay. And your point yeah. is that if we should see some radiation, is that is that what you're saying? Yeah, so I'm saying, this, yes, radiation. so for there is no, 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 no larval precession if it's aligned, if the torque goes to zero, what is uh -huh. the for parallel or anti-parallel, yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And 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 if, if it's not, then larval precession means additional kinetic energy. I see. And so, 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 so we can look at that as excited atom goes to the excited atom radiating the excessive energy. So the, one of the experts modern on Stan Gerlach is uh, Hermann Batlan at the University of Nebraska is writing extensively about this. I think you're right that I, it always struck me that Stan Gerlach points to no, no elements of reality a la Einstein. There is no such thing as intrinsic spin. The result of, I mean, there is a there is a physical thing going like this, but it's not up or down. That's when we force it up or down. Uh, by uh, the so, so, yeah, so, so it's so, a great so example the of the contextuality where the measure forces alignment exactly one yes, way or exactly. the other that, that's a great yeah. point i agree with that yeah, yes. and then if you think but we should see extra radiation out then think about how to see it and run it by somebody like herman okay so so so, so the question so for first first question is should there be extra radiation and i'm saying well, that there should be energy, energy difference you should because be in, initially there is there is kinetic energy of, of larval precession and finally there is no no kinetic energy so, so this difference of energy should be radiated uh, for example as a electromagnetic wave also there is a difference in angle if in, in angular momentum initially it is a random direction and finally it's aligned direction so, so there is difference of angular momentum so the, these two differences should be radiated through some electromagnetic wave okay makes sense yeah Makes sense, yes. So, so, so another argument is that you're looking calculate it, make a simulation, calculate it, like get it, put a number there. So there are there are so here is this is this Sergey Rashnitsky something like that um, uh, article we have discussed and uh, the web, web, web page uh, the, the main increase and he claims like ten to minus nine uh, seconds. Um, Another another argument is this this, this pointing vector, this, this uh, energy density of, uh, of 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 radiated energy. So so if the dipole is is state static, then you have only magnetic field, no electric field. But if it's moving, then the electric field appears from Maxwell equation. So th there should be this radiation. So so the question about the experimental observation is, is the problem that that that. That in the excitation we have a photon. We have we have a localized localized photon, but but here we should rather have cylindrical symmetric electromagnetic magnetic wave. So it should be not localized. Energy density should should drop with one over square square root of s squared uh, radius. Yes. So so the question is how to how to how to how to um, observe this this radiation? So it might be only only through some heat heat transfer, but it might be very difficult to observe. I have no idea. Yes. Uh, so it should. I think it shouldn't be photon. It shouldn't be localized. So atom absorption might be, might be might be, but 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 maybe some I don't know some heat transfer. I don't know. And this way also it could be reversible. But but the problem is how to prepare this reversed electromagnetic wave. So but but in theory it should be reversible process. <laughs> Uh, John, I think you uh, must uh, distinguish between electromagnetic waves as in ra radio waves, as you have uh, shown here, that would be the sort of field around the uh, dipole uh, antenna, and photons. I have been, you know, I, I, I don't know how many hours I've yeah. thought about how does one, how does a transition of the electrons which happens instantaneously uh, come into a, uh, a light wave um, with a certain frequency, you know, and uh, we must not model light waves or photons in terms of ra radio waves. We must have uh, light yes, waves. That's another discussion we recently had at the mailing list. Yes, so, 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 so are photons always quantized? That's, that's a big question. and and. For example, so, so one 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 argument that, that they are not is this SPDC spontaneous parametric down, down conversion when when you increase the number of photons. So 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 you cannot say that there is some fixed number of photons because they not the number increases in is SPDC. Uh, so 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 I think that there are two types. So antenna is antenna and laser is kind of similar to antenna. 
is different than than single single uh, atom uh, the excitation single atom sources. Yeah, so, um, Jared, I, 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 don't, I, think... I don't accept your idea that. Uh, that this doubling of photons is, is not dynamic. So the one photon enters and it interacts with a, a complicated system. And then this complicated system emits two photons. So this is not contradicting. So so yes, so you are saying that, 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 that this, 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 so there's minus one photon inside this, this nonlinear uh, crystal, yes or so? Yes, yes, but, but, yes. But, that's what is Chandra is insisting always that you have to take into account the interaction of your system, your your photon with the rest of the world. So, so using this argument, I can say that that, that setting continuous uh, light beam through SPDC, it should be finally filled with these minus minus photons. Uh, so, so there should be some change inside inside this crystal. No, no. Yes, yes. In the in the crystal happens something very complicated and two photons come out. Well, isn't it uh, in, in the crystal, it's basically you get a, a, a atomic um, um, excitation yeah, or electron excitation or maybe a crystal yeah, excitation um, sure. with the, the incoming laser. And that goes through a, a two photon uh, cascade, like in the calcium uh, atomic cascade, which gives us two um, um, beams. Now, basically, um, you know, it is difficult yeah, to yeah, explain. It is right. it is here, it's um, uh, in two weeks' time. I, I will answer all these questions to you. you know, exactly, that, it happens like this. You have make we make an excitation. And then you go down by an intermediate state. That's it. Correct. Yes. Completely so understandable it. in atomic physics. Yes. Uh, but I think and, the, the, the difference. The difference and, and can I just interrupt here? And the difference to the um, calcium 2K uh, cascade, uh, where the calcium atom is uh, static, there is no um, transfer of um, of momentum or rotation that's why the two photons go off at 180 degrees as described uh, in, as we used in the early experiments and in the nonlinear crystal um, you have um, momentum uh, conservation from the incoming beam uh, which needs to be conserved to, to the outgoing beam and that's why you have the two beams going out and, and then uh, you get the separation uh, up and down the two ways um, to so that the uh, momentum uh, up is, is equal to the momentum down. So if we look at the type two, uh, the type two type uh, type two crystal, where we have these two circles, if you take the central point where the incoming beam is, you will always find entangled photons on the. Uh, um, what would you call it, on, on a, a straight line that goes from either circle, uh, from the one circle to the other circle. You know, it is, it's a simple, I, I see this uh, simply as um, uh, conservation of momentum and uh, et cetera, you know, and an atomic cascade. Now, uh, to discuss this, but I, I will, go into this very deeply in two weeks time you know so it's it's difficult for me to explain this all because i, I need to get you you up to date with my thinking uh which is uh, basically i'm introducing a new ontology uh, and you know it's not classical and it's not uh, modern mm -hmm. sure uh, okay, so regarding this, this, this the direction of, of, of spin, also for electron, if you use the B spinner, B spinner encodes direction in 3D of, of the spin. So, so I think it's ordinary continuous angle and, and during the measurement, it aligns uh, due to conditions okay, like-, like okay, hey, Slow down, Jared, because that's super interesting. Let, let, let's say you're right that the B spinner is an actual random orientation and what we call exactly. spin up and spin down is not intrinsic to the electron, but is a result of the measurement with a, a field that comes out either up and down 
I like to talk about it in terms of political opinion. Our political opinions may be all over the map, but we're asked to vote along left or right measurement apparatus. And there's no intrinsic left or right. There's just the measure that gives us left or right. So I'm good with that. The thing that I saw on your slide that I want to dig into a little bit, you said difficult to observe because it's going to dissipate as heat. Are you sure? Is it not going to be an electron? Because you just have an electron floating going. Heat is a property of electrons. So you need a, a, a lattice of electrons for the heat to move. Wouldn't it be an a photon that is emitted? I'm so, trying to get a detection of this thing for you. Yes, so 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 I'm saying that uh, I think there are two types of electromagnetic waves. So one one type are from an uh, and, and, and antenna, which 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 for example can be cylindrical symmetric. And there was this we had this discussion, this many case of this of this this experiment that this guy has this very very weak laser, and he calculated it should be one one photon, and turns out this one photon still still may may interference, and the explanation was that. It was not indeed one photon, but it was um, it was sinusoid amplitude of very tiny amplitude. So very tiny amplitude. And do you have an idea of this amplitude? Like can so, so, you yes. so, so, uh, also, what it what it means? Also here, to, yeah. Also here, you don't have uh, single photons. You have only reduction of amplitude with distance because of the the power power conservation. So so this is different type of electromagnetic pulse than optical photon. So okay. it is not, not localized optical pools. Uh, okay. It is not localized uh, electromagnetic wave. So there's a so dissipation the of that energy. So yes, yeah, so I think I think it, it finally it would it would become noise. So it, it would turn into heat, heat practically. Okay, so number one, be, put, a, put an order of magnitude on this thing. Like when when you know we know the spin uh, energy. I think like uh, atomic atomic energies. Atomic transition. Yeah. So photons, you said no. That electron of volt energy, but 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 not, not localized, but 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 the, the, the localized, which will be cylindrical symmetric uh, impulse. Okay. How do you do? And what, what's that amplitude? Do you know energy wise, like a scale of energy? Uh, energy, energy, I think electron volts, uh, electron volts. And do we know how to detect electron volts around flying electrons? You know that would dissipate so that energy around if it is in vacuum. If finally, maybe some calorie matter could could could. Could, could check it. I don't know. Some kind of what? Calorie matter for calculation. Calorie meter. Yeah, uh, but but it's too, too tiny. I think so. so there a notion be... of heat for a single electron? Well, uh, I would associate heat to lattice, you know, energy movement, meaning a, a condensed matter thing, not not an inherent property. Uh, no, heat is 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 energy energy per per degree of freedom. Energy. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. All right. Order of magnitude EV and detecting, I don't know, I'm happy like pinging Herman. I'm going like, hey, let me take a picture of this. Jarek, how are you proposing that the uh, entanglement would happen with two of these uh, dipoles? Uh, so, I, 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 yes, this is a big problem. So also, if you look at this, 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 this uh, Sergey uh, article, so he says that this condition is super simple. But there is some critical uh, angle he can calculate. And if the, if the initial angle is above this critical angle, then, then it will align up. And if it's below, then it will align, align down. So for me, it's suspicious. suspicious, suspicious. I don't think it has anything to do with entanglement, but just, yeah, it goes. Yeah, that, 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 I don't believe you can get bell violation with this kind that's of different uh, thing. That, that's a different, but yeah, you know, so, so, cool. But, um, well, that gets to so what my talk was about. Yeah, if you just have the entanglement be uh, a boundary, that if if this uh, oh you can't see my cursor but um, yeah if that angle gets to ninety degrees then it changes sign that doesn't work um, but if you can get the entanglement such that the uh, um, entanglement fixes the uh, azimuthal angle phi in such a way that the value um, you know the boundary is a constant value of phi rather than Theta equals 90 degrees, then you can get the Bell violation. <clears throat> you following I, I, that? I don't think you can get the Bell violation here. So, 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 so uh, not, not in the, this simple way. Uh, so, my, my answer is that nature solves it through the, through the, through the, this kind of classical field theory, through the, through the, through the least action principle. Yeah. 
And this what? way you can get the variation, no problem. But if you think about uh, Euler Lagrange, then I think you, you cannot get it, the variation. Um, well, uh, can I show my slide again? I'll show you what I mean by yeah. um, this one. So uh, here, if these are your two measurement angles from your stern gerlach if you can entangle the two electrons such that the boundary between plus and minus is a constant value of uh, azimuthal angle phi, as opposed to what's more commonly people think of is that you um, have the boundary be theta equals 90 degrees, you know, the horizontal plane here. If, if you fix the azimuthal angle, and have the boundary be a different azimuthal angle, then you get the Bell violation. So it's a question of what, you know, how you do the entanglement. Yes. Yeah, so 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 I have just put 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 in the chat this this this, this third article. So if you look there, um, there is there there is there is super simple um, equation uh, the condition that that if angle is uh, 25 equation 25 if, if if angle is above some critical then then it will align up. It is below, it will align down. Super simple condition. I, I think it's too simple. But yeah, it is not. Uh, yeah. Robert, Equation 25. Robert, uh, if you entangle two electrons and then in the end you said, how do we entangle two electrons? Now, in my opinion, entanglement is a uh, conservation of state. You know, uh, or it's it is more than just conservation of energy. It's conservation of fluxes of, of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, it's um, and that is what needs to be uh, found. You know, that's uh, without knowing the physics, what causes entanglements. Uh, everything comes down to these probabilistic discussions. And um, the deniers who's, uh, who bring up huge um, uh, loopholes, which themselves do not make sense, uh, you know, which are even more absurd than what uh, the Bell inequality tells uh, is, because we don't want to believe in this uh, in, in a non-causal system. So I, I think. The, you know, that is where we need to look at, you know, and uh, to, uh, uh, to understand this all better. Yeah, I agree. So um, I show what the geometry would be for Bell violation, um, you know, for two measurement angles, as in uh, the spin correlations. But um, the question is, how does that relate to an actual measurement? Maybe it's not the physical space, but maybe it's you know in momentum space or something or spin space. Um, so this is a geometrical picture, but doesn't tell you what the uh, dynamical picture is. Sergey uh, so might, might give a talk in, in April, so we can discuss. Yes, I asked him. He will give it. He's willing to give a talk in April, so we can maybe influence him here what he would talk about, but. He has mm -hmm. actually several really interesting papers, I think. <laughs> yes. In, in well, the put a reference in the chat to your paper. Uh, the 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 the, the stand I have put. Uh, but if no. you just just oh, well. search for. Um, other... Yeah. Well, uh, my slides are listed in the uh, description for this con this conference. Um, I did publish a paper uh, years ago. Um, but using a kind of different model, so I think it's less intuitive. I think actually the slides are a better explanation. But I would I would like to see your picture of this um, sphere and and your interpretation. Can you give a reference? Just put it in the in the chat. Um, sure. It, but it's in the slides. If you just look up the Google Doc describing this meeting, it's in my slides there. Okay, so so I will have to look up afterwards. Uh, yeah, I'll try to find that. You can send me an email also, no problem. No problem. 
Oh, okay. Um, I've just put my latest paper into uh, the chat, uh, which will basically be the uh, will also be discussed in the uh, in two weeks' time. Uh, but there, I define uh, the requirements of a uh, of entanglement. Uh, so, from a purely um, mathematical point of view and uh, satisfying the Maxwell equations. I, I put the link in the chat. Thank you very much, I saw it. I just go and do it. Okay, so maybe you can quickly go through that, the, the, the questions, maybe. Uh, also include cross oh, okay, this is, uh, okay, so as you answer, sure. You can finish for today or, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Okay. Jarek uh, and Chantal, thank you very much. It was a very stimulating afternoon. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Well, for, thank you very much for your time. It's really interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Have a Good nice night. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.